Honourable Senators, President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Good morning. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item three of today's order of business, and an additional proposal has been lodged by Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee for a private meeting today from 12.45. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Privacy Amendment, Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020, Further Consideration in Committee of the Whole. The Committee is considering the Privacy Amendment, Public Health Contact Information Bill of 2020. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Deputy President. If, um if no other senators have um, general questions, Senator Watt, no. So, um, oh, sorry, I'll cede to Senator Patrick, and then we'll move to the amendments if that's uh, I'm okay with you. Entirely in your hands, Deputy Senator. President. I'll cede to Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Senator McKim. Um, my question uh, to the minister is that is uh, uh, whether or not uh, she has uh, uh, managed to get an answer to the question she took on notice yesterday in relation to contracts. Minister. Patrick, I was uh, speaking with the Minister for Trade. Uh, I think I heard you say, um, uh, did I have any uh, response in relation to the matter on contracts? I don't have it in front of me, Senator, but let me just uh, uh, seek uh, some advice from my virtual advisers and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and come back to the chamber when I'm able. Senator Patrick. Perhaps they're COVID safe uh, advisers. No, uh, Minister, <laughs> um, uh, just on top of that, I, you know, I really would like to understand when that contract comes around to being renewed, whether or not it would be opened up to Australian companies, uh, or whether the, the, uh, there, are, of course, are provisions in the Commonwealth procurement rules to simply stick with a limited tender on the basis that you are already in contract. Very happy to have a look at that. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, my first question is, would the minister advise how many fi data files from COVID-affected users have been successfully uploaded and decrypted? Minister. Senator, as, as is entirely appropriate under the uh, uh, construct of this uh, app and the uh, pertinent legislation, we do not have access to that information and nor should we. Senator Roberts. You don't have information as to the number of um, users. How do we um, Minister, wait, please wait. For sorry, call. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, Minister. Apologies, Madam Deputy President. Yes. Uh, certainly there is information in relation to the number of uh, downloaded, uh, downloads of the app, which gives us the number of users per se, uh, which uh, as of yesterday I understand was 5.63 million. I did say to the Chamber yesterday 5.83, that was a verbal typo, uh, but 5.63 million users. Senator, uh, Senator Roberts, yes, wait for the call. Thank Go you. ahead. Um, how many, how many uh, data files from affected users, COVID affected users, though? Senator Roberts, once you finish your question and you sit down, and then I know that the minister is going to respond or seek the call. Yes or not, as the case may be. Minister, thank you. Again, Senator Roberts, uh, refer to my previous answer. That's not information that we have, and nor should we. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Just how many data files does the government expect to get 
With less than 10 Australians getting COVID each day and the install rate at 20 per cent of the population, that suggests two data files a day. Minister. Uh, Senator, I think uh, at this point in time and, uh, and in fact in general in relation to this matter, we would not be engaging in speculation on that. Uh, the most important thing that uh, we are focused on is encouraging Australians to download the app and to uh, use it. Senator Roberts. How much are you paying and to which companies to run this app? Is it a flat fee or price per install? What would be the weekly cost? Would, yeah, what would be the weekly cost? Minister. Senator, I might take that question on notice uh, and seek uh, further information on that in terms of the detail that you've asked for there. Senator Roberts. Uh, did you require Atlassian to pay their company tax before giving them the contract for the app? Minister. Uh, Senator, I'm not aware of the details of that, um, but uh, if you wish, for, wish me to seek for further information, I will. Senator Roberts. Has your government done any modelling on the success rate from tracing COVID-affected contacts from using the app as against the current personal tracing system involving calls to infected people? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I'll seek some advice from the Minister for Health on that, uh, Senator. Uh, but as uh, we were discussing yesterday in the chamber, the uh, process of contact tracing is a very uh, intensive uh, and uh, time-consuming process. The uh, officers who are engaged in that now are doing an excellent job, but this will most certainly enhance the ability uh, for Australia to engage in that contact tracing process. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Does the server for the app use 32-bit encryption that are not secure or secured 128-bit encryption to encrypt the user IDs? Minister. Uh, Senator, I'm advised that the encryption that we are using is the strongest available encryption and I'll provide you with further details if I'm able to obtain them. Senator Roberts. Are you aware the government's COVID Safe app is not compliant with your government's own accessibility standards for disabled people for an app? And that's titled WCAG 2.0A. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. As we discussed uh, in the chamber yesterday, Senator, in the um, brief period we had in committee yesterday, uh, we are continually working uh, on and with uh, the app. If there are issues in relation to access for uh, disability users, then of course that would be a matter for, of, uh, of, of um, action for the government. Uh, and if you wish to raise specific issues, and I'm not familiar with the code name that you used at the end of uh, your question there, uh, then uh, I'll certainly raise that with the appropriate ministers. Senator Roberts. Just to, to uh, repeat that then, WCAG, that's the standard for the app, WCAG 2.0A. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I'm in the hands of the chamber. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Deputy President. I um, seek leave to uh, move the Australian Greens amendments on sheet 8954 together. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Um, thanks very much, Deputy President. I'll just um, briefly uh, explain um, these amendments. And as I said in my uh, second reading contribution, we do acknowledge that there are um, significant um, protections on privacy contained in this legislation. In fact, it ought to set um, uh, uh, a minimum standard for uh, government in terms of protecting people's um, personal information and private data, and it's it's quite shameful that uh, a number of other sets of data collected by the Commonwealth government are not protected um, to the extent that uh, data collected by um, this app will be. Uh, however, as ought be obvious by our amendments, we still believe that this bill could be strengthened uh, and um, more robust protections placed around the data collected by the app, and that's, um, of course, 
um, what our amendments seek to do. So, in terms of the amendments on sheet 8954, the first amendment um, relates to the definition of COVID app, COVID app data. Um, uh, I acknowledge the uh, improvements that the government has made in the legislation that we're considering compared to um, the exposure draft, which uh, was originally released publicly. But um, so, so as, as a result of those amendments, the bill now covers registration data and has narrowed significantly uh, what de-identified information is carved out from the definition. But the bill doesn't seem uh, on our view to cover phone numbers, and uh, it really should, because mobile phone numbers are in themselves personal information because of um, the separate requ requirement under telecommunication laws for uh, proof of identity when becoming a mobile phone subscriber. So our first amendment on sheet 8954 adds the person's phone number into the bill's definition of registration data. Secondly, our amendments uh, around decrypting the data store. We'll also extend prohibitions in the bill on de decrypting data on communications devices to include all data that is stored in the National COVID Safe Data Store and is not required for the purpose of tracing contacts of verified COVID-19 carriers. Uh, the next amendment uh, is the creation of an additional COVID Safe offence. Um, section 94H makes it an offence to require someone to download the app, have the app operating or consent to uploading data from their communication device to the National COVID Safe Data Store. Uh, this amendment will make it an offence to require someone to show you whether they have downloaded the app onto their communications device or not. Uh, and this will further reduce the potential for this app to be used for discriminatory purposes. And uh, the next uh, amendment is in regards to a breach of the biosecurity determination. And this amendment would ensure that the protections from interference with privacy that will be provided by uh, Part 8A of the Privacy Act after royal assent of this bill will also be provided from the commencement of the determination. That will allow the Information and Privacy Commissioner to investigate and report on all data collected and stored by COVID Safe. And finally, on this sheet, um, uh, consequential amendments to remove limitations. Uh, this, in also, this includes removing exemptions for the disclosure of personal information to ASIO, ASIS, the Australian Signals Directorate and the Office of National Intelligence uh, and provides that these exemptions do not apply, so a disclosure in breach of the new COVID Safe Act privacy requirements to one of those agencies would still constitute an interference with privacy. And I do commend these amendments to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just didn't catch the very beginning of Senator McKim's contribution there. And we are just dealing with 8954 at this point, aren't we? Yes, by leave together. Yep. Thank you. Uh, there is strong uh, public interest in putting these privacy protections in place as soon as possible. And so Labor will not be supporting any amendments that will further delay the passage of this bill. Prior to its introduction into the parliament, as I indicated yesterday in my second reading speech, Labor worked constructively with the government to improve the bill, and many of our suggestions uh, to improve privacy protections have been incorporated into the version of the bill before us today. It is not Labor's position that this bill is perfect. Understandably, this bill was drafted quickly, and it has not gone through the usual parliamentary committee processes of review. That is why Labor welcomes the announcement by the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 that it intends to oversee COVID safe, including the effectiveness of the privacy protections set out in this bill and whether they can be further improved. So, as I say, uh, we, we do welcome the fact that the government took up a number of our suggestions to improve this bill and improve the privacy protections. Uh, we are confident that the Senate Select Committee will provide an avenue to make further improvements should they be needed, uh, but we won't be supporting any further amendments uh, because we don't want to see this uh, bill delayed any further. Thank you, uh, Senator. What, Senator Patrick? Uh, just indicating Senator Alliance will be supporting the bill, but I will call out the, uh, the logic of uh, Senator Watt in that uh, there is no delay if you simply uh, uh, um, indicate support. Uh, you, you don't have to wait to make something perfect if something is made better by the movement of, a, of an amendment. Uh, uh, we have also agreed 
uh, amendments and worked constructively with the government uh, in relation to this bill. Uh, but that shouldn't fetter uh, uh, in this chamber trying to go a little bit further to make it a little bit, little bit more perfect. So the question is that the uh, amendments one to seven on sheet 8954, as moved by Senator McKim, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Senator McKim. Deputy President, in lieu of um, calling it a vision, which we'd, we would usually do, I'd just simply ask that um, uh, our obvious support for our own amendments, yes. and I believe Senator Patrick and Senator yep. Alliance's support be recorded. Thank you. We will uh, record that um, the Greens and Senator Alliance were in favour of this amendment. Thank you. I'm in the hands. Yes, Senator Patrick. Uh, th thank you, uh, um, um, Madam Chair. Uh, I uh, move uh, by um, Amendment 1 to 4 on sheet 8956 uh, by leave together. Is uh, leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator okay. Patrick. Um, the amendments made by Senator Alliance will make sure that the COVID uh, app data cannot be copied and used overseas. Currently, the bill prohibits retaining data outside Australia. However, this amendment makes it explicit that it's an offence uh, if persons copy the app data and transfer it outside of Australia. Uh, the other amendment ensures the Privacy Commissioner does not lose the opportunity to investigate a breach while waiting to know if the Director of Public Prosecutions or the Commissioner of Police intends to pursue uh, the matter. So the bill currently only lets the Privacy Commissioner pursue a breach when the Director of Public Prosecutions or the Commissioner of Police are satisfied that an investigation will not jeopardise their investigation. However, if the uh, DPP or Commissioner of Police are not timely with uh, giving the Privacy Commissioner the OK, the opportunity to pursue the matter may be uh, lost due to the short duration of the uh, bill's time frame. So this amendment will enable the Privacy Commissioner to continue an, an investigation until uh, the Director of Public Prosecution or the Commissioner of Police issues a notice that the Privacy Commissioner's intentions will jeopardise uh, their investigation. Basically, this puts a positive obligation on both the DPP and the Commissioner of Police to make a timely assessment so that the Privacy Commissioner is not let waiting, left waiting uh, for a, a prolonged period of time. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, we are not supporting uh, these amendments uh, by Senator Patrick, but let me just refer briefly, if I may, particularly to, to the second one, because that has been a, a genuine concern raised by Senator Patrick and others. And I can advise the government did, in fact, make amendments uh, since the release of the exposure draft, which uh, uh, we believe deal with this issue and achieve that balance between privacy and law enforcement uh, investigations. The recent inclusion of um, clause 94U brackets 4 allows that where the police commissioner or the DPP is satisfied that a privacy investigation will not jeopardise or other otherwise affect a criminal investigation or proceeding, then the privacy commissioner may continue their own investigation. Uh, those amendments were developed in consultation with the uh, Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. And we believe that they do strike uh, the right balance. I note there's also a time period proposed in the amendment, a 14-day time period. Uh, in our view, it's not appropriate to place time restrictions on the DPP or a police commissioner uh, to determine whether a separate investigation would have a prejudicial impact on a criminal investigation or proceeding. So I appreciate the issues that Senator Patrick has brought forward, but we do believe we have been able to address those. Thank you, Minister. Senator. Whoops. <laughs> Senator Patrick. Just in responding to the minister, I, I know we are, we are in some sense playing at the margins. Really what we're trying to do is put a positive obligation on the police to come back early to the Privacy Commissioner, uh, or, uh, or sorry, um, uh, put a positive obligation uh, on them to stop. So I think we are playing at the fringes, but uh, we think our amendment is slightly better. Uh, and, and I acknowledge that we had talked to the Attorney General about this. Uh, uh, and. Uh, they had certainly talked to us about the, the amendments that you have uh, described. Thank you. I'll go to Senator McKim and then come to you, Senator Watt. All right, um, uh, thank you, Deputy President. I'll be, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to rise to indicate the Australian Greens' support for Senator Patrick's amendments. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Watt. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. As I indicated previously, Labor will be opposing this amendment and further amendments. I refer to the comments I made in respect of the previous amendment. Labor believes that there is a strong public interest in putting these privacy protections in place as soon as possible, and so Labor will not be supporting any amendments that will delay the passage of this bill, including this amendment. Thank you, Senator Watt. So the question is that the amendments on sheet 89561-4 by leave moved together, moved by Senator Patrick, be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Um, and Senator McKim, and I'm assuming you want uh, the Greens' object, uh, um, support for this amendment added, and I'm assuming that's for Senator Patrick as well. So we will do that. Thank you. All right. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Deputy President. We will now move to uh, the Australian Greens amendments co-sponsored by um, mm -hmm. Centre Alliance. So I should say they're Australian Greens forward slash Centre Alliance. Uh, amendments on sheet 8960, and I seek leave to move those together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Um, thanks very much, Deputy, uh, Deputy President. Um, these uh, amendments range across uh, a number of provisions contained in this legislation. The first of these amendments creates an additional coercion of offence. Um, a, a number of um, behavioural economists and others uh, have proposed making things like government payments, tax breaks and other financial um, rewards and um, financial disincentives dependent on people using the app. Uh, now, the exposure draft bill would not have um, captured uh, these issues, but the bill uh, as, um, uh, uh, as changed by the government um, uh, from the exposure draft to the one that we're currently uh, considering will um, catch uh, many of those um, coercion concerns that uh, the Australian Greens and Centre Alliance have. Um, however, the current prov provisions on coercion would still fail to capture non-commercial forms of coercion, uh, such as those relating to, for example, family violence and abuse. Uh, and our amendment would make it clear that no form of coercion is legal or lawful under the Act. Uh, this includes discounts, payments or other financial incentives that may be contingent on a person downloading or using the app. Uh, and it would also make it clear that people aren't um, allowed to be asked to show that their mobile device has the app loaded in order to avoid discriminatory or abusive treatment. The second of these amendments relates to privacy verification of data deletion. Um, as an independent regulator, the Information and Privacy Commissioner has discretion as to how and what duties they execute, uh, they execute under the powers of this bill. This means that the Information and Privacy Commissioner's, Commissioner's final report may or may not contain or report on whether they are satisfied that the data store administrator has complied with the legislation regarding compliance and deletion of COVID Safe app and its data. So, this amendment will include provisions requiring that the Information and Privacy Commissioner inspect and verify that the data deletion obligations at the end of the app's period of operation have been complied with by requiring the data store administrator to confirm and report to the Commissioner that the data has been deleted as required by the app. Uh, and also that uh, the Information and Privacy Commissioner provide a report to the Minister on compliance with deletion obligations as soon as is practicable and for this report to be tabled in both Houses of Parliament by the Minister within three sitting days of receiving it. <clears throat> the next amendment uh, goes to the end of the COVID safe data period. And, and this is um, quite a significant amendment because we do have concerns why, with the way that the government has approached um, the sunset provisions uh, of this legislation, uh, which is effectively to leave it in the hands of the health minister in terms of when uh, the operation of COVID safe ends and the data is deleted. Uh, this 
Amendment will ensure that the Act and all activities covered by the Act, including use, communication and storage of COVID safe data, sunset as soon as the Human Biosecurity Emergency Declaration ends or by the trigger currently in the Act, whichever is sooner, and also provide that the bill collection of data for the COVID safe app and the state of emergency under the Biosecurity Act all cease at the same time. Um, this is aimed at ensuring the app and the collection of data does not exceed the declared um, state of emergency under the Biosecurity Act. Now, um, I, I just want to speak to this at a little bit more length because uh, this data, the data set collected by this app um, does, and I think everyone would acknowledge, uh, does contain um, very, uh, potentially very sensitive personal information. Now, we're obviously living through a global pandemic and, um, and this bill, I believe, will pass through uh, this chamber with unanimous support. But if the pandemic has eased off to the extent that uh, the declaration uh, of a human biosecurity emergency is over, there is simply no reason for this data to still be maintained. The government can extend the declaration, or the minister, I should say, can extend the declaration if he wishes. But if we're through this pandemic to the extent that the declaration ends, I cannot possibly see how the government has an argument to keep this app in operation and to retain the extremely sensitive personal information that is collected by this app. So this amendment is um, critical in our view and it links um, the sunset of, um, of this bill once it becomes an act to the end of the declaration. I'll say again, if the declaration, if the emergency declaration lapses, if we're through the pandemic to the extent that the government does not believe we need to be living under a human biosecurity emergency declaration, uh, the Australian Greens and also, I won't speak for Senator Alliance, but uh, they are co-sponsoring um, this amendment, um, we believe that, um, that there is no reason for uh, the data that is collected by this app um, should remain and we believe that it should be deleted in order to um, maximise, uh, minimise the chances of um, this information being hacked uh, or, uh, or the information otherwise being um, made uh, public or provided to people that it should not be provided to. <clears throat> the next amendment uh, is around the privacy verification of data deletion. Um, and again, as an independent regulator, the Information and Privacy Commissioner has discretion as to how and what duties they execute under the powers of, uh, of this bill. That means that the Information and Privacy Commissioner's final report may or may not report on whether they are satisfied that um, the data store administrator has complied with the legislation regarding compliance and deletion of the COVID safe app and its data. So this amendment will include provisions requiring the Information and Privacy Commissioner to inspect and verify that the data deletion obligations at the end of the app's period of operation have been complied with by requiring that the administrator confirm and report to the Commissioner that the data has been deleted as required by the app and for the Information and Privacy Commissioner to provide a report to the Minister on compliance with deletion obligations as soon as is practicable and for this report to be tabled in both houses of Parliament by the Minister within three sitting days of receiving it. Um, the, uh, the final amendment on this sheet relates to the reporting period. Uh, in the version of um, the bill that we're debating, the government has introduced a biannual reporting on the operation and effectiveness of the COVID Safe app. Uh, given the relatively short lifetime plan for this app, or we hope it will be um, a short lifetime, uh, and the understandable concerns people hold regarding the privacy of their data being held in the National Data Store. Uh, we think it appropriate that this data be reported on uh, every three months or within one month of making a determination under section 94Y. 
Thank you, Senator McKim. Um, we'll go to Senator Patrick and then to Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just very briefly, um, uh, Senator McKim took the words right out of my mouth. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, again, I refer to the comments I made in respect of the previous amendments. Labor believes there is a strong public interest in uh, putting these privacy protections in place as soon as possible, and so Labor will not be supporting this or any other amendments that will delay the passage of this bill. Thank you, Senator Watt. So the question is that the uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. I won't, I won't unduly hold up um, the Senate, but I just wanted, uh, as Senator Patrick has done, to respond to um, Labor's position. And I, I, I note and um, you know, pay credit to them that they haven't been um, disparaging of these amendments in any in any way. Uh, if the Senate was minded to amend this legislation, it could just be put down to the other place today. And I, I think it unlikely in the extreme that that would cause uh, any significant or even meaningful delays to the passage um, of this legislation. And um, I, I, I've seen um, this approach by the Australian Labor Party in regards to um, uh, other legislative uh, areas in this parliament, specifically around um, national security issues, where uh, Labor, and fair enough too, does negotiate um, outcomes with government, but I, I, I just would urge the Labor Party to not close its mind um, to further amendments on the floor of the Senate. That's the job um, that we're um, chosen by the people that vote for us to do. Uh, it is um, part of our job as legislators to try on the floor of this Senate and the other place uh, to make improvements to legislation uh, which comes to this parliament. And we genuinely believe that if um, our amendments proposed today uh, were accepted by the Senate, it would uh, make this a more robust piece of legislation. It would uh, allow uh, the many people in this country who have concerns with uh, how this app will operate to have an increased level of confidence and may in fact lead to an increased rate of download to this app. So uh, we do commend our amendments to the Senate. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the um, amendments 1 to 13 on sheet 8960 moved by the Australian Greens and Senator Alliance be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, just the request I made earlier. Um, please, Deputy President, in lieu of a division, if, if uh, our votes and, and the votes of Senator Alliance could be recorded. We will uh, certainly record your support for this amendment and the support of Senator Alliance. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And the question is that the bill be now reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So a report from the Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered the Privacy Amendment Public Health Con Contact Information Bill of 2020 and agreed to it without amendments. Um, Minister. I move that report be adopted, Madam Deputy President. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Madam Deputy President, I move the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Privacy Act 1988 and for related purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Emergency Leave Bill of 2020 for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'm just calling the clerk now. <laughs> A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to leave from residential care services and for related purposes. Uh, Minister. I think. Oh, I'll beg your pardon. It's not. 
Aren't we moving a second? Yeah. Sorry, Minister. Yes, I, need, I think I need that back. Yes. Um, thank you. I move that the uh, bill uh, be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, and I call Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I make clear at the outset that Labor supports this bill. The Aged Care Legislation Amendment Emergency Leave Bill 2020 amends the Aged Care Act 1997 and the Aged Care Transitional Provisions Act 1997 to introduce a new type of leave that permanent residential aged care residents may utilise during situations such as natural disasters, pandemics or other large-scale emergencies that can impact the safe provision of residential aged care and the safety of the resident. Once an emergency situation has been determined, the leave would be applied to a specific area such as national, state and territory aged care planning or an individual service. This leave is for a specified time period and provides for a level of flexibility needed to allow the Commonwealth to address situations such as floods and bushfire emergencies or future instances of isolated or regional outbreaks of COVID-19. Under each of the above-mentioned acts, permanent aged care residents are entitled to take up to 52 days of non-hospital related leave, known as social leave, within a financial year. When an aged care resident exceeds their annual social leave entitlement, the aged care home no longer receives Commonwealth residential care subsidy for that person, and the provider passes those costs on to the resident. The emergency leave is not limited to a number of days or a specific time frame. The minister can deem the length of time the emergency leave remains in place, as well as an end date. Any declaration of emergency by a minister or his or her delegate for the purposes of this bill will be done as a disallowable instrument to allow scrutiny and oversight. There is no financial impact for the government by the proposed amendments. Any costs associated with updates to the aged care payment system will be funded from existing programs. Uh, acting Ma Madam Deputy President, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Minister for the spirit of bipartisanship he has undertaken to date. I understand the Shadow Minister has been briefed regularly in relation to COVID-19, but also in relation to this bill. We are also pleased that the government has listened to Labor around the issues of social leave. It is an issue that we have raised directly with the Minister because we know there would have been an ongoing financial burden for many Australian families who are caring for their loved ones at home. There are around 500 Australian families currently caring for their loved ones under social leave arrangements. With the COVID-19 pandemic, many family members have made a decision to continue caring for their loved ones in their own home and not return them to their residential facility to receive care. This has and will result in many, Australians, in many older Australians passing the capped 52-day social leave arrangements. The consumer would ordinarily then be required to pay the government subsidy of around $230 per day to save their place in the residential aged care facility they are taking leave from. For many families and consumers, this is a cost that they are unable to sustain. Amending the acts will ensure that the family or consumer will not take on any unnecessary financial burden if they have passed the 52-day social leave arrangements. For social leave, there will be a retrospective date of the 1st of April 2020, so that families are covered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is understood that the Commonwealth will continue to pay the subsidy to those residents accessing social leave from the 1st of July 2020, and this we welcome. At this stage, no end date has been put forward. However, we will monitor this as we enter a new financial year. Madam Acting Deputy President, we acknowledge the difficult and challenging times for residents, their families and, of course, those who care and support older Australians, all aged care workers. The COVID-19 virus has had a significant impact on residential and home care. It has infected residents and aged care workers, and sadly, the virus has claimed lives. Our deepest sympathies go to the families who have lost loved ones. Labor has welcomed the opportunity to put forward ideas when it comes to supporting older Australians and aged care workers. Social leave, as I've already stated, was raised as an issue by Labor. 
And again, I thank the minister for listening uh, to those representations. So too, the expanded support for vulnerable older Australians through the Community Visitors Scheme. Again, we acknowledge the government's $10 million announcement in relation to this measure. We hope it provides some much needed support. Labor has also put forward ways that aged care workers could be supported during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, the government's announcement around the retention bonus has failed to support all aged care workers. The government has excluded aged care workers from receiving the retention bonus. It depends on where you work and what role you do. Frankly, this just is not good enough. The shadow minister has written to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians twice, calling on the Morrison government to value all aged care workers for the care and support they all provide as a team to older Australians. There have been infection control failures. Residents, their families and staff deserve answers to what went wrong. It is our hope that the Morrison government will join Labor in calling for the Royal Commission into Aged Care to investigate the COVID-19 virus's deadly impact at Newmarch House. It's the right thing to do, and the Royal Commission has the investigatory powers to do this special investigation. This special investigation is important. It will provide many answers so that if a pandemic happens again, we will know more about how best to manage this situation in a residential aged care facility. But also, Australians must be assured that we have the best infection control practices in aged care. Madam Acting Deputy President, in conclusion, this bill will make a difference to families who are caring for their loved ones. As I've said earlier, we are pleased that the government has listened to Labor's concerns and acted. I also wanted to take this opportunity to put on the record our thanks to all of our aged care workers who continue to work tirelessly through the COVID-19 pandemic. We know it's been a tough and challenging time for you and your families. We appreciate the work that you do. You are valued. We value the work that you do, and we thank you for the work that you do to care and support older Australians. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Seward. Acting Deputy Chair, I rise today to uh, speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Emergency Leave Bill of 2020. This bill introduces emergency leave for residents living in aged care facilities. At the moment, residents have 52 days social leave during which they can leave the facility, for example, to stay with family members um, or others, in fact. However, if a resident spends more than 52 days away from the facility, providers can ask residents to pay a fee to reserve their place. This creates problems during emergency situations such as the current coronavirus pandemic, when residents decide to temporarily leave a facility to live with family members instead. This bill enables the Minister for Aged Care and Seniors, uh, Senior Australians to make a determination about an emergency situation for a specific area and, and a specified time period. Once an emergency has been declared, residents in the aged care facilities can access emergency leave and don't need to use up their 52 days of social leave. It also, provides, uh, it also uh, prevents aged care providers from charging residents to reserve their place in an aged care service during declared emergencies. The determination can relate to a natural disaster, pandemic, epidemic or other large-scale emergency that might impact on the safe provision of aged care. It can be made at a national, state, territory or individual service level. The bill also allows for retrospective payments of the residential care subsidy to be made to affected services for residents taking emergency leave. The Australian Greens support this bill. It ensures older Australians aren't unfairly disadvantaged if they decide to move back, to, back in with their family during, for example, this pandemic. I hope that the, that the flexibility built into the legislation will allow the minister to enable emergency leave during a wide range of scenarios. However, there are still some gaps in our legislative process that I would like to address today, hospital leave being one of them that I have raised on a number of occasions in the past. Um, I will note that I've had a lot of complaints from people about it. I would like to go to, uh, to, to address this issue of hospital leave. Long-standing issues around hospital leave have become even more apparent in this uh, coronavirus pandemic. 
If you take leave from a residential aged care facility to go to hospital, you are still charged fees and daily accommodation costs. After 29 days of hospital leave, residents may have a reduction in their means-tested care fee. Quite frankly, it is unreasonable that older Australians continue to pay fees for day-to-day -day services such as meals, cleaning and laundry when they are in hospital. It is also unfair that they are charged fees for extra services clearly not being used at the time. Which also brings me to the point that yesterday we learned that the federal government has ordered Bupa to pay $6 million in penalties and millions more in refunds for residents who have paid thousands of dollars a year for services they have not received. I have raised this issue of providers charging residences for extra services a number of times at Senate estimates. I welcome the federal government's decision, but it shows that, that we desperately need to greater oversight of when these so-called extra fees are charged and what they are charged for. If someone goes to hospital for coronavirus, they shouldn't be required to pay fees for services and care they are not receiving. Instead, there should be an option to freeze or waive residents' fees while on hospital leave, especially doing, during a declared emergency. Older Australians deserve better, and I hope that the government will address this issue urgently. One of the key issues raised with us when I was talking to people about this bill is that it doesn't address other types of aged care services, uh, included, including age, uh, home care and, C and CHSP. We don't want to discourage older Australians um, to abandon their home care services. The coronavirus crisis is a critical time for many older Australians living at home, and we have to ensure that they are supported. Yet the crisis does raise questions about choice and control around aged care services during emergencies. Under the Charter of Aged Care Rights, older Australians have the right to have control over and make choices about their care and the right to exercise their rights without it adversely affecting the way they are treated. While some aged care providers may be flexible in delivering services during, during this coronavirus crisis, there is no guarantee this is happening across the board. I would like to see the government allowing flexibility in the way that home care packages are used and delivered during emergencies. There are also issues around how we notify older Australians when they have been offered a home care package. At the moment, older Australians receive a letter when they have been assigned a home care package. They must respond to the letter within 52 days of its date. I have concerns around this time frame given we are experiencing postage delays across Australia because of coronavirus. I will be seeking assurances from the government around this time frame during um, a short committee process um, where I have a couple of questions I do want to um, get on the record. I want to go to issues around um, some of the aged care inquiries that uh, have been undertaken by the Community Affairs uh, Committee and some of the recommendations that have been made. We are deeply saddened by the situation at Newmarch House, New March House, a residential aged care facility. Newmarch House has highlighted how things can go wrong. Last year, the Senate finished an inquiry into the effectiveness of the a of aged care quality assessment and accreditation framework for protecting residents from abuse and poor practices and ensuring proper clinical and medical care standards are maintained and practised. Yes, it's a mouthful, but it's also a very important issue. As noted in um, my second reading contribution amendment, I think the recommendations which I should indicate that it has been circulated. I think the recommendations from the clinical care inquiry highlight some of the urgent reforms that are needed still to be undertaken in aged care. The committee recommended the development of benchmarks for staffing levels and skills mix. We know that aged care facilities suffer from chronic understaffing and under-resourcing. Sadly, the coronavirus uh, crisis has, not, has uh, highlighted this problem. Last week, the Australian Nurse, Nursing and Midwifery Foundation found that three quarters of aged care staff surveyed said there had been no increase in staff or hours during the coronavirus pandemic. Aged care staff are trying their hardest, and we strongly uh, give a strong shout out to all those people that are working in aged care right now. But without enough staff, with the appropriate skill mix, they are always going to be struggling to provide the best care that they can. The national average of care provided is around two hours and 
and 50 minutes per resident per day. This falls significantly short of the four hours and 18 minutes a day required to provide a safe environment for residents. I appreciate that the government is funding the deployment of emergency response teams to aged care facilities. I very strongly acknowledge that and thank the government for that. However, these are only temporary measures. I strongly believe that adequate staffing levels and skills, skill mixes would allow us to better manage the risks of uh, coronavirus and, and, in the longer term, once we get past this, the proper care that older Australians deserve in residential care. The Community Affairs Committee also recommended that the government work with the Quality and Safety Commission to drive continuous improvement in the, quality of, uh, in the level of quality, of quality and safety in aged care. The Quality and Safety Commission provides a critical um, role of oversight in aged care, especially during the current pandemic. These responsibilities must go hand in hand with the framework for aged care that provides continuous improvement through evidence-informed best practice. As the Royal Commission into, the age, into Aged Care Quality and Safety highlighted, our aged care system is in a shocking state of neglect. Short-term interventions are just not enough. They need to, there needs to be more to deliver an aged care system that meets the needs of older people. Our system needs fundamental reform and redesign, which must be underpinned by a continuous improvement approach. Some of the other recommendations made by the committee include the implementation of a clearly articulated principle that the duty of care for regulation of residential aged care rests with the Quality and Safety Commission. The relevant government agencies and stakeholders work together to develop an industry mode of, uh, model of care and work collaboratively to achieve better integration of aged care with primary health and acute care services. I am uh, moving a second reader amendment to highlight the government must address these issues urgently. I sincerely hope that the government revisits these inquiries into aged care so that we can start implementing urgent reforms and better protect older Australians throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I also would like to end again with a call out to those workers in our aged care facilities, in our home care that are providing so much important care and support for older Australians. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Griff. Thank you. Acting Deputy President, I rise on behalf of Centre Alliance to speak in support of the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Emergency Leave Bill 2020. The changes proposed in this bill are very important and the current pandemic crisis has underscored the need for such changes. The bill introduces a new type of leave that permanent residential aged care residents can utilise during situations such as natural disasters, pandemics and other large-scale emergencies. These can affect the safe provision of residential aged care and, indeed, the safety of the resident. Currently, permanent aged care residents are entitled to take 52 days of non-hospital-related leave known as social leave within the financial year. When an aged care resident exceeds their annual social leave entitlement, the aged care home no longer receives the Commonwealth residential care subsidy for that person, meaning the provider then needs to pass these costs onto the resident or their family. Importantly, the emergency leave under these changes would not be limited to a number of days or a specific time frame. Indeed, the minister can deem the length of time the emergency remains in place as well as the end date. There is no financial impact for the government by the proposed amendments. Any costs associated with the updates to the aged care payment system are to be funded from existing programs. The legislation also provides for each declaration made by a minister or his or her delegate will be tabled as a disallowable instrument so there can be further oversight when this emergency leave provision is enacted, a very important component. The provisions of this bill will no doubt give comfort to families who have watched the horror of COVID-19 outbreaks unfolding at aged care facilities such as the Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House. There is no doubt that the COVID-19 virus has had a significant impact on residential and home care of older Australians. It has sadly infected residents and aged care workers and claimed lives. Our deepest sympathies go to all families who have lost loved ones. The COVID-19 pandemic has meant that many family members have made the decision to continue caring for their loved ones in their own homes. 
and not to return to the residential aged care facility to receive this care. We are told that there are currently around 500 Australian families caring for their loved ones under these social leave arrangements. Now, this has resulted in many older Australians passing or soon to pass the capped 52-day social leave arrangements currently allowed for. The resident or their family is currently required to pay the government subsidy of $230 per resident per day to save their place in the residential aged care that they are taking leave. For many families and consumers, this is very much an unsustainable cost. The proposed legislation will ensure that the family or consumer will not take on this unnecessary financial burden if they have passed that 52-day social leave arrangement. Significantly, the legislation will operate retrospectively to 1 April 2020 for the social leave so that all families can be covered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This, without doubt, will be a huge relief for the many families currently cared for, um, caring for their loved ones in their home. We understand that the Commonwealth is continuing to pay the subsidy to those residents accessing social leave from 1 July 2020 as well, and we also welcome this. At this stage, we are told there will be no end date put forward for the current COVID-19 pandemic in relation to this emergency social leave. We will certainly monitor this going forward. There is no doubt the pandemic crisis has created difficult and challenging time for residents, their families, and of course, for those who support and care for our older Australians. The coronavirus pandemic is testing the aged care sector and many other sectors in our community in ways that none of us could have ever imagined. Facilities have plans in place for infectious diseases such as influenza or a gastro outbreak, but coronavirus makes these pale in comparison. These times call for exceptional courage on all fronts. Older Australians living in aged care facilities have seen a lifetime of ups and downs and are now the ones absolutely most vulnerable to this pandemic. The aged care workforce, working part-time or casually, with many uh, coming from overseas, are doing hard work with dedication and care, and we very much thank them. The aged care facility and management are making very tough calls, balancing the respect and dignity of their residents with the care and protection of them and their staff. In the interest of seeing swift passage of this bill through the parliament, we have chosen not to seek to amend the legislation despite offering up another opportunity to move significant amendments for much needed financial transparency for the sector. Thank you, Senator Grip. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank uh, senators for their contribution to this piece of legislation. The Australian population is ageing and senior Australians and their families deserve to be treated with respect and dignity whilst receiving high quality aged care and services. Integral to this is the empowering of aged care residents to make their own decisions about their own emotional wellbeing and physical health and safety. And during difficult and challenging times such as the current COVID-19 pandemic, it is vital that senior Australians are supported in their right to exercise their choice about their care. The COVID-19 emergency has highlighted a gap in existing residential care leave provisions when faced with a large-scale emergency. Currently, permanent aged care residents are entitled to up to 52 days of social leave each financial year. If a resident exceeds their 52 days of leave, then they are required to pay a significant fee to regain their, retain their place within the aged care home. And Mr President, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, can I say in the context of the Greens' proposed amendment um, hospital leave is already unlimited and there is no financial impost on the consumer, unlike social leave, where, the, as I've just said, the consumer must pay the full subsidy after 52 days. That is what this bill is seeking to address. During the current pandemic, many permanent residents have indicated they wish to temporary temporarily relocate to stay with family in order to reduce their risk of exposure to COVID-19. These residents currently have no other option but to use their social leave allocation, which will likely run out before they are ready to return to their aged care home. If they choose to remain on leave, the additional charges will be incurred 
to secure their additional uh, uh, will be the additional charges that will be incurred to secure their room will place a significant and unnecessary financial burden on them or their families. In many cases, res residents may simply not be able to afford the additional charges and therefore are forced to return to the home or possibly forfeit their place. The isolation, lack of visitation and inability to stay with the family for the duration of the current COVID-19 pandemic has caused cognitive decline and anxiety for a significant number of aged care residents. Many residents and their families are fearful of the risk of contracting or spreading the virus whilst in an aged care home, yet are, are, are unable to exercise their right to manage their own health and wellbeing due to the limited leave provisions available. The new leave type being introduced through this bill will ensure that residents have access to appropriate leave during the emergency situations, and not just during this current pandemic, Ms. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, the legislation pro makes a provision for any particular um, emergency situation so that future governments have the flexibility that we're seeking to introduce right now, which will not see them finan uh, residents financially disadvantaged or lose either leave, leave entitlements for situations completely out of their control. This change is in the best interests of all older Australians and the broader community by supporting the residents and in turn their family and carers to make their own decisions about their personal safety and care. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, can I join with other colleagues across the chamber in expressing our condolences to those who have lost loved ones uh, in the current um, COVID-19 pandemic circumstance? Um, having had the opportunity to talk to some of the families of those loved ones, uh, they're not just numbers. They are individuals, they are members of families who um, are loved, cherished by all their families, uh, and uh, we understand only too well the importance of providing high quality care. Can I say I don't share the pessimism about the capacity of the aged care sector that's been expressed by some in the chamber to provide, a, provide good quality care. We are extremely fortunate in this country that less than 1 per cent of aged care facilities have had an incidence of COVID-19. We have seen quite graphically, though, uh, how devastating, how tragic it can be when a significant outbreak does take hold. Uh, and the government has not limited the resources that are available to a facility that has an outbreak of COVID-19. We've worked closely with the facilities from the time we, under we found out that they had a, an outbreak within the facility. Uh, we've had medical experts from both State, Commonwealth and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission working closely with the facility to ensure that they have the resources that they need, whether that be staffing, PPE, advice, uh, and acknowledging that the States have uh, oversight of um, uh, clinical care responses. Uh, within these circumstances, and we've been working closely uh, with all of those, all of the jurisdictions, uh, to provide the resources that are required to ensure that a quality care is being provided, uh, but also acknowledging the requirement for communication. In certain circumstances, we've provided additional resources, particularly for communication with residents, families, so that they understand what's happening within the facilities. I acknowledge the calls that have been made for the Royal Commission to consider the events at, uh, at particularly Newmarch, uh, and I understand that the opposition has written to the Royal Commission in that context. I acknowledge, though, that the Royal Commission has said that they will be looking at aged care in the context of COVID-19, and I believe that's appropriate. But I also believe it's appropriate that they look at all circumstances of COVID-19 in aged care facilities, because, because it's not just about Newmarch. Newmarch is a particular case that deserves attention, I agree. But I believe that the Royal Commission should be looking at all of the aged care facilities and, their, and how they each have managed COVID-19, because some of them have done a brilliant job. And it's not all about just the things that have gone wrong. We also ought, through this process, be understanding what has been done well and acknowledging that and congratulating the sector for that. And I do congratulate the sector for that. I congratulate the staff at the front line who are turning up every day in a very difficult circumstance and dealing with the residents who 
have been uh, unfortunate enough to be infected with COVID-19, who have put themselves at risk and in some circumstances have themselves uh, caught the virus. It's a very difficult circumstance for everyone. It's a very stressful circumstance for everybody involved in all of those circumstances. Uh, and I acknowledge the efforts of the industry, the sector, uh, more broadly the staff in particular on the front line, uh, and acknowledge the concern and uh, quite rightly being expressed by the families, particularly of those who have um, loved ones within facilities that have uh, had an infection within the within their, um, within their site. Uh, can I thank senators for their contributions to this piece of legislation uh, and uh, commend the bill to the Senate? Thank you, Minister. Move the bill be read out. So the question is that the second reading amendment as circulated and moved by Senator C oh, sorry, Senator McAllister. Uh, I just wanted to indicate Labor's position in relation to the second reading amendment. I don't believe we've done that. No, so process. far. It, but can I have leave to I do leave, so? There's leave granted. Thank leave you. Granted. Um, there are a number of points raised in the Green Second Reading Amendment that, of course, Labor has been calling on the government to fix urgently for some time. And this includes the home care package waiting list. More than 104,000 older Australians are waiting for their approved package, and frankly, this is not good enough. Labor will continue to put pressure on the government to fix the home care package wait list. This is urgent. It should not be ignored during the COVID-19 pandemic. In regards to the other issues raised in the Greens Amendment, it is our strong view that the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety should be given the opportunity to put forward its final report as it considers many of the significant issues that impact on the aged care system. This bill is about supporting families and their loved ones at a very difficult and challenging time, and we don't want to hold this bill up, of course. The Greens have failed to consult with Labor on this second reading amendment, and we will not be supporting it. So the question is that the second reading amendment, as circulated and moved by Senator Seawort, be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Did you, I would assume the, Greens, the uh, Australian Greens would like their dissent of their approval uh, sorry, recorded. Thank you. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. So the so the clerk sorry called the clerk. Amend the law in relation to leave from residential care services and for related purposes. So that no amendments have been circulated. However, I noted that Senator Seward had indicated an, a, a request to move into committee. So we will resolve to committee. Thank you. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Seaworth. Thank you. I have no intention of dragging this out. There are um, some issues I just wanted to ask the minister about and get on the record. Um, minister, in your second reading contribution uh, just then, you, you referred to the point that I had raised during my second reading contribution, which was around the issue of hospital leave, and you made the point that is unlimited. It is my understanding that there is not a restriction on the number of days that somebody can be in hospital out of a, a residential aged care, um, but, but they still do have to keep paying their accommodation costs and daily fees. Is that not uh, a correct understanding? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Seward. Uh, so the information that I have is that uh, when a person is hospitalised for more than 28 days, the subsidy paid to, to the provider is reduced by 50 per cent, but unlike a social leave, the consumer is not required to pay this. The consumer can be hospitalised for an unlimited number of days and will have no financial penalty as a result. It may, you may be perhaps talking about additional fees, which is a different matter, and, and, and they are paid in any circumstance under any, under any form of leave, and that's a different matter again to the, the base fees, as I understand it. Senator Seward. Can I be absolutely clear that if you're in hospital, there are no Aged care, there are no accommodation fees or daily fees at all. Is that correct?
Uh, thank you. So, so the circumstance is exactly the same as with social leave. So the, 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 those daily fees that apply, the residents continue to pay with respect to daily leave, uh, so to social leave and hospital leave. So the, the Senator Seward. Thank you for that clarification. I suspect that um, some people are paying fees that they shouldn't be paying in that case. Um, can I un ask also for the other types of aged care services for C CHSP, uh, FlexiCare and Home Care that um, emergency leave provisions, the, these emergency leave provisions also apply to those forms of care as well? And if not, why not? Senator, we'll, we'll, we'll have to get some advice for you specifically on that. I'm happy to come back to you with respect to that. But um, in the current circumstance, I know where some people have decided that they don't want to receive the services that they're, they're uh, attributed under a home care package, for example. Um, uh, my understanding is that their package continues to accumulate in that sense, so they're not receiving the services. Obviously, we would like them to receive, continue to receive the services because that's what they've been assessed to do. And that's why we've put in place the, um, the callback service that we did to, through OPAN uh, and some of the uh, consumer peaks so that we can call the, resident, the, the service, receivers of the service, check their circumstances, see if they need any other services, um, but talk to them about continuing to receive the, the services that they have uh, been assessed as requiring um, under their home care package, for example. Thank you, Minister. That's actually reminded me to just make a, a very quick comment in, as well, and that is that in my second reading contribution, I did acknowledge the extra effort that's been put into the provision of uh, extra supports for services where there has been an outbreak. Um, my criticism, ex or not criticism, but my comment extends more uh, broadly, where we know there is understaffing in aged care, and that is continuing, and it is shown by the Australian Nurses and Midwives uh, Federation that, in fact, that is continuing. So. The situation prior to the pandemic still exists in many aged care services, and we're having an aged care royal commission for a reason. Um, and those reasons uh, haven't gone away. But I do very readily acknowledge that the, that you have made a very strong uh, effort and made uh, a lot of investment in helping those facilities that have had an outbreak of coronavirus. Uh, but it does take me to the point about uh, the where you were um, got where. Uh, you made comments about the, particularly the home care services where people have suspended them because they, they are in isolation and are concerned um, to make sure uh, that they didn't have anyone in their home. Um, are you assured that services are not continuing to charge people where services where a, a, um, an older person receiving in receipt of a package has decided to suspend a service? Are you what action have you taken to make sure that services are not continuing to charge services even though they're not being provided? And what communication has, uh, what checking up on that have you done? Not all that. Thanks, uh, okay. Chair. I'll have to take that, come back to you with some advice on that. Um, I think it's a, a very legitimate question. We uh, have, have been concerned to ensure that residents. Uh, as I've said, in, indicated earlier, continue to receive the care. There have been some services that have been suspended by service providers during the outbreak. Um, I know that some of those services have subsequently uh, recommenced because I've uh, made some specific inquiries with respect to some of those myself. Uh, but I'll have to check with you to give you, and, and I will come back to you uh, with specific details around uh, what charges may have continued or not. Senator Seward. Thank you, Minister. That um, is very much appreciated. I wanted to go to an issue, and this has been directly raised with us, around the, the, the point that I raised in my second reader, amendment, uh, second reader contribution, which is this issue around the number of days to accept or reject a package. It is uh, 52 um, days uh, at the moment. I think that's, that's correct. Um, I'll double 
can uh, let me know if I've got that bit wrong, but there is a delay in Australia Post at the moment. I know that from personal experience. Uh, have you considered? Has this matter been raised with you? If if not, um, I'm raising it with you. And have you considered that um, you could extend that slightly, f so that people get that full capacity to that length of time that was intended to consider uh, their position? Uh, thanks, thanks, Senator Seward. Look, Senator, it's not an issue that has been raised with me as a concern. Um, we, uh, I, I note that the opposition are, were also uh, raising concerns about the continued rollout of home care packages, and that has continued. Uh, the rollout that we've committed to has continued despite the COVID-19 uh, uh, circumstance. In fact, it's ahead of schedule at this point in time. So, uh, we also acknowledge and recognise the need for the growth in uh, home care package, which is why we've invested so heavily in that space over the last 18 months. Uh, but that particular issue hasn't been um, uh, raised with me. I will seek some advice around the time, uh, the average time taken to take up a package, which will probably give me an indicator of that. Uh, I note uh, that in some of the previous reports that I've received, the time to take up a residential home care place has extended, and that I think goes not to the availability of, home, of, of, sorry, of residential places. It goes to the time people are using to make a decision. Uh, but I'll see if I can get some information for you uh, and come back to you with with respect to the time taken to take up a home care package. Senator Seaworth, uh, that is very much appreciated. Thank you, Minister. And you, in fact, preempted my next question, was which was about waiting um, waiting lists. Are you able to provide? You may not be able to provide right now, so you may need to take it on notice. Actual, how many people are waiting now, in terms of for a home care package? I think the figure is, as the opposition indicated in their um, uh, contribution, somewhere about 104,000. Um, but I'll get an exact number and I'll come back to you on notice. Senator Seward. Thank you. I wanted to go back to the issue of hospital leave, and as I said, this issue has been raised with us. Um, do you do checking in terms of whether people are being charged for fees that, in fact, they shouldn't be being charged for um, when they're in hospital? Do you, it, does the department uh, check that? Minister. I'll have to get you some advice on that, but there is um, a piece of work that's being undertaken right now with respect to additional service fees and additional fees. So we are doing a piece of work on that right now uh, because it has been an issue both for residents and providers with respect to some clarity. So we're doing some work on uh, how we might uh, uh, make those matters uh, um, more transparent and clear for both providers and for residents. Senator Seward. That was, in fact, going to be my last question. Um, was that issue around extra services? Could you just tell us if you, when that piece of work is due to be finished by, and maybe the terms of reference for that particular piece of work? Minister. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Senator Seward. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I'm trying to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, bearing in mind there are a few other things going on in the aged care portfolio at the moment, uh, but. I know that um, both providers and residents are seeking some clarity in this, and so I'm looking to try and get that clarity provided for everybody as quickly as possible. So I don't have a specific end date. I've been working on it for a couple of months now, uh, but I'm looking to get it done as quickly as possible. Senator Seward. Um, could I perhaps ask on, um, for you to take on notice to provide us with the terms of reference for that particular piece of work? Okay. The question. A hands up. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you. So the question is that the bill be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. The, I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. All those in favour? Say aye. Against? The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Aged Care Legislation Amendment, Emergency Leave Bill 2020, and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Clark. Oh, sorry, the question is sorry that the, uh, uh, the sorry the question is that the the report be adopted. Sorry, yes. 
All those in favour say aye. Against? I always have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Clerk. They always have it, so clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to leave from residential care services and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Competition and Consumer Bill 2019, and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, <clears throat> when we were uh, last debating this legislation, I was reflecting on the fact that uh, Australia has the most expensive broadband of all OECD countries and uh, that we should be seeking to um, improve affordability of broadband access in this country um, uh, rather than reducing it. And that's particularly relevant now, given that we've got um, a large number of people working from home. We've got a lot of people that have lost their jobs as a result of um, the pandemic that we're all currently living through. And um, ultimately, uh, one thing I hope um, that will become apparent to more people in this place as a result of um, the pandemic and associated restrictions that are currently in place is that broadband should be regarded as, essential, as an essential public service in this country. It's absolutely an essential utility, and the quicker the government can come to grips with that concept, um, the more connected we'll become as a country, and the better and more affordable broadband services will be. Now, <clears throat> the Australian Greens believe that uh, rather than uh, the way forward proposed in this legislation, that the most equitable uh, option um, for funding these matters would be a broad-based funding pool uh, directly funded through the Commonwealth budget. And I want to place on the record that that's been acknowledged by both the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission as well as the Productivity Commission. So, um, I spoke about broadband affordability, but I also want to speak very briefly about broadband speed in Australia. Um, we are currently ranked 68th in the world for average broadband speed. Uh, that is simply not good enough for a rich country like Australia. Not good enough. And that was um, uh, in large part the result of uh, the decision of uh, the LNP government under um, former Prime Minister Turnbull when we had former Senator Fifield um, as uh, our communications minister um, to uh, unfortunately cruel um, the broadband, broadband plan that had been um, uh, conceived, uh, put in place and begun to be rolled out by the Australian Labor Party. So we need to make sure we've got more affordable broadband in Australia and we need to make sure we've got faster connectivity in this country. Um, Acting Deputy President, I would ask uh, um, at the end of this debate that uh, the question for the second reading of the bills be divided. Um, the Australian Greens support one of the bills but not the other and we'd welcome the opportunity um, to vote on that basis. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. I rise to speak on, on these two bills, the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 and the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019. And I will start by, by giving a shout out uh, to a, a wonderful organisation a group of very committed regional Queenslanders in particular. I, I know there are members um, who are outside of Queensland, and that's called BRRRR, and that's uh, Better Internet for Rural, Regional and, and Remote uh, People but for Queensland. BRRRR was set up by, by, um, by, um, by Christy Sparrow and Kylie Stretton, and um, 
and um, the work that uh, these two ladies um, and their members have done to advocate and, and push for, for better internet uh, for those who, who live in, uh, I suppose, the, the inner part of Australia, the rural, regional, and remote parts of Australia, is just fa fantastic. And, and, and more, more grease and more power to, to their elbows to continue advocating on behalf of especially Queenslanders, as much as important as, as the rest of the country is, Madam Acting Deputy President. I don't particularly care about the rest of the country. All I care about is, is, is Queensland. And um, so please don't take it personally for the, um, for the quite a few Tasmanians in, in, the, in, in, in the room. But um, we are, we are the, the state's house, and, and I'm here to represent uh, my, my, my state. And, it, and this bill, all these bills that we uh, have before us today. I'm oh, sorry, was that, Senator? No, no, no. This is just uh, uh, Senator McGrath standing up on behalf of, 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 of regional Queenslanders and, and advocating for, for those interests. And, and I'm sure you would all support me in, 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 support, in fighting for, for regional Queenslanders and fighting for all Queenslanders in, in that. In that. And in terms of, of, of this bill, I think it's important to set it in the context of the, the space that, that we live in now in terms of, of this wonderful thing called uh, the internet and, and how it, it powers us and how it is, is driving business and, and enterprise and how it is driving uh, how we look at life in terms of our recreation and in terms of our, our business. That, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, I think um, when I, well, I think when I was at a university, the internet wasn't a thing. Um, mobile phones really weren't a thing. Uh, but now, with these, uh, it is a thing for everybody, from uh, the toddlers, my my nieces, uh, Josephine and Sophia, uh, who um, are four and, and 15, uh, 15 months. Old. The four-year-old is certainly very adept at, at managing an iPad, scarily so, much more, more than I am. Uh, and uh, you look at uh, uh, those at the other end of the spectrum, you know, my parents who, who are in their 70s in terms of, of how cranky they get when they cannot access um, uh, the internet, when they cannot access uh, mobile phone coverage. And, you know, on, on the issue of mobile phone coverage, I know we don't like being particularly partisan in this place, but you know, I, I will give a shout out to what the Liberal National Government has done in, in the issue of mobile phone black spots. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is probably one of the, the, the best policies, certainly in the top five policies that this government, since we were elected in 2013, has pushed for. Previously, um, uh, the, you know, under the Labor government, no, there was no no funding for mobile phone black spots, but but under under the coalition government, you know we, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mobile phone black spots that have been remedied and fixed around Australia. And I know as someone who whose office is on in the Sunshine Coast in uh, in, in in the bustling town of Nambour, but I live out on on, on the Darling Downs. It's a good three hours and, 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 and 20 minutes drive from door to door, how important it is to have mobile phone coverage and how, how I've noticed the, the improvement in, in mobile phone coverage uh, when, when I drive around Queensland. But there is still lots to do and the government know, knows this and only in the last couple of weeks did uh, the, the Liberal National Government announce a further round. Of, of funding for mobile phone black spots, because too often, I think so, some senators in this place on the other other benches uh, don't appreciate the difficulty of of those who do live in in, in regional parts of Australia, and probably no, don't want to be uh, too negative, but probably take for granted their own access to uh, whether it's mobile phone coverage or, or the internet, because they do live in cities. Uh, whereas on, on this side of, of the chamber, we are a, a, a diverse bunch and we are dispersed around our particular states um, and, 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 and sort, of, sort of live what we talk about in terms of understanding the issues that if I you know, 
drive from Warwick uh, to, to Stanthorpe uh, that I know I, I won't have mobile phone coverage uh, during certain parts of it. I know when I drive to Brisbane. I, I, when you go through a place called Cunningham's Gap, I know there's no mobile, no mobile phone coverage there. Uh, and that it has improved dramatically since the election of the Liberal National Government back in 2013. And, and these two particular bills continue, uh, continue uh, the reforms in, in this area. And it's important to put in, in, in context, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, what the, the coalition inherited in relation to the NBN when we came into power in 2013. Um, that, that, that after you know, six years of labour, just 51,000 users were connected to the NBN. It's just 51,000 users. That sort of effectively one in, in 50 premises uh, had actually um, uh, been connected. And, and you look at uh, the achievement of, of this government in terms of how we've pushed and reformed and, 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 and built upon the NBN. Because Labor's you know, fibre of the premise uh, policy would have cost $30 billion more and taken six to eight years longer to complete. Now, this is the NBN policy that, that former Senator Conroy, if, the, if, if it is to be believed, and I think it is believed when you think about Labor's approach to <coughs> business plans and economic management, that their NBN policy was written on, on, on the back of a coaster. Um, and um, I understand it was a beer-stained coaster uh, because that, such was the disregard for the taxpayers of Australia who would fund Labor's policy, but also such was the disregard for the end users of, of Labor's NBN policy, and that's the people of Australia who, who, were, who were promised this, this in, a, in typical Labor fashion, this, this sort of um, gold-plated elephant but uh, in fact, sadly, were just um, uh, delivered um, the scrapings out from, from the elephant stables. Now, under Labor's policy, uh, broadband bills would have increased by up to $43 per month. And that's you know, $500 a year. Now, for, for, you know, for Queenslanders, that's a lot of money. And you know, in, in, in especially in, you know, imagine if, if Labor had stayed in power. Imagine if, God forbid, that, 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 that uh, Bill Shorten had, had won the last election. Just imagine um, the, the dire state the, the Australian economy would have been in uh, as we, we approached uh, the, the coronavirus. You know, one of the reasons that, 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 that the National Cabinet and, and the Prime Minister has been able to, to, to focus on, on, on saving lives and, and uh, protecting livelihoods is because of the economic management of the Liberal National Parties. And, and I know those on the other side you know, don't really give a, 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 probably a, a good, good old hoot about economic management because it's, it's something that other people worry about. But in terms of, 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 of funding policies like the NBA, in terms of ensuring that we have the infrastructure to take Australia forward, whether in, in calm waters or in stormy waters, you need to make sure that you have sensible economic policies and sensible, a sensible, sober approach to how the economy and how the budget is run. You cannot keep on, on, on spending because you need to make sure you have money in the bank and the debt is paid down for when storms come up, as they have, you know, the most serious storm in a hundred years to hit to hit Australia, and so that's why it's a concern when we talk about the NBN and when we look at, at, at the different parties' approach to to the internet and to to uh, telecommunications. That on on this side we took a you know, evidence-based based approach. 
we looked at how it could be funded, we looked at, at what could be achieved best for the, the taxpayers of Australia who were funding it. You know, thank you, Mr and Mrs Art Taxpayer. Uh, but also the end users. And, and too often we, we forget about the, the end users. Uh, sorry, too often uh, those and the other parties forget about the end users. They just see them as collateral or, or people who, who might be swayed by glitzy election policies. Now, um, in terms of um, you know, going back to what was, was happening when we came into power in 2013, uh, you know, Labor had paid $6 billion for the NBN to pass just 3 per cent of premises in Australia. Um, the rollout was very poorly managed, contractors down tools and actually stopped construction in four states. Uh, and under Labor, the NBN missed every rollout target it set for itself. Under, under the coalition and under, under uh, the, the, the leadership of, of the Liberal National Parties, the NBN rollout is on schedule and on budget. And the government is rolling out better broadband across Australia in the fastest and most affordable way. So Australians can get access to fast broadband sooner at a price they can afford. And this has particularly hit home over the last uh, couple of months since the coronavirus epidemic came to Australia in terms of the lockdown that has been imposed by um, the various premiers under the leadership of, of the national cabinet because so many Australians, including uh, senators of, of all colours in, in this chamber, have been you know, working from home, uh, you know, dealing with, with um, boisterous members of their family, dealing with um, uh, the, the broader issues of, of trying to get, a, um, get on with the job and access, the, the, you know, access broadband, access the internet, access telecommunications. And we've really come to terms with how the internet has become uh, a life form for, for many Australians, that if it was switched off, then they would have difficulty operating. And that is, I suppose, a reflection upon, upon modern society. But it is important to have a government, like the Liberal National Party government, that, who can deliver the internet, because that's what the end consumers want. And that's what the NBN has, has been able to do. And research by uh, a company called Alpha Beta shows us that Australia has one of the most affordable markets for broadband ranked seventh for affordability amongst 22 countries analysed. You know, and the NBN helped drive over a billion dollars worth of additional economic activity in 2017. And, and, and more, more women are becoming their own bosses with the NBN. And this is important. I go back to the shout out that I gave to uh, Burr in terms of Christy and, and Kylie. You know, um, Christy, I, I, I know personally, and lives on, on a station near Alpha in, in, in Queensland. In terms of the empowerment that, that Australians can receive from being able to access the internet so that the disparity between those who live in the city and that those who live in, in regional Queensland are on par with each other in terms of their access to information and in terms of their access to modern society. And, and these two bills, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, are a small part in terms of, of helping uh, progress that. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And can I just say, uh, in regard to the previous speaker, I don't think I've heard so much uh, that you might find on the paddock in a herd with a herd of cows. Uh, in, in a long time, but let me know, and I'm not talking about grass, just to be clear, Senator Carwick, just to be clear, it's the excrement from the dairy herd that I'm actually talking about. Um, <coughs> speak about a rewrite of history. I mean, fair dinkum. I don't know where they come off sometimes on that side. Now, I've spoken in the previous parliament about these bills, but the government let them lapse, so here we are debating them yet again. 
This third term Liberal govern government's handling of the rollout of the NBN we know has been a disaster. Of course, Mr Abbott gave the opposition communication spokesman, spokesperson, spokesman Malcolm Turnbull the job of destroying the NBN. Well, I'll give credit where credit due. Mr Turnbull and the current Liberal government have done a great job carrying out those instructions. They promised to deliver the NBN for $29.5 billion. It has now cost $51 billion. They promised everyone would have access to minimum speeds of 25 megabits per second by 2016, a goal they certainly missed. They also promised that the multi-technology mix would be faster and cheaper. Instead, it has been slower and more expensive. The end result is that there are many premises on the fibre to the node network that cannot even get speeds of 25 megabits per second. And that's particularly in regional areas where the speeds are often considerably lower than that promised, especially in the evenings and other peak times. This government has spent $50 billion on a network that cannot even deliver the minimum speeds that they promised. It goes to show the lack of foresight of this government. Instead of building a network for the future, <coughs> They built a network from the past, which is where a lot of them like to live. They could not see that Australia's internet demand would rise into the future. And now, now we've come to the pointy end. The COVID-19 crisis has seen a massive increase in demand for data over the MBN. In cities and regional areas across Australia, including in our home state of Tasmania, and I know, yes, there are four Tasmanian senators in this chamber at the moment. Um, demand for data has spiked. A figure reported in the media in April showed data demand in March increased by more than 70 to 80 per cent during daytime hours compared to figures calculated at the end of February. In just a month, demand jumped by 80 per cent. And this government did not have the vision to see that a modern national broadband network would have to deal with significant amount of video calls video streaming, access to cloud services and applications. This government did not have the vision to see that there would be events that put a sudden strain on the network. Mr Acting Deputy President, Labor's plan was for a future-proof fibre to the premises rollout for nearly all Australians. But the government recklessly destroyed this plan simply because Labor had proposed it. And so they made a number of hacks, utilising infrastructure that should have been retired, reworking copper that wasn't fit for task and overcrowding the fixed wireless network, leading to more congestion, slower speeds and, ironically, higher cost over the long term. It is people in regional Australia that are bearing the burden of this government's ineptitude, the people that the nationals have again failed to represent. We have recently discovered that this government cut $200 million in funding from the regional fixed wireless network. Worse still, MBN Co tried to conceal that this had occurred and then tried to deny it once they were caught out. Now, I'm sure the nationals in this chamber are thrilled to know that once again their government, their partners, didn't stand up for regional Australia. The fixed wireless network is an important component of the MBN and was always, always part of Labor's plan for a small proportion of Australians. However, this government and MBN Co claim they would be delivering 100 megabit per second speeds. Now they can only guarantee a minimum of three or six megabits per second. Recently, we heard MBN Co touting the benefits of 100 megabit per second speeds. Yes, 100 megabit per second speeds would be wonderful. Most of my constituents would be ecstatic to get such speeds. It's just a pity that only one in four premises on fibre to the node network can actually access these speeds. Only one in four, a quarter. The copper, the last section from the node to people's homes, is just not up to the task. It's like driving from Hobart to Launceston, only to get out of your car in Perth, just south of Hobart, and bike the rest of the way. Copper was never designed to carry this kind of network. We've seen the cost of remediating the copper network blow out by $600 million. Wasn't this meant to be cheaper? The cost of building the HFC network has blown out by billions. It has been slower and more expensive to deploy than fibre to the premises. This too was a technology choice that was meant to be cheaper. 
The NBN was meant to be a new kind of technology for Australia. When the then Labor government decided to build a national broadband network, we did so with the aim of extending universal broadband coverage to regional and remote Australia. This was an important initiative, but a true Labor reform, and one of which we remain very proud. But instead, this government cut corners, tried to patch up the old copper and paper over the cracks. As my dad used to say, you should have just done it right the first time. But the government decided that a dodgy con job of a network was better than letting Labor take credit for a truly 21st century fibre network. The end result of this government's incompetence and their petty politics is the bill we are debating today, a bill to introduce the government's broadband tax. A broadband tax being introduced in the name of regional funding while cutting regional NBN investment at the same time. Rather than investing in the regions, the government is using this tax revenue to offset cost blowouts in HFC technology deployed in the inner city areas. This is the same HFC technology, the rollout of which had to be halted because the service was not reliable. Mr Acting Deputy President, the costs of this network have blown out for the fourth year in a row. It's no secret that the, that the Liberals did not want the NBN satellites to be launched. They mocked the idea that NBN Co would own and launch its own satellites. And under the original fibre plan, the regional rollout was fully cost recovered. Under the multi-technology multi mix, the NBN has cost more to build, costs more to operate and deliver slower and less reliable speeds. Furthermore, the, NT the MTM will require future upgrades that were not necessary under the original fibre plan. This decision to extend high-speed broadband to unprofitable areas was funded through a universal wholesale pricing regime. And as it stands, the internal cross-subsidy labour established amounts to more than $700 million per annum. This meant NBM revenues from services provided in the cities and suburbs would help cross-subsidise higher cost services delivered over wireless and satellites in the regions. There was no contemplation of having a broadband levy and an internal cross-subsidy. It was one or the other, not both. Yet now the government wants to have both, and the reason for this is quite clear. Since the time when this levy was first formulated, the cost for the fixed wireless and satellite network has not changed. The cost is effectively what was forecast. The key change has been the abandonment of fibre to the premises on the pretense that Australia would get a much cheaper, albeit inferior, multi-technology mix. Instead, we have a more expensive $51 billion multi-technology mix that does less than the original plan. This inferior multi-technology mix, according to MBNCO's own analysis, will cost $200 million more per annum to maintain and operate and generates $300 million less in revenue relative to a fibre to the premises network. That is a $500 million per annum earnings gap. Or, put another way, because of the decision by the Liberal Party to abandon a fibre MBN in place for copper and HFC, Australian taxpayers are up to $500 million worse off every year. That is a staggering figure. And this is the reason why the government needs to implement this additional tax. The copper NBN looks increasingly exposed to competition from 5G. A full fibre network would have been upgradable as technology improves and able to better compete with emerging wireless technologies now and into the future. The Coalition's 2013 election commitment to deliver the NBN for $29.5 billion and complete it by 2016 was nothing short of a very cruel hoax. The cost of the MBN project increased from $29.5 billion to a cost of $51 billion with the completion date of 2020. And as it stands, the NBN is $20 billion over budget and four years behind what the Liberals promised. This bill proposes to apply a new broadband levy of $7.10 per month on households and businesses connected to a non-NBN network. This will add at least $84 to the annual bill of up to 500,000 residential and business services. 
The government even wanted to allow its levy to increase to $10 a month. The broadband tax proposed by the Morrison government is both poorly designed and highly regrettable. It has been criticised by the ACCC and the Productivity Commission, and it's disappointing that prior to the 2013 election, the Liberals encouraged other companies to deploy networks and compete directly against the NBN with the full knowledge that this would undercut the NBN business model. Mr Acting Deputy President, Labor is committed to a sustainable funding arrangement to support and improve NBN services in regional Australia. There is no substitute for a first-class fibre NBN with sound, long-term economics to support a sustainable funding mechanism. These failures of the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison governments have placed pressure on the economics of the NBN, and it's appropriate to ensure that there is a level playing field. One effect of this broadband levy is that it introduces a price signal that will deter inefficient duplication of NBN infrastructure and deter cherry-picking of profitable parts of the NBN footprint. Fixed-line operators currently competing in areas NBN Co intends to serve or those who are considering deploying infrastructure to compete directly with NBN Co down the track must understand they will be required to make a proportionate contribution to support the obligation NBN Co has to service the regions. NBN Co has a unique obligation to service parts of the country that are unprofitable to serve. Labor supports the establishment of a statutory infra infrastructure provider regime outlined in the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019. This will provide additional certainty that, as we move beyond the initial NBN rollout, every Australian home and small business can continue to access a high-speed broadband connection. This is a, national, a natural extension of the arrangements Labor put in place nearly 10 years ago through a statement of expectations issued to the NBN Co board. The statement of expectations required NBN Co to make high-speed broadband available to all Australians regardless of where they live or work. That has happened, and this bill provides certainty that it will continue to happen. After more than a decade in power, John Howard and his allies in the National Party had left Australia in a broadband backwater. It was Labor that established the principle that all Australians should have access to modern telecommunications infrastructure. And it was Labor that established the National Broadband Network to put this principle into practice. Universal broadband access is a Labor initiative and a Labor achievement, but the Liberals tried to stop it. It was only through the perseverance of the Labor Party and the Australian people that those Luddites opposite were forced to accept a national broadband network as a reality. Labor will not oppose these bills in this chamber. There were much better and more efficient ways to achieve the government's aims than the bill that is currently before the House, but the government's incompetence and lack of vision have left us in the mess we are in. Regional Australians know that when it comes to broadband, only Labor will be there to consistently deliver on their behalf. They know that despite their public relations spin, the Liberals and the Nationals have sold them out time and time and time again. They voted against universal broadband. They overcrowded the fixed wireless towers so they could skimp on the cost. Just recently, they cost $200 million in funding from regional fixed wireless network, and they didn't even want to launch the satellites. Universal broadband in Australia is an achievement of the Labor Party and the will of the Australian people. As we have done for over a decade, we will continue to put consumers and the regions front and centre of our policy making. Senator Urko. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Con uh, Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 and the Telecommunications Reg Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019. As we've heard, these bills work in conjunction with each other to do two key things. They legislate certainty that all premises in Australia can continue to access high-speed broadband infrastructure beyond the NBN rollout. This obligation already exists, but this gives it certainty, and Labor supports this. They also introduce a telecommunications levy that will add $7 per month to the bills of households and businesses on NBN, uh, sorry, on non-NBN networks. While highly critical of the lack of vision by various coalition governments that have led to this situation, Labor will not oppose this levy. 
Labor supports legislating a universal right to broadband access, as this was the principle that we first established when the NBN was announced. And so we support the establishment of a statutory infrastructure provider regime, as is outlined in the bill. It will provide improved certainty that as we move beyond the initial NBN rollout, every Australian home and small business can continue to access high-speed broadband connection. Labor in government established the National Broadband Network to bring this principle to reality. Universal broadband access is a Labor concept and a Labor achievement that the Liberals tried to prevent at every turn. It took them many years to come to the party and sign up to the principle of universal access, but in the end they had no choice. It, it is the only reasonable approach in a modern Australia with a modern economy. The NBN, a game-changing national infrastructure project for the 21st century and possibly beyond. That was the vision of the Labor government after winning the 2007 election. The vision of a connected nation able to embrace technology, communicate from remote and regional areas through to high-density urban areas, able to do business in new ways, able to teach and learn in new ways, able to interact with the rest of the world in new ways. Try, if you can, to imagine what the last six weeks of COVID-19 crisis would have been like without the NBN. All those Zoom and FaceTime and Skype meetings, all those precious family connections online, all the Zoom conferences, meetings and lectures with literally hundreds in attendance, all those businesses that were able to quickly and innovatively jump online and develop online shops, services and home delivery, telehealth consultations, most important at this time. Whole television and radio programs that could not have happened without the vision of a connected Australia. Every Labor representative from then and now and all the workers that are still working daily to connect homes and businesses deserve our thanks for pursuing that vision. Now we must turn to the so-called levy. First up, let's call it for what it is. It's a tax. It's a new tax. A new tax from a Prime Minister and Treasurer have stood up in Parliament many times to claim that the Coalition does not put up taxes. It is a $7 per month tax on internet services that will impact up to 500,000 residential and business services, some of them consumers and first home buyers in regional Australia. The government claims they are doing this in the name of regional Australia. But this is a long way from the truth. Let's be sure to remember that the Liberals initially opposed the NBN satellite and ridiculed the idea of the company owning and operating it. They congratulated themselves for oversubscribing the NBN fixed wireless networks, which led to congestion in some areas. Further, in October 2019, it was revealed shareholder ministers had quietly signed off on a $200 million reduction in investment for a regional fixed wireless network relative to the previous corporate plan. So this government is introducing a broadband tax in the name of regional funding while reducing regional investment at the same time. An extraordinary contradiction. This bill proposes to apply this new levy on households and businesses connected to non-NBN networks a poorly designed and highly regrettable tax that has been criticised by the ACCC and the Productivity Commission. In 2009, the then Labor government decided to build a national broadband network that would extend universal coverage of broadband to regional and remote Australia. This decision to extend high-speed broadband to unprofitable areas was funded through the universal wholesale pricing regime. This internal cross-subsidy amounts to more than $700 million per annum. This meant that MBN revenues from services provided in the cities and suburbs would help cross-subsidise higher cost services delivered over wireless and satellites in the regions. There was no contemplation of having a broadband levy and an internal cross-subsidy. Yet now the government wants to have both. Why the change? The key change has been the abandonment of fibre on the pretence that Australia would get a much cheaper, 
albeit inferior, multi-technology mix, but we haven't. We have a more expensive $51 billion multi-technology mix that unfortunately costs more and does less than the original plan. These older technologies, according to NBN Co's own analysis, cost $200 million more per annum to maintain and operate and generate $300 million less in revenue relative to a fibre to the premises network. So there is a $500 million per annum earnings gap, a st staggering figure. Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull decided to spend $51 billion on a technologically and economically inferior NBN that costs more and does less. And the NBN is $20 billion over budget and four years behind what the Liberals promised to deliver. Prior to the 2013 election, Malcolm Turnbull and the current Minister for Communications encouraged other companies to deploy networks and compete directly against the NBN with full knowledge this would undercut the NBN business model. They set out to sabotage the NBN and now want to introduce a tax to protect themselves against what they began. The irony is now the minister wants to increase prices for Australians who are on those competing networks that he once encouraged, some of which are in the regions themselves. However, we of the Labor Party must have the decency to talk straight on this issue. The reality has placed further pressures on the economics of the NBN. Therefore, while the levy is regrettable, Labor will not oppose it because it would undermine the economics of the NBN. We are committed to a sustainable funding arrangement to support and improve NBN services in regional Australia. We do have a, a Labor amendment to the bill which seeks to achieve two things. Firstly, in the topic of the modelling underpinning the charge. There does remain scope to improve transparency around the charge level, and there is broad agreement the modelling under undertaken in 2015 is based on inputs that are no longer accurate and could readily be updated. The government has had two years to update the model, but declined to do so. It should also be noted recommendation 18 of the NBN Joint Standing Committee recommended the model be updated in late 2018. This recommendation was agreed by government members, Labor and the crossbench. It was never acted upon. The legislation we are now debating is based on work performed half a decade ago when the NBN fixed wireless and satellite networks rollouts were still in their infancy. Today, the fixed wireless and satellite networks are largely complete. The real world costs are better understood. It was not Labor's preference to deal with this matter through a legislative amendment, but given the government was not inclined to act, this was the next step that was available. Therefore, Labor will introduce an amendment to require the levy modelling to be updated and a report produced within 150 days. The responsibility for this task will be placed in the hands of the ACCC. The purpose of the proposed report is to provide updated costings using the same model and methodology that was developed by the Bureau of Communications Research while taking into account changes to inputs and assumptions that have occurred since that amount was first determined. This is not a complex exercise, given the model has already been uh, developed and data is available to update it. To provide greater insight into what proportion of the levy charge derives from sunk costs and what proportion derives from forecast future costs, the amendment proposes that the report also provide broken down estimates for historical losses, future losses and total expected net losses. The other aspect of the ALP amendment is to improve NBN rollout data on the National MAP website. This builds on an existing ALP amendment to make rollout data available on the National MAP, map which has subsequently been incorporated into this bill. In closing, Labor supports the SIP scheme and welcomes its passage. There are aspects of the levy which are regrettable, but we do not want to undermine the economics of NBE. We will support this package and hope our amendments receive the report of the Senate. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 
and the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019 implement a comprehensive three-part package to improve the regulatory framework for the supply of high-speed broadband. These bills will significantly improve the provision of high-speed broadband in Australia through the following three measures. Firstly, by making carrier separation rules for high-speed residential networks more effective but also more flexible and giving carriers greater scope to both invest in superfast networks and also to compete. Secondly, uh, by introducing new statutory infrastructure provider obligations on the NBN Co and also others to support the ongoing delivery of high-speed broadband services. And also, thirdly, by establishing the regional broadband scheme to provide transparent and equitable long-term funding for NBN Co's satellite and fixed wireless networks that mainly serve our regional areas. The government's historic telecommunications reform package ensures all Australians are able to participate and share in the social and economic benefits of one of our nation's largest infrastructure projects. Consumers will benefit from the statutory infrastructure provider measures which ensure all Australians can access high-speed quality internet services. The rules set out base, uh, baseline standards for these services, peak download speeds of at least 25 megabits per second and peak upload speeds of at least 5 megabits per second. These services also need to support voice communications on fixed line and also fixed wireless services. In combination with the statutory infrastructure provider regime, the regional broadband scheme will provide the certainty that regional Australians want and that they deserve. That essential, affordable broadband services will be available to them and will remain available to them in the future. The regional broadband scheme will level the playing field by spreading the cost of Australia's investment in regional broadband services equitably across the NBN Co and also NBN compatible networks. It will do that by requiring all carriers to pay $7.10 per month for each premise on their network with a high-speed fixed-line broadband service. The charge is capped at $7.10 indexed to CPI to provide more regulatory and investment certainty, but also to support market competition. The telecommunications reform package strengthens competition and it also seeks to ensure equitable access. The government's proposed amendments to the telecommunications legislation amendment bill would update the commencement of statutory infrastructure provider standards and rules in light of the passage of time. These instruments can be used to fine-tune uh, the operation of the statutory infrastructure provider provisions. The government's amendments to the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Bill would also cha uh, change the designated start date for the Regional Broadband Scheme to 1 January 2021, instead of 1 July, following royal assent. This recognises the impact of COVID-19 on the telecommunications industry and it will also provide certainty to carriers and regulators about when their obligations under the scheme commence. The government accepts the amendments proposed by the opposition to the regional broadband scheme on the basis that they will provide an opportunity for the ACCC to review the modelling for the scheme prior to its commencement and also will improve transparency of public rollout information. The government's uh, complementary amendment also makes sure that the ACCC will have access to current information from carriers as an input to its report. These amendments do not impact on the government's original policy intent for this legislation. I also take this opportunity to respond to the committee's recommendations and the comments of the opposition senators on behalf of the government. Uh, in terms of the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee that the package and I note that they recommended that the package uh, be passed by the parliament. First of all, in relation to the issue raised on enhanced transparency, which relates to the NBN Co's funding arrangements. Uh, the government recognises the importance of providing a high level of transparency over the funding arrangement for NBN Co's fixed wireless and satellite network and also of the NBN Co's expenditure on these uh, networks. To this end, the bill contains a number of provisions to ensure transparency 
in the operation of the regional broadband scheme and also for the use of funds raised under the scheme by the NBN Co. The proposed new section, uh, 102ZB, of the bill will impose mandatory annual public reporting requirements on the Australian Communications and Media Authority to report the total amount of charge payments received. There will also be electronic registers for the contracts and also for the grants for the funding of fixed wireless broadband and satellite broadband, which will provide comprehensive details of the contract and also the grants awarded under section 80. The bill also includes the power for the Secretary of the Department to specify terms and conditions in the contract or grants to eligible funding recipients, such as NBN Co's established under section 80. Under section 87, the minister has the power to make rules by legislative instrument for the secretary to comply with in relation to the performance of their functions or the exercise of their powers. This could include requirements to improve transparency. And these rules are also subject to parliamentary scrutiny and also to disallowance. In the interest of further enhancing transparency of NBN Co's uh, funding arrangements in line with the committee's recommendation, the government also intends to use the existing provisions in section 87 of the bill to require NBN Co to provide ongoing public reporting on its expenditure on the fixed wireless and also its satellite networks. This will allow for increased, increased scrutiny of expenditure by the NBN Co of monies raised under the scheme by the uh, under the scheme by the parliament and also by the Australian public. Secondly, in relation to their comments on costings uh, costings in relation to the regional broadband scheme and that they be updated. The government does support updating the costings for the regional broadband scheme. The government notes the telecommunications regional broadband scheme charges bill 2019 requires the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission to review the charge at least once every five years and provide advice to the minister on the setting of charges for the regional broadband scheme. The government would support uh, requesting the ACCC to commence a broader review of the costings for the regional broadband scheme soon after commencement of the scheme, with the aim of providing advice to the minister on the cost component of the charge. Thirdly, in relation to the committee comment on the proposal to delay commencement of the regional broadband scheme, the government does recognise that carriers need time to prepare to implement regional broadband scheme charge given the impact of COVID-19 on the telecommunications industry. For this reason, the government is of the view that commencement of the scheme should be deferred by six months, as I've already uh, stated, to the 1st of January next year. Lastly, in relation to the comments on USO and that the government begin to work development on a roadmap for how the universal obligation uh, or the USO and the regional broadband scheme can be consolidated and harmonised over time. This is work that the government already has underway. In fact, the government's decision in 2017 to establish a universal service uh, guarantee, or USG, that provides for the sustainable and legislated delivery of voice, payphone and broadband services across Australia for the first time is actually all about integrating and guaranteeing these services over time. So in conclusion, Mr President, the government has indicated it will continue to work with industry and consumers on the way to improve the USG over time. And this remains our intention and this is what we are doing. The telecommunications reform package is a big win for consumers. That is why the bills are so strongly supported by consumer groups and regional stakeholders. That support includes from the National Farmers Federation, the Regional Rural and Remote Communities, uh, Communications Coalition, the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, the Royal Flying Doctor Service, the National Rural Health Alliance and many other uh, regional stakeholder groups. These bills are also a win for industry with more opportunities for competition at both the networks and the retail level. So, On behalf of the Minister for Communication, Cyber Safety, the Arts and the Government, I would like to thank members of the opposition and also the crossbench for their very constructive engagement throughout the process and for their support of these bills. 
These important reforms ensure that all Australians will have access to affordable, high-speed and quality internet services that they need to fully participate in the digital society. I now move that this bill be read a second time. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I've been asked to put the question on these two bills separately. So the first uh, question is that the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is now that the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019 be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. I simply ask that the, the Greens' position uh, in opposition to this bill be recorded. President. So recorded. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'll call the clerk to conclude the second reading. Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019, Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019. Uh, Senator Cormann, you were seeking. Uh, I seek leave to make a, a statement in relation to the sitting calendar for the remainder of the year. It's leave granted. Senator Cormann, leave is granted. Uh, I thank the Senate. Uh, I just uh, would like to inform the Senate that it is the government's intention uh, to be uh, tabling a, a sitting calendar for the remainder of uh, this year um, uh, later today. Um, and uh, given uh, that, uh, I would uh, ask the Senate to consider to defer consideration of motions, general business motions 561 and 575 until a later hour today. But I uh, make a commitment on behalf of the government that if after we have uh, tabled uh, and initiated the sitting calendar for the remainder of the year, any senator still wishes to proceed with either of those motions that the government would be giving leave for that to be considered at that time. So what was the second motion, Senator Cormann? Five, uh, so 561 and 575. 575. I'll make that observation when we get there. We're now, it's now 11.45, so I'll proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Rustin. I seek leave to remove a motion relating to bills to be considered from 12.45 p.m. today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rustin. I move that government business order of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be exempt from the cut-off as required and considered from 12.45 p.m. today, and that government business be called on after consideration of the bills listed in paragraph A and considered till not later than 2 p.m. today. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I also table statements of reasons justifying the need for the bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. I will call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Mr President, a postponement notification has been lodged in respect of business at Senate notice number two for today, postponed to the next day of sittings, and uh, no committees have lodged extension notifications. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall move on and proceed to the discovery of formal business. Senator Rustin. Um, I move that general business notice of motion number 591 be considered during general business today. Oh, okay. So motion number 591. Yep. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to a leave of absence for a senator. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Zelzer for yesterday, the 13th of May 2020, for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. Uh, Mr. President, um, I propose that I present the Selection of Bills Committee report. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, we must. Skip. All right, that was my error on the run sheet. We did skip over notices of motion, so we'll step back to that. Luckily, we didn't commence formal business. Um, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There aren't. So I'll now come to the selection of bills with committee report. Apologies, Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I present the fourth report of 2020 of the selection of bills committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Smith. I move that the report be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now we have proceeded through the other parts of. The business, and I will now proceed to the discovery of formal business, looking at the clerk to make sure I haven't 
inadvertently missed anything else. It being Thursday, I'll be going through the motions in the order they appear on the notice paper. So I'll commence with business of the Senate matter number five in the name of Senator Kitching. Senator Kitching, your motion, business of the Senate number five. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that business of the Senate mo notice of motion number five standing in my name for today, proposing a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee relating to issues facing diaspora communities in Australia, be taken as a formal motion. Sorry, I was dealing with the opposition manager. Um, is, Lee, is, any, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Kitchen. Mr. President, I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is for one minute. The government provides support to and engages with all Australians, including multicultural communities. More than 1,700 multicultural communities engagements occurred in April alone. The minister has regular meetings with key leaders of multicultural communities across the country. The question is the motion moved by Senator Kitching be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, I've now been asked to go back. I have on my list to be debated, but the opposition would like to move business of the Senate matter number four and have it dealt with here. Senator Urquhart. Uh, Mr President, before asking that it be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator Patrick will also sponsor the motion. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number four, standing the name of Senator Farrell and all opposition senators and Senators Lambie, Faruqi, Siwa and Patrick for today, proposing the disallowance be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. This regulation amends the formal access period ap ap applicable to a variation for an enterprise agreement to allow flexibility to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Employees retain the right to vote on any proposal. An agreement varied in this way must still pass the better off overall test and the Fair Work Commission must still be satisfied that the variation was genuinely agreed. The government has not been made aware of any instances of abuse and has in any case committed to review the operation of the regulation in coming weeks to ensure this continues to be the case. The question is the motion, business of the Senate motion number four be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that business of the Senate matter number four be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point to Senator Urquhart, tell her for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 30. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I'll give Senator Whips a chance to go back to their seat and come to matter general business number 548 in the name of Senator Ciccone. Senator Ciccone, you can speak from anywhere. Trying to find. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask that general business notion, uh, notice of motion number 548 stand in my name today relating to the impacts of COVID 19 on the construction industry be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Ciccone? I move the motion. Senator Rustin? I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Housing is primarily the responsibility of state and territory governments, but the Morrison Coalition government works closely in partnership with states and territories, contributing $6 billion a year improving housing and homelessness outcomes for all Australians. The Coalition's National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation's affordable housing bond aggregator has delivered more than $1.3 billion of housing loans, supporting the delivery of more than 1,500 new social and affordable dwellings and refinancing a further 5,000 existing dwellings. Senator Faruqi, and I'll come to you next, Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Greens support this motion. We have been strongly pushing for a massive investment from the federal government to build 500,000 public and community homes to provide a much needed roof over people's heads. The COVID 19 crisis has exposed even more how broken our housing system is. It's time for the federal government to lead from the front with a multi-billion dollar investment to construct high quality, climate conscious public and community housing as part of the economic stimulus. This will also create tens of thousands of jobs and thousands of apprenticeships. Housing is a human right and everyone should have a place to call home. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Construction industry is continuing. You're seeking leave to make a short statement, Senator Roberts? Yeah, I'll seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. <laughs> Thank you. The construction industry is continuing. Uh, and we've been discussing with unions in One Nation and also with others uh, how, to, how to best respond. What we're aware of is that there is, must be a limit, a finite limit on extra spending. We can't, because we also represent not just people who are looking for support, we also represent the people who are paying for the support, the taxpayers. So that's why we will not be supporting this motion, because we're protecting the taxpayers in an industry that is already uh, continuing. The question is that motion number 548 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Can I come to matter number 550? Senator Sheldon and others? Ah, Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Mr. President. Um, before asking that, I'd be that it be taken as formal, I wish to inform the chamber that Senator Brown will also sponsor the motion. 
I ask the General Business Notice of Motion Number 550, standing in my name, in the name of Senators Gallagher, Billick, Chisholm, Stirl, Smith, uh, Mariel Smith and Brown for today, relating to eligibility for the JobKeeper program, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Sheldon. Mr President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 550 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 28. The matter is therefore negative. The next matter, Senators, is the subject one of the matters that was a subject of Senator Cormann's statement earlier, number 561, in the name of Senator Gallagher. Um, so do you... Yes, Senator Wish Wilson. Point of order. Um, can I ask why we're, a, we're a, taking four minutes for divisions and not one minute? Uh, because of the extensive pairing arrangements, um, the whips have asked for four minutes, uh, and we, we were doing that over the course of this week. Um, normally, I can insist on a one-minute division, but given the extensive pairing arrangements, um, I'm in the hands of the Senate. But yeah, and, uh, Senator Cormann is quite correct. An, ac an, an accidental in the pairing arrangements, uh, spacing requirements, would end up taking more time. But I'm in the hands of the whips on. I'm in the hands of the whips on it. Um, Senator Gallagher or Senator Urquhart. <coughs> What am I doing? Deferring it. Oh, defer this motion. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'll we'll come back to it if necessary later. We'll move to five. That's five six one. Um, so we'll, if we'll run out. We'll, we will come to five six five now in the name of Senator McAllister. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number Five Six Five, standing in the name of Senator McAllister, for today relating to superannuation, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin, Statement. leave is granted for one minute. Last week, measures designed to protect the integrity of the early access to superannuation scheme helped detect a small amount of fraudulent activity associated with the program. This matter is currently under investigation by the Australian Federal Police. This program is supporting Australians through the coronavirus crisis. As of the 11th of May, around 1.4 million applications were approved by the Australian Tax Office for early release of superannuation, representing around $11.5 billion. The question is the motion moved by Senator Urquhart, number 565, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 565 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Dean Smith, matter number 566 in your name. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 566 relating to the Returned and Services League of Western Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith, 567. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 567 relating to the relationship between Australia and the United States of America, standing in my name and in the names of Senators Askew, uh, to be taken as formal, and I add Senators Sazelja, Van and Keneally as co-sponsors of the motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I move the motion standing in my name and in the names of other senators. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Waters. President, I seek leave to make a sh very short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. It's good to see the government recognising the importance of the Senate considering foreign policy motions at last. Uh, we oppose this motion, but of course we wouldn't deny formality. We'd rather put our position on the record. This motion celebrates that the Australian and US forces have fought alongside each other in every significant conflict since World War I. The Greens think the US military alliance makes us less safe, not more. As we have long said, it's time for Australia to stop unquestioningly doing the bidding of the US and chart our own independent foreign policy course. The importance of this couldn't be more evident with the erratic and dangerous Trump as president, but it will continue to matter when he's out of the White House. Moreover, the Australian parliament must debate and vote on new military actions and deployments that put our servicemen and women in harm's way. Question is the motion number 567 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith, 568. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 568 relating to the 70th anniversary of the Korean War, standing in my name and the name of Senator Askew, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Senators Sheldon and others. In Senator Urquhart, 569. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I seek to leave a minute. I'm sorry. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 569, standing in the names of Senators Keneally, Sheldon, McAllister, O'Neill, and Ayres for today, relating to aviation security in New South Wales. Before asking it to be taken is as a formal leave motion. Leave granted to amend the motion. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. Uh, I move the motion as amended. Oh, sorry. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion as amended. Senator Rustin. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Keeping Australian communities safe from those who seek to do us harm is and will always be the Morrison government's number one priority. 
the Aviation Transport Security Amendment Security Controlled Airports Regulation delivers on recommendations of the Inspector of Transport Security to strengthen security at Australia's airports, and particularly those serving regional communities. Regional airports are being supported through the government's $50.1 million Regional Airport Security Screening Fund. The government has also announced more than $1.2 billion in funding to support the aviation industry, keeping regional communities connected since the 18th of March 2020. These enhancements to regional aviation security and our commitment of funding to regional airlines and airports underscores the government's commitment to supporting regional communities and the aviation networks on which they depend. The question is that motion number 569 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Could I, Senator Faruqi, number 571? Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion number 571, standing in my name for today, relating to the impact of COVID-19 on international students, before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is, le is leave granted to amend the motion? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. There is an expectation, and there always has been, that temporary visitor visa, temporary visitors to this country can look after themselves while they are here. As part of their visa application, international students are required to demonstrate that they can support themselves completely in their first year. Students who have been here longer than 12 months who find themselves in financial hardship will be able to access their Australian superannuation. The government has also announced a $200 million boost to community services to expand support to people that need assistance, paying bills and buying other essentials such as food, clothing and petrol. International students are protected against eviction from rental accommodation on the same basis as all Australians. question is Senator Urquhart. Um, sorry, Mr President. Um, I seek leave to move an amendment to General Business Notice of Motion number 571. Um, I move the amendment as circulated in the name of Senator Keneally. Don't, I don't have one. Does, do others it have may one? Be the, it may be the same one. Yes, it, not 571, are yes. you sure? We've got an amendment from Senator Keneally on 573. They've done it, sorry. Okay, sorry, no yes. worries, so I'll take it. It's fine. I'm going to put matter number 571 as amended and moved by Senator Faruqi. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Senator Faruqi. So Senator Faruqi would like the support of the Australian Greens for that motion to be recorded. Senator Gallagher would like the Labor Party's position recorded as well. So we'll now go to now. I understand I'm advised that 572 refers to a motion we've already dealt with, so I'll take that as withdrawn. And I'll now come to 573 in the name of Senator Griff, and you're welcome to speak from there, Senator Griff. Uh, Mr. President, uh, before asking that it be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator McKim will also sponsor the motion. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 573, standing in my name and the name of Senator McKim for today, relating to temporary visa holders be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Griff. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government's $130 billion JobKeeper program provides unprecedented support to millions of Australians. Eligibility has been focused on maximising the reach of the JobKeeper program while ensuring the program is able to be implemented as quickly and efficiently as possible while remaining sustainable. There has and always has, uh, always has been an expectation that temporary visitors to this country can look after themselves while they're here. The government has an announced changes which will see most temporary visa holders with work rights able to accept up to $10,000 of their Australian superannuation to help them to support themselves during this crisis. This includes students who have been here for more than a year, working holiday makers and skilled visa holders. The government has also announced a $200 million boost to community services to expand support to people who may need it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move an amendment to General Business Notice of Motion Number 573, moved by Senator Griff. Is leave granted to move an amendment? I, leave is granted. I, I move the amendment as circulated in the name of Senator Keneally in the chamber. The question is that the motion be amended in the terms circulated in the name of Senator Keneally in the chamber. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short one-minute statement. Is leave, leave is granted for one minute. Uh, I'm, 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 is leave granted? 
Uh, yes, he is, a, he is, I believe, uh, added a, a mover of the motion. Leave is not granted in that case. All right. Well. Anyway, so I'm going to put the amendment on that basis. I, um, the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Urquhart on behalf of Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. I'll now move to the original motion moved by Senators Griff and McKim. Uh, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Can we go to Senator Griff, number 574, in your name, please? Uh, Mr President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 574, standing in my name for today, relating to unproven therapies for COVID-19, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. Mr President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters, 575, would you like us to and seek leave to defer that to the next sitting day. Thank you. Senator Waters, leave is granted. Senator Roberts, number 576. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion number 576, standing in my name for today, proposing an order for the production of documents concerning the Water for Fodder program before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted to amend the motion? In what? Yep, leave is granted. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I amend the motion by omitting par subparagraph A2. I ask that the amended motion be taken as a formal motion. So paragraph A2 is uh, deleted. The question, is there any objection to the amended motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. I move the motion as amended. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Rice, could I come to matter number 577? You're welcome to speak from there if you wish. We'll just give them a motion. Motion number 577, standing in my name today in the name of Se Senator Pratt. And in fact, I wish to inform the Senate that Senator Dean Smith has also asked his name to be added to the sponsor of this motion relating to the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Intersexism and Transphobia be taken as a formal motion. Is there any Senator Wong? I ask that my name be added to the motion, if you don't mind. So added. Uh, is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. I move I the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward, number five seven nine. Oh no, sorry, five seven eight. Uh, yeah. Also, and Senator Rice. I, Mr. Second one, Senator Rice. Great, thanks, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number Five Seven Eight, standing in my name, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Australian Sports Commission Act, 1989, and for related purposes. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. Ayes have it. Senator Rice. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. To amend the Australian Sports Commission Act 1989 and for relating purposes. Senator Rice. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rice. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Seward, number 579. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 579, standing in my name in the name of Senator Steelejohn for today, relating to disability support, the disability support pension and carer payment recipients, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no Senator Seward. I move the motion. Question. Senator Rustin. I believe to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government is providing disability support pension and care payment recipients with two 750 economic support payments to provide additional support in the context of the coronavirus outbreak. The coronavirus supplement is a temporary support and recognition of the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic, which will directly impede people's ability to find employment. 
Accordingly, the coronavirus supplement is payable to JobSeeper payment and other related allowances, as people on these payments are generally expected to participate in the labour market. Pensions, including the DSP and carer payments, will continue to be paid at the highest rate of payments within the income support system when temporary measures cease. Question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Senator Seawitt. Do you please record that the Greens are supported, supported that. that motion? Please. So recorded. The support for motion number 579. Um, Number 580, Senator Seawitt, I take it you'll move that as well? Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 580, standing in the name of Senator Steele, John, for today, relating to Australia's flaminamide survivors, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Seawitt. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The, the ayes have it. Number 582, Senator Urquhart. I ask that, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 582 stand in the name of Senator Keneally for today relating to vessels entering Australian waters during the coronavirus pandemic be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Ruston. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, the Commissioner of the Australian Border Force has very clearly included at recent Senate's, uh, Senate Select Committee on the COVID-19 uh, hearing on the 5th of May outlined the customs and immigration roles and functions of the ABF at the border. Uh, Senator Kalini should know that. The Morrison government is getting on with the job of protecting Australians during this unprecedented crisis. Question. Senator Hanson. No, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Senator Keneally has an art of writing immigration speeches that I admire, but when it comes to understanding Australian border force, she needs to brush up on her facts. At the Senate Selection Committee on COVID-19 hearing on 5 May 2020, the ABF Commissioner clearly put on the record evidence which rejects Part, <coughs> part 1B, 1F3 and 1F4 of Senator Keneally's motion. One Nation will not be supporting this distorted and misleading motion. Question is the motion number 582 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 582 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Watt or Urquhart, matter number 583. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 583, standing the names of Senators Watt, Chisholm and Green for today relating to Aviation security in Queensland before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted to amend the motion? Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I uh, seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Keeping Australian communities safe from those who seek to do us harm will and will continue to be the Morrison government's number one priority. The Aviation Transport Security Amendment Security Controlled Airports Regulation delivers on recommendations of the Inspector of Transport Security to strengthen the security of Australia's airports and particularly those serving regional communities. Regional airports are being supported through the government's $50 million Regional Airport Security Screening Fund. The government has also announced more than $1.2 billion in funding to support the aviation industry, including keeping regional communities connected since the 18th of March 2020. These enhancements to regional aviation security and our commitment to funding to regional airlines and airports underscores the government's commitment to supporting regional communities and the aviation networks on which they rely. The question is that motion number 583 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Mackenzie, number 584. I ask the general business notice of motion 584, standing in my name and in the names of Senators McMahon, Canavan, MacDonald and Davey, and I'd also seek leave to add uh, Senator Stoker. Uh, supporting law-abiding hunters and shooters and condemning state Labor governments uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Mackenzie. I move the motion. The question is that motion number 584 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Like our position recorded on that motion. So Thank recorded. You. Senator Waters. Vice President. Likewise for the Greens. So we go to matter number 585. Senator Waters. Yes, Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts would like his position in recorded in support of the motion. Senator Mackenzie. I'd like um, the coalition government's um, decision recorded as well. Yes, well, you moved it, Senator Mackenzie. So, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 585, standing in my name for today, concerning an order for the production of documents relating to the National Coordination Commission and Manufacturing Working Group, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The National COVID-19 Coordination Commission is an important part of the government's response to, the, to this crisis and will help advise the government on actions to participate 
uh, anticipate and mitigate the economic and social impacts of the pandemic. Transparency of matters relating to the crisis is important, which is why we supported the establishment of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 and are facilitating agencies and departments to appear before it. That committee is the appropriate mechanism to seek the information requested in this motion, and this is a significant duplication of the committee's work. Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The response to the Chinese coronavirus by the Morrison government has at times been delayed, but overall has kept the vast majority of Australians safe compared to other first world nations. While we appear to have suppressed the spread of the virus, its economic destruction continues and the risk of a second wave of infection is still not over. Until the Chief Medical Officer declares Australia is rid of COVID-19, I won't support the Greens' motion to go on a witch hunt. One Nation will not support the motion. The question is, motion 585 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Uh, record support for the Australian Greens and the Labor Party in supporting that motion, and Senator Lambie, and Senator Lambie, and Centre Alliance as well. Okay, by exclusion, everyone else voted against it. So, um, motion number five eight six, Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number five eight six, standing in my name for today, relating to Palestine, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is an objection, so formality is denied. Senator Waters. Uh, President, in lieu of uh, suspending standing orders, I seek leave to make a very short statement. Leave is granted for yes. one minute. Thank you, President. It's uh, disappointing that once again the government has denied leave on this important motion, especially after bringing their own foreign policy motion on. Uh, tomorrow, 15 May, is the day that Palestinians and their friends commemorate the Nakba, and now is a particularly critical time for Israel and Palestine and Palestinian human rights. Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu are undermining a two-state solution that could deliver peace and security to the Israelis and Palestinians. Netanyahu is intending to unilaterally implement parts of Trump's so-called peace plan and annex large swathes of the West Bank. Bank. It's time for Australia to speak up. We must oppose any illegal annexation and make it clear that there will be serious diplomatic consequences should it occur, just as there have been for other illegal annexations of territory. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. I thank the Senate. Uh, I note that this motion refers in part uh, to annexation plans by the uh, Israeli government, and I wanted to make a short statement in respect of that component. Labor notes the Israeli government's stated intention to consider annexation of land in the West Bank after the 1st of July. Unilateral annexation of the West Bank would weaken the viability of any future Palestinian state and risk destabilising Israel's neighbours, a risk the world cannot afford. Labor continues to support a just and durable two-state solution to the conflict and encourages both parties to pursue direct negotiations to that end. We continue to call on both sides to refrain from any actions that hamper peaceful outcomes for both the Israeli and Palestinian peoples. Senator Rustin. I ask leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. In line with the government's long-standing view, motions that cannot be debated or amended should not deal with complex foreign policy matters. Successive Australian governments have recognised that a future Palestine state is a final status issue to be negotiated directly between Israel and the Palestinians. We remain a supporter of a two-state solution where a Palestinian state exists alongside Israel in peace and harmony within internationally recognised borders. Successive Australian governments have called on all parties to the conflict between the Palestinians and Israel to refrain from provocative actions that raise tensions or undermine the prospects of peace. We will now move on to matter number 587. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 587. Um, Staying my name for today be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government has called on the international community to acknowledge the risks associated with wildlife wet markets and to take action to protect human health and agricultural industries. Australia's Chief Veterinary Officer, as President of the World Organisation for Animal Health, is seeking to deliver global reforms to wildlife wet markets to minimise the associated risks or to phase them out where practical. This approach will reduce the risk of future pandemics and their subsequent far-reaching grave impacts while still sustaining desirable global food security outcomes. Australia has some of the strictest wildlife trade rules in the world and are signatories to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, resulting in over a thousand species being prohibited from trade for commercial purposes. 
question is that motion number 587 in the name of Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. The noes have it. It being 12.45, I thank senators. We now move to government business. Senator Hanson Young. Clarification as to what the opposition's position on that motion um, was. I'm afraid that's not a matter for the so, chamber. Um, well, you can ask them, but well, I, I called it I, for the I, no. I would, I would like the Greens' support to be recorded and for those who voted no to be recorded. Uh, well, no, the standing orders allow you and the pr practice allows you to have your position and the Greens' position recorded. I called it for the no. Others will need to extrapolate from that. Or it can be debated at some other point. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Defence Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill now proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. It's the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to defence and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Farrell. From the Defence Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill of 2020, uh, the bill uh, will extend the period after a member leaves the Australian Defence Force within which they can access the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme with two, <laughs> two to five years and allow the former ADF members who have provided <clears throat> at least 12 months of service to continue to make contributions to ADF Super. These amendments will allow more veterans and their families to achieve home ownership and improve superannuation choice for former defence personnel. <coughs> Both changes uh, should improve ADF recruitment and retention and deliver better outcomes for defence personnel and veterans, and Labor supports them. I commend the bill to the Senate. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, I would sincerely like to thank all senators who contributed to the debate on this bill, and I also acknowledge the continued tradition of bipartisan support for our veteran community. In this latest initiative, Support Our Veterans, the government recognises that transitioning from military service to civilian life is a significant life-changing event for many veterans. And it's also a period of uncertainty for uh, their family members as well. This bill demonstrates the commitment of this government uh, has made to supporting ADF members to assist them in their successful transition and also to continuing to support them as veterans. As part of the government's election commitments, this bill will amend the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme Act of 2008. This amendment will extend the period members can access the Defence Home Ownership <coughs> Assistance Scheme after they leave the ADF. The access period will be extended from two years to five years, allowing much needed additional time for former ADF members to look for suitable accommodation without being rushed into purchasing a home for fear of losing their entitlement. The bill will also amend the Australian Defence Force Superannuation Act 2015. Importantly, this amendment allows former ADF members who have provided at least 12 months continuous full-time service to continue to make contributions to their ADF super accounts once they are in civilian employment. These amendments offer security and certainty to veterans and also to their families in terms of accessing housing support and financial planning for their retirement, which, is both, which are both so important to their successful and rewarding transition to civilian life. I commend this bill. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to defence and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I, uh, move, uh, I move this bill for the third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to defence and for related purposes. 
Government Business Order of the Day number 7, Student Identifiers Amendment Enhanced Student Permissions Bill 2019, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Farrell, I believe you are seeking the call. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. Um, the Opposition supports the Health Insurance Amendment General Practitioners and Quality Assurance Bill 2020 and commends the bill to the Senate. Minister. Thank you. I rise to sum up on the bill and I thank all members for their contributions to this debate. The Student Identifiers Amendment Enhanced Student, Enhanced Student Permissions Bill 2019 <coughs> will broaden student controlled access to a range of entities, allowing them to request access to a student's authenticated vocational education and training transcript. This change will provide confidence to industry on the authenticity of vocational education and training qualifications. It also supports the Australian government's commitment to strengthening our VET system to become a modern, flexible and trusted sector that provides an excellent standard of education and training. The bill introduces a civil penalty regime to protect the integrity of Student Identifiers Initiative and to act as a deterrent to unwanted behaviour in this sector. It also clarifies that the Student Identifiers Registrar has the power to determine, by exemption, whether a vocational education and training qualification or statement of attainment can be issued by a registered training organisation to a student who does not have a student identifier. Lastly, it also clarifies spending powers associated with the student identifier's special account. An addendum to the explanatory memorandum for the bill has been tabled that responds to concerns raised by the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. The committee requested that the key information provided in, my, in the response to the committee be included in the explanatory memorandum to the bill, and I confirm this action has been undertaken. I commend this bill to the House. Uh, Senator Farrell. Oh, um, <coughs> Mr. Acting, uh, Deputy uh, President, uh, I was. Uh, Are you seeking slightly, leave? Yes, the I'm seeking leave to closed, make us. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm short. conscious, Senator Farrell, that the order this bill was brought on is not in accordance with the order that was listed. Uh, are you seeking leave to make the contribution you would have otherwise made? Yes, I am. Is there any objection? There being none, leave is granted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting <coughs> President. I thank the, the uh, government for <coughs> allowing me to make a contribution. Uh, Labor will support this bill in the Senate. It provides the ability for employers and licensing bodies to verify applicants' qualifications and deters people from fraudulently altering their VET transcripts. By making it easier for employers to check people's qualifications doesn't fix the fact that this government has presided over the failure of the vocational education and training sector and a national skills crisis that is making it harder for employers to fill job vacancies at the same time the country is in an underemployment crisis. Labor referred this bill um, to inquiry by the Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee to make sure that there is no unintended consequences that make it harder for workers to make a fresh start. It's important not to strip away people's ability to make a fresh start in life. Labor wanted to make sure that students aren't placed at an unreasonable disadvantage when they are applying for jobs, that their privacy is protected and that they can properly control the data they share with potential employers. We are satisfied that if uh, someone flunked out of a uh, training course uh, when they were young because they were caring for a family uh, member or dealing with mental health issues, but they've successfully gone back and completed a diploma some years later, they will be able to control how much of their VET transcript they share with prospective employers, only the qualifications that are relevant to the job. Thank you, Senator Farrells. The minister has uh, closed the debate, uh, so the question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Student Identifiers Act 2014 and for related purposes. So no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, I move that the bill will now be read a third time. The question is, the bill will be read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Student Identifiers Act 2014 and for related purposes.
President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 1 Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is, will be read a first time? Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted. Being no objection. Leave is granted. Uh, Senator McAllister, you're seeking the call? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This bill seeks to amend the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997. Schedule 1 of the bill expands the definition of a significant global entity. And this measure will ensure that certain entities that are not captured by the definition, including trust partnerships and investment entities, are covered by particular reporting requirements and multinational tax avoidance laws. Schedule 1 also ensures that entities comply with Australia's international commitments as part of the OECD's base erosion and profit shifting action plan. Schedule 2 of the bill amends various acts to make permanent certain forms of tax relief for merging superannuation funds, uh, forms of relief that are currently temporary. This was a recommendation, a recommendation of the Productivity Commission's 2019 reporting to superannuation and will make mergers between superannuation funds simpler. I rise really to make the point that commitments to making multinationals pay their share fair, fair, a fair share of tax are immensely important. We welcome international companies operating in Australia. So many Australians benefit from their operations, uh, receiving jobs. They're an important part of our economic infrastructure. But let's be clear that these same companies benefit a great deal from the government services that make it possible for them to hire well-educated and skilful staff. The government services that provide terrific transport infrastructure that allow product to be moved around the country. The government investment in infrastructure that means that telecommunications facilities are available. Uh, the government investment in health care and health infrastructure, which has proven so important in COVID-19 uh, and ensures that the Australian workforce is healthy. These things, alongside our legal system and the institutions that sit around that, absolutely support the economic activities of these companies. And it is not unreasonable to ask these companies when they are in Australia to pay their fair share of tax. But the government really drags their feet on this, and I note that many of the provisions <coughs> in this bill have been the subject of repeated inquiry, investigation and recommendation by the Senate Economics Committee. The average Australian worker pays 25 per cent of their income in tax, but it was reported in 2018 that one third of large Australian companies paid no tax at all. Data issued by the Australian Taxation Office showed that 722 out of the uh, 2,119 companies examined failed to pay any tax in the 2016-17 tax year, and the companies that paid no tax included 100 firms that reported more than a billion in total income. Those opposite voted against Labor's tax transparency laws in 2013, which would have enabled us to better understand the extent of tax avoidance. Everyday Australians pay their tax and they expect large companies to be held to the same standard. Minister. Thank you. I thank senators for their contribution and I commend the bill to the Senate. So the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Uh, so no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. Thank you. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is, bills be read a third time. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. 
o'clock. Message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding a resolution agreed to by that House to refer a matter to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services for inquiry and report. Text of the resolution is available on the dynamic red. Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Competition Consumer Bill 2019 and a related bill in Committee of the Whole. So we are moving into the committee. Uh, is it a wish of the committee that bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests. Senator Kitching. I would like to flag to the committee that I do have some amendments. The Labor has some amendments. I'm happy to speak to them now, or the minister may. Are you seeking the call, or would you like uh, Senator Kitching to speak? Senator Kitching, you have the call. Thank you. Um, Labor's amendments to the amendment to the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019, as outlined in Sheet 8878, seeks to achieve two things. First, on the topic of the modelling underpinning the charge, there does remain scope to improve transparency around the charge level, and there is broad agreement the modelling undertaken in 2015 is based on inputs and assumptions that are no longer accurate. Given the government has not acted on the agreed Joint Standing Committee recommendation of 2018 to update the model, this amendment proposes that the levy modelling be updated and a report outlining certain matters be produced and published within 150 days. The responsibility for this task would be placed in the hands of the ACCC. The purpose of the report is to provide updated costings using the same model and methodology developed by the Bureau of Communications Research in 2015. While taking into account changes to inputs and assumptions that have occurred since the levy charge amount was first determined. Some examples of inputs that are known to have changed are costs to deploy the fixed wireless network and the number of premises over which the levy charge might be spread. We do not consider updating the model will be a complex exercise given a model has already been developed and updated data inputs are available. Should the Senate carry this amendment, we understand the government will propose a further amendment to give the ACCC power to seek information from NBN Co and other carriers to support their efforts to update the model. Labor supports the, that amendment. The amendment also proposes that the updated costings produced by the ACCC provide a breakdown, the proportion to, provide a breakdown for the proportion of the levy charge from costs which are already sunk and the proportion of the levy charge that derives from forecast future costs. The second aspect of the Labor Amendment is to improve NBN rollout data on the National MAP website. Uh, this builds on an existing ALP amendment from the previous term of Parliament to make rollout data available on the National MAP. I want to acknowledge the government has incorporated that amendment into this reintroduced bill and this amendment before the Senate today is a further supplement to that. These are reasonable and constructive amendments that seek to improve the bill. We hope they receive the support of the Senate on their merits. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kitchen, are you seeking leave to move those? Uh... Seeking leave, Acting Deputy President. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Leave's granted. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, before I respond to uh, Senator Kitching's comments, uh, I'd like to table three supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to the government amendments uh, to be moved to the Telecommunications Legislation Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 and the government request for an amendment to be moved to the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019. Uh, I, I thank Senator Kitching for her comments and for the Labor Party's uh, feedback on their amendment. Uh, the government does accept the amendment proposed by the opposition to the regional broadband scheme. These amendments do not impact on the government's original policy intent for the legislation. And these amendments uh, provide an opportunity for the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission to review the modelling for the scheme prior to its commencement. 
Nonetheless, the government remains confident that the 2015-2016 modelling undertaken for the regional broadband scheme continues to provide a reasonable estimate for the introductory charge. The short time frame for delivery of the report by the ACCC means that it will naturally be limited in scope. In recognition of the limitations of this analysis, I intend to, uh, the minister intends to ask the ACCC to commence a review of the costings for the RBS in due course. Under the legislation, the ACCC will review the base and administrative cost components at least once every five years to ensure they are sufficient to meet the reasonable net costs associated with NBN Co's fixed wireless and satellite networks and administrative costs of the scheme. Uh, the government's complementary amendment, uh, which is number QL144, makes sure that the ACCC will have access to current information from carriers as an input to its report. Senator Kitching. Thank you. So, Labor supports this government amendment. Um, ensuring the ACCC has timely access to updated data inputs will help support efforts to update the model. Um, our, our understanding was that the NBN and the industry would have cooperated with the ACCC, and if this measure provides further certainty, um, we are happy to support it. Thank you. Uh, so the question is that amendments on uh, 8878 by leave moved together be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. I seek leave to move government amendment, amendment QL159 um, in relation to uh, sorry, SIP amendments. Leaves granted. Leaves granted. Thank you. Minister. Uh, amendments 1 and 2 fine tune the operation of statutory infrastructure provider, or SIP, as more st uh, known, better known, standards and rules, and in particular how they operate with instruments that may be made by the ACCC or the Australian uh, ACCC. The SIP regime requires SIPs to supply wholesale services and SIP standards or rules that could be made dealing with issues such as timeframes for con connecting and repairing services and other terms or conditions of supply. The ACCC may also make instruments that deal with the same matters. In this case, SIPs need to know which instrument has primacy. The bill uh, currently provides that SIP standards or rules prevail over ACCC instruments made after the commencement of the section to the extent of any inconsistency. It is possible that there could, at least in the short term, be a conflict between a SIP standard or rule and an existing ACCC instrument made prior to the commencement. Amendments 1 and 2 clarify that the SIP standards or rules would also prevail in this case to the extent of any inconsistency. Uh, Amendment 3 provides for the deferral of the commencement of the RBS to 1 January 2021 by replacing the proposed definition of designated start date with a new definition to mean 1 January 2021. Amendment 4 and 5 are consequential to Amendment 3. If passed in May this financial year, the designated start date would commence on 1 July this year, at a time when the telecommunications carriers are offering hardship relief due to COVID-19. This also provides little time to make arrangements for the commitment of this scheme. The date change recognises the impact of COVID-19 on the telecommunications industry and will provide certainty to carriers and regulators about what their, uh, when their obligations under this scheme commence. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Labor supports this amendment. Um, to implement this legislation, carriers would have been, had to have changed their IT systems and, in some instances, developed new capabilities in order to determine levy liabilities in their enterprise footprints. So we think this is a sensible amendment to, um, to delay the commencement of the levy, given, as the minister has stated, um, the impact of COVID-19. Um, we are quite close to the next, to the next financial year priorities facing the industry um, in relation to COVID-19, um, having a commencement date of the 1st of July would have presented serious challenges. So, that, so Labor supports this amendment. Thank you. So the question is that amendments one to five on 
um, QL159 by leave move together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. I now move amendment, uh, the amendment on sheet QL144. Uh, these amendments modify the reporting month and lodgement time frame for the one-off report which carriers would be required to provide to the ACCC under existing section uh, 102ZF. This amendment is complementary to Opposition Amendment 8878, as it would ensure that the ACCC has current information from carriers when undertaking its review of the Regional Broadband Scheme modelling. The government's complementary amendment, QL144, this one, makes sure that the ACCC will have access to current information from carriers as an input to its report. Amendment 1 would shorten the period of provision of the one-off report by carriers within 60 days of the bill's royal assent. Amendment 2 updates the reporting period to the month prior to the due date of the report. Uh, the report gives a snapshot of the high-speed fixed-line broadband market after commencement of this bill. Uh, this in information will be an important data source for the ACCC as part of preparing advice to the minister about the base component of this charge. Uh, this allows more timely information and support, and it also supports the government's evidence-based decision-making sooner, meaning better outcomes for consumers and also for industry. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We Labor supports this amendment, um, ensuring the ACCC has timely access to update data inputs will help support efforts to update the model. Um, this is important and is helpful uh, in a number of respects. Um, we understand that the MBN and the industry will cooperate with the ACCC, um, and this measure provides further certainty, so we're happy to support it. Thank you. So the question is, amendments one and two on QL144 by leave move together, be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Oh, sorry, Minister. Happy, happy. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, I would move amendment, uh, the government amendment on sheet QL146. Uh, this amendment makes a technical correction to the definition of fixed wireless broadband service. Uh, the charge bill incorrectly defines fixed wireless broadband service as having the same meaning as in the Telecommunications Act 1997, where it is not defined. The amendment corrects this definition and provides that such a term has the same meaning as in Part 3 of the Telecommunications Consumer Protection and Services Standard Act 1999. This amendment does not change the policy intent or operation of the Regional Broadband Scheme. Senator Kitchen. He's acting Deputy President. Labor will support, um, support this amendment. So, uh, the question now is that the request uh, for an amendment on sheet QL146 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. So uh, we move to the Australian Greens amendments on sheet 8958. Uh, these are uh, amendments which reflect the position uh, that I put on behalf of the Australian Greens during um, my second reading speech. Schedule 4 um, sets out the various charge collection and other administration arrangements associated with the Regional Broadband Scheme um, found in the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2019, which the Australian Greens do not um, support. As I said in my second reading speech, the most appropriate, equitable and tech technology agnostic means for funding a regional broadband scheme is actually directly from the Commonwealth budget, and that remains um, the Greens' position. And um, uh, Acting Deputy President, I, I just seek your advice. I think I need to move these separately um, ra rather than together. Uh, Senator McKim, you can seek leave to move them collectively, and the questions will be put separately. Okay. Well, I do uh, seek leave to move them together, Acting Deputy President. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. All right. Um, thank you. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Labor is opposing these amendments um, as contained 
uh, the, Greens, the Greens political party's amendments. Um, we won't be supporting it. There are no doubt shortcomings and issues with the design of the levy. Uh, these issues have been identified by the ACCC and the Productivity Commission. Um, however, to oppose the levy outright would undermine the economics of the NBN, and this is not something Labor is prepared to do. Thank you. Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, the government uh, does not support uh, the Greens' amendments, and uh, it's, we believe it's in inherently inconsistent, and also it's not practical to have a national broadband delivery obligation if there is no way to fund it. So we do uh, oppose this. So the question uh, now is that uh, uh, sheet 8958 as amended be agreed to. Is that Schedule 4 as amended be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Noes have it. The noes have it. The question is put again. Those of uh, uh, Schedule 4 as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those again say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now have to. So we will now return to Australian Green Amendment Sheet 1, or Amendment 1 on Sheet 8958. Uh, that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. Uh, so the question now is that the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 as amended be agreed to and the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Change Bill 2019 be agreed to subject to a request uh, that the bills be agreed to without amendment or requests? The first part. Subject to request. All of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. So the question now is that the bill, uh, the bills be reported. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, the committee has considered the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 and the Telecommunications Regional Broadband uh, Scheme Charge Bill 2019 and agreed with amendments. Okay. Minister. Oh, thank you. I move that the report of the Committee for the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 be adopted. All those, uh, is that agreed? All those in favour say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Competition and Consumer Bill 2019 be read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to telecommunications and for other purposes. So just to inform the Senate, the uh, second bill will now go to the 
House of Reps a request. Uh, Clark. Government business, order of the day number three, official development assistance, multinational replenishment obligations, special appropriation bill 2019. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Labor has a proud history of supporting foreign aid. We know that it's not just in Australia's national interest, but it's the right thing to do as a prosperous nation and a good global citizen. In supporting foreign aid, we also support the multilateral agreements and institutions that drive our global systems of development assistance. This bill, if passed, will make a special appropriation from the Consolidated Revenue Fund to meet Australia's payment obligations to six multilateral development funds. And these six funds are the International Development Association, which is the World Bank's development arm, the Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Initiative, a World Bank debt relief scheme administered by the International Development Association, the multi Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative, a World Bank debt relief scheme administered by the International Development Association, the Asian Development Fund, which provides development grants to low-income members of the Asian Development Bank, the Global Environment Facility Trust Fund, which is administered by the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development to support sustainable development activities, and finally, the Multilateral Fund for the implementation of the Montreal Protocol, which provides assistance to developing countries in phasing out <laughs> ozone-depleting substances. The six multi multilateral funds require pledging nations to provide an unqualified instrument of commitment stating that there is no impediment to making the pledged payments. However, since 2014-15, the annual appropriations bill have included automatic repeal provisions which extinguish unused appropriations three years after they are made. This is why these payments need a special appropriation instead of being included in the budget bills. Australia's annual payments to the funds average around $350 million, but this will not have any impact on the underlying cash balance as they are funded out of existing aid appropriations. The bill continues the active role that Australia has played over many years in supporting these funds. Labor is a big supporter of Australia's international development program, so of course we support these appropriations. In fact, Labor was behind many um, of the multilateral agreements that established these funds and the institutions behind them. Labor's commitment to the World Bank goes as far back as the Chifley government's decision to support Bretton Woods institutions in the aftermath of the Second World War. And it was the Hawke government in 1987 that made Australia one of the first countries to ratify the Montreal Protocol on ozone-depleting substances. This is undoubtedly one of the most successful international agreements on the environment, if not the most successful, which has helped the ozone hole above Antarctica start to heal. Mr Acting Deputy President, these funds are necessary not only as a part of our contribution to development assistance, but also in supporting the multilateral institutions that are at the heart of this system. The work that these multilateral funds support is vital to many global development causes such as tackling poverty, promoting sustainable development in some of the world's poorest countries and addressing environmental challenges which require global cooperation. While we welcome this bill and appreciate the need for a special appropriation for these funds, it appears that this government has somewhat of a split personality when it comes to support for multilateral institutions. On the one hand, we have the bill we are now debating before the Senate, where the government is making a commitment to meeting its obligations to various multilateral funds. But then, bizarrely, on the other hand, we had a speech from the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, late last year, criticising what he refers to as negative globalism. After that speech, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade told Senate estimates they had not heard the term negative globalism before. If Mr Morrison was taking Australia's commitment to multilateralism in a different direction, then he certainly hadn't consulted DFAT. To get a sense of what negative globalism actually means, we can only look to the definition in Mr Morrison's speech. And according to the Prime Minister, negative globalism, quote, coercively seeks to impose a mandate from an often ill-defined borderless global community and, worse still, an unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy. Now, I would like to know where this so-called unaccountable bureaucracy exists. Multilateral institutions are only given life and mandate 
by international treaties that countries like ours freely enter into. I and I'm sure many Australians would like some clarity around where the Prime Minister and his government are going with this concept of negative globalism. Does it represent a major policy, policy shift away from a commitment to multilateralism? Or is it just another thought buzzle, a bizarre thought bubble from the Prime Minister? If there is one area in which the government's demonstrated commitment to multilateralism is badly lacking, it's their appalling record on official development assistance, or what is more commonly known as foreign aid. Labor has a strong commitment to foreign aid because we understand and accept, accept both the moral and the national interest arguments for it. And in government, we have followed through on this commitment. I'm very proud of Labor's record on foreign aid investment. When we were last in government, we doubled foreign aid and we set out a timetable for increasing aid to 0.5 per cent of gross national income. This was an interim goal towards the agreed target of 0.7 per cent of GNI set by developed countries in 1970. So far, only five members of the OECD have met this target. Luxembourg, Norway, Sweden, Denmark and the UK. Mr Acting Deputy President, foreign aid is not just giving away money to people overseas. It's an investment in a prosperous, peaceful, healthy and secure world. And there are two major reasons why foreign aid should be a policy priority of any government. Firstly, contributing to foreign aid is in Australia's national interest. We live in a global community and the security of our country is, to a large extent, dictated by the security of the world beyond our borders. So many national security threats from overseas are exacerbated by extreme poverty. Poverty fuels transnational crime, conflict and terrorism. Of course, it can't be accepted as an excuse for crime or armed conflict, but it is often a contributing factor. Consider, for example, the social and economic costs from the flow of illicit drugs into Australia, which is running into the billions. When crime offers an escape from extreme poverty, then those experiencing poverty are more likely to risk engaging in it, and the rewards of doing so will be comparatively greater. One form of crime in particular that is having an impact on the lives of everyday Australians is, of course, cybercrime. And I've said a great deal in this place over the years about cyber safety and the threat posed to Australians by scams. The ACCC's targeting scams report found that in 2018 Australians lost close to half a billion dollars to scams and that rate of loss has been increasing rapidly over time. Most of these scams are perpetuated from beyond our borders and often by people who see it as a way out of poverty. There is of course no excuse for trying to cheat innocent people out of their money, none at all, but if we are helping people find legitimate means to escape poverty then it will also help to reduce the incidence of crimes such as these. Another security threat facing Australia is the spread of infectious diseases. The COVID-19 pandemic is a perfect example of how connected we are to our global environment and how poverty in other countries can impact us here in Australia. Ian Golden, Professor of Globalisation and Development at Oxford University, wrote in, a, in an opinion piece in The Guardian, the poorer the country, the less capable it is of addressing people's pressing needs from identifying and treating cases of the virus to supporting communities and businesses deprived of income. And a further observation in Professor Golden's article was, we are only as strong as our weakest links. In the case of COVID-19, if one country is a pandemic hotspot, we are all at risk of infection. Professor Golden went on to conclude that we need to show solidarity with those beyond our borders. Now, I sympathise with those who talk about the challenges confronting struggling Australian families and who say we should fix our problems at home before sending money overseas. But if we can create a more secure and prosperous world, the money we save from having to defend against national security threats such as terrorism, crime and communicable diseases can be reinvested in helping Australians. And furthermore, when other countries develop economically, our economy benefits too. It's worth recognising that a number of our most valuable export markets were, at some point in history, aid recipients. While foreign aid investment is in Australia's national interest, there is another really good reason to invest in foreign aid. It's simply the right thing to do. The good we can do in the world by such things as supporting economic development, feeding starving children and stopping the spread of preventable disease 
is our obligation as one of the world's wealthiest nations and as a good global citizen. I have no doubt most Australians would agree. We are, after all, generous by nature. Egalitarianism, mateship and fairness are principles integral to our culture and national identity. Each year, Australians give around $11 billion to charity. In day-to-day -day life, we help our friends, neighbours and even people in the street, not because it might be of material advantage to us, but because most people have the decency to lend a hand when somebody needs it. And if we practice these principles when dealing with each other as individuals, then as a nation, we should behave the same way. A prosperous country like Australia should give generously to those that are less fortunate. The 2019 Lowry Institute poll found that Australians, on average, think around 14 per cent of Australia's budget is spent on foreign aid. The average response to how much of the budget Australia should spend on foreign aid was 10 per cent. The amount Australia actually spends is closer to around 0.8 per cent of the budget, about one twelfth of what Australians, on average, consider reasonable. So, if you look at that spending in terms of Australia's gross national income, our current contribution is only 0.19 per cent. This is the lowest level Australia's aid spending has been as a proportion of GNI since the data started being published in 1961. And Australia's contribution to foreign aid has fallen to this record low because of $11.8 billion in savage, cruel cuts since the Liberals came to power in 2013. Australia's meagre aid budget under this Liberal government is doing irreparable damage to our international standing and bilateral relations. Australia used to have a reputation as one of the most responsible, forward-thinking global citizens, and now our standing is falling in the eyes of the world. What is even worse about these savage cuts is that they are shortchanging some of the most desperate, impoverished and struggling people in the world. I'm not exaggerating when I say that these cuts are savage enough for thousands of people to die as a result. One estimate says that close to half a million lives may be at risk. These are not the actions of a government that is truly committed to international development. I and my colleagues on this side of the chamber are appalled at this government's record on international development. Ever since those opposite came to government, they have treated the foreign aid budget like an ATM that they can take money from any time they need to prop up the budget. And if they're tempted to do so again in this year's budget using their recently established foreign aid review as cover, I would strongly caution against doing so. Cuts to foreign aid at any time are both cruel and counterproductive. But during the crisis, it's one of the absolute worst times to be making these cuts. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated more than ever the importance of global solidarity. We know COVID-19 has had a disastrous economic impact at home, but for many developing countries, it has been even more devastating. Not only do they need our assistance more than ever before, but the benefit of our assistance in terms of how it lessens the pandemic threat to the health and safety of Australians is so much greater. While I welcome the bill that is now before the Senate, I would also welcome a commitment from this government to recognise the value of foreign aid and to start working on reversing their savage cuts and reinvesting in international economic development. If I cannot convince those opposite that this is in the interests of Australians, then let me appeal to their humanity. Let me implore those opposite to help more people have the means to eat, drink clean water, have access to shelter and electricity, to go to school and to stop dying of preventable diseases. If my appeal to the government's humanity is unsuccessful, then it simply confirms what I have long suspected, that this government is heartless and uncaring that they are devoid of compassion, decency and any sense of moral obligation. I would love for those opposite to prove me wrong, and I invite them to do so. They can start by winding back their cuts to foreign aid and treating the foreign aid budget as something to invest in, not a cookie jar that they can raid any time they're short of funds. I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I oppose this bill, One Nation opposes this bill, and we do so because we support and love our country. We support Australia. 
One Nation opposes any remuneration bill that does not specify how much money is being spent. So do the taxpayers know right now that this bill has no spending limit? It's an open cheque to the UN. Now, I understand that the agreements we signed specific specify how total budgets are to be broken up amongst members, but not how much the total budget should be. How can we do this? There are five different UN organisations that are the subject of this bill. The Global Environmental F Facility, to take an example, has grown from $1 billion in the original agreement that we signed to $4 billion today. The World Bank's International Development Association has gone from $24 billion to $35 billion in just the last two years. Our money. This bill gives the United Nations a blank cheque to waste taxpayers' money and just hold their hand out for more. That is, the UN hold its hand out for more. Mr Acting Deputy President, I do not believe these organisations are good value for money. In fact, many are corrupt to the core. The World Bank's International Development Association spends 24 per cent, almost a quarter, of its public funds, of its funds on public administration, a quarter, blown out the door through administration, and 19 per cent, almost one-fifth, on subsidising renewable energy. That does not lift people out of poverty because it is too unreliable. It consigns people to poverty. That's what it's doing to this country. What does the World Bank's International Development Association spend on health, Mr Acting Deputy President? Any idea? Just 8 per cent. And on education, the one thing that does lift people out of poverty, also a measly 8 per cent. Perhaps the International Development Association could spend more lifting people out of poverty if they were not spending $3.3 billion every year on administrative expenses. $3.3 million, including our cash. The Asian Development Bank's Asian Development Fund has been providing low interest loans to lift people out of poverty since 1974. 1974. So in 46 years, their low interest loans have not lifted the people of Asia out of poverty, but maybe the millions more we are about to give the Asian Development Fund will do the trick. Maybe. The past 46 years, nothing much, but let's see what happens. Actually, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm not sure why we're even funding the Asian Development Fund. They currently have $457 billion in outstanding loans. $457 billion. Now, I'm not suggesting that the scheme has been unsuccessful. The two largest recipients have done extremely well. India has $68 billion of those loans and are now the world's fifth largest economy. Not because of the Asian Development Fund, I might add. China has $62 billion of those loans and is now the world's second largest economy. Oh, really? I wonder if they're using that to buy up islands and make islands, sorry, in the South China Sea. Perhaps if Australia can get some of these loans, we can stop Australia sliding out of the top 10 of world's largest economies. And I remind every Australian that early last century, in the early days of our federated nationhood, Australia led the world in per capita income. We were number one in the world. We're now sliding out of the 10, heading to slide out of the 20. Oh, sorry, we have already slid, slid out of the 10, the top 10 largest economies. Australia should be grateful that at least the Asian Development Bank is careful with its administrative expenses, only spending $1 billion last year on administration. I did note this, though. The Asian Development Bank, Asian Development Fund, spent $25 million last year on salaries and expenses for their board of directors, their 12-member board of directors. $2 million per director seems a little high for unelected internationalist bureaucrats, or as the Prime Minister said, unaccountable internationalist bureaucrats. When the Asian Development Fund talk about lifting people out of poverty, 
I don't think the Australian taxpayers would take that to mean the Asian Development Fund's board of directors being lifted out of poverty. The multilateral fund for the implementation of the Montreal Protocol is another soak for ca taxpayer cash. The Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer, yeah, that's another title, Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer was ratified in 1987. It requires countries to reduce levels of production and consumption of ozone depleting substances according to an agreed schedule. Now, I expect Australian taxpayers thought that the ban on CFCs in the 80s was the end of the CFC crisis. I won't even mention, oh, well, I will mention, that the hole in the ozone layer stopped growing before the CFC ban came in and is better explained by natural variability caused by variations in solar energy than by world killer spray cans. The UN, though, has spent half a billion dollars a year, half a billion dollars a year including our money, on the multilateral fund for the last 25 years for nothing. In true Yes Minister style, the multilateral fund has kept itself in line for taxpayer handouts by moving on to other substances that also have nothing to do with the ozone layer and are in general use in situations where they are very hard to replace, and that includes refrigeration. At this rate, refrigeration will be relegated to the footnote of history. This won't be a problem, Mr Acting Deputy President, because with the renewable power, everyday Australians won't be able to afford to run our refrigerators. Except perhaps for those UN development officials with a $2 million a year price tag. They should be kept, they should be keeping the moe nice and cold. Now let's turn to the Global Environment Facility Trust. Mr. Acting Deputy President, the Global Environment Facility Trust. I saved the best till last. The Global Environment Facility Trust was founded at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit to fund developing countries and countries with economies in transition to meet the objectives of the international environmental conventions and agreements. The $1.5 billion a year to keep the global climate warming con going to enable the UN parasites to continue sucking our blood through deceit and lies. I notice that our, general, our generous federal government has increased our contribution to the Global Environment Fund, Global Environment Facility, from $23.5 million just two years ago to $38 million last year. That's an increase of about 60 per cent in one year. So when the World Wildlife Fund is used as a source for global warming proof, remember they're funded by the Global Environment Fund. Funded, Mr Acting Deputy President, to keep the greatest scientific swindle in history alive. I'm going to discuss the bigger picture for a minute. And don't take my word for it. Mr Richard Court, the Premier at the time of Western Australia, a Liberal Premier, wrote Rebuilding the Federation. In this book, on page eight, he details the process that the internationalists used to usurp our sovereignty, take over our governance, and put in place UN regulations. And he deals with the UN or other unelected international body. Our constitution has been pushed aside, bypassed, by these criminals in the UN and other slick gangsters. And Mr Richard Court, remember, was the Liberal Premier. He details that. And he did so 26 years ago. I'll now read from UN Agenda 2021 uh, booklet, the opening page of the introduction. This came about at the UN Rio Declaration, UN, UN, UN Rio um, Convention in 1992, which Paul Keating's Labor government signed on our behalf. Quote, Agenda 21 stands as a comprehensive blueprint for action to be taken globally from now into the 21st century, Agenda 21, by governments, United Nations organisations, development agencies, non-governmental organisations and independent sector groups in every area in which human, human 
activity impacts on the environment in every area in which human activity impacts on the environment. That is every area of our civilization. The, quote, continuing the quote, the agenda should be studied in conjunction with both the Rio Declaration, which provides a context for its specific proposals. Specific proposals, that's where the nitty gritty is, and the statement of forest principles. It is hoped, it is hoped that the forest principles will form the basis for a future international level agreement. And that is how they put in place global governance, and that is how according to Richard Court, who is absolutely correct, that governance then takes over ours. We have the UN's Lima Declaration, signed in 1975 by the Whitlam Labor government, ratified the following year in 1976 by the Fraser, by the Fraser Liberal National Party government, destroyed our industry, deliberately made it clear that they were transferring it. By the way, the United States didn't sign it. Several major European countries didn't sign it, and I don't think Japan did. China did. It was a beneficiary. The UN's Rio Declaration in, in 1992 brought about the Agenda 21, which I've just discussed, which is now killing land use for all of our farmers. It's killing employment due to its so-called sustainability, and it's killing uh, governance through the climate change commitments, which are not commitments until they're legislated through here or bypassed through here. The UN's Kyoto Protocol in 1996, the UN's Paris Agreement, which is now decimating our industry and exporting jobs in, 19, in 2015. Red tape, strangling our country. Green tape, strangling our country. Blue tape, strangling our country. Blue tape is UN tape. Oh, where does UN tape work, blue tape work? Fishing industry. We now have 36 per cent of the world's marine parks in this country alone, 36 per cent, more than one third. Where do, we, where do we import our, we import now three quarters of our seafood from China. Sorry, three quarters of our seafood is imported. The greatest, biggest exporter is China, which has a tiny coastline and 50, 53 times the population. So the UN doesn't touch China but strangles our industry. And we're happily pushing jobs off overseas, closing down industry, fishing included. Oh, and it, we can't get permission to lift the dam level at Warragamba Dam because the UN doesn't like it. Oh, and World Heritage Sites. There's another way the UN, the UN controls us. And then we have the globalist mantra of interdependency. And that's what these bills push. Interdependency means we are dependent on another country. It means we are dependent, not independent anymore. Australia used to be number one in the world in terms of per capita income, and then we started shoving all of our jobs off, off, so, offshore, and now we are dependent on other nations. To speak nothing of the corruption that the UN has, nothing of the accountability that it doesn't have. As I said in my first speech in the Senate in, 19, in 2016, we need an Oz exit. Australia exit the UN. The best thing we can do for people in poor countries is to kill the UN, get back to accountability and create the business environment, not, a, not an environment for parasites. The best thing we can do for our country is to restore our sovereignty, restore our governance and restore our independence. We need to not fund entities like the UN and instead look after ourselves, make ourselves strong again so that we can help neighbours as they need. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Senator Pratt. No, uh, Senator Faruqi, I think, was next. Uh, aren't we? Uh, uh, I'm happy either way on the list. Oh, I great. Have... It's moved. It's not the, the uh, list that I had seen previously, so that's terrific. Thank you, uh, Mr. Senator Acting Pratt. Deputy President. Well, this afternoon, as we uh, rise to discuss this bill, uh, I want to reinforce the critical role that multilateral organisations play uh, right around the world uh, and the importance of Australia's commitment to those organisations. Uh, in the current context of uh, COVID-19, uh, the role of international cooperation and strong global institutions should not be underplayed or 
underestimated. Uh, it's pleasing to see here in this context that we make critical commitments to the multilateral initiatives such as the World Bank, uh, International Development Association, the Debt Relief Program, the De Asian Development Bank and the Development Fund, the Global Environment Facility Trust Fund and the Multilateral Fund for implementing the Mo Montreal Protocol. These are just some of the multilateral institutions that exist, some of them, of course, that are auspiced by um, the World Health Organization, uh, the UN and others that are put together through uh, other multilateral aid uh, things such as like the Global Vaccine Initiative, Gavi, and the Global Fund to End HIV, Tuberculosis and Malaria. Uh, it's really important to see that uh, global relationships are, much, are greatly enhanced through multilateral relationships rather than just nation to nation. So here we've got expenditure in the order of $350 million a year, uh, and the bill gives effect to those already budgeted commitments. But I really want to put on record that you know, this uh, comes in the context of a cut of some eight, uh, $11.8 billion to our international development assistance, which, and those cuts have taken place under the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments over the last few years. The Australian people think that we spend far more than we actually do on international aid. Some people think we literally spend some 10 per cent of our national budget on foreign aid, and we simply know that's not true. We have a globalised world, uh, and as we shut our borders because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we must remember that the health and safety of Australians is interwoven with the health and safety of other nations. International development aid is in our national interest. We can and we must do more to ensure that we live in a peaceful, stable region and that countries, particularly those nearby in our region, do not sink into instability and chaos. Drug-resistant tuberculosis coming in and out of Queensland, uh, you know, even in our very narrow, most selfish interests, it is in our interest to do more about uh, support for the countries in our north. Poverty, of course, is a cause of these things. Poor countries with cramped living conditions, inadequate health systems, people who are forced to work and as a result spread disease because they have no social safety net in these nations, and we've certainly seen examples of that here as well. These are critical issues and highlight why debt relief and development funds provided by this bill are so incredibly important. We don't want failed states on our doorstep. If you really want to take a hard line argument, foreign aid is cheaper than sending in the military. Under this government, international development assistance is on track to fall to just 0.19 per cent of gross national income, and that is a disgrace. As I said before, $11.8 billion cut from the foreign aid budget. We are now at a record low of GNI. And this is what our Prime Minister and this government are driving us towards. At the very time where we need to be more engaged in our region, we are cutting international development assistance. These commitments in our ODA program advance Australia's interests, project our values, but also tackle global poverty. With climate change, we see an increasing need for humanitarian and aid assistance rising with natural disasters. We need to not just lift our game on mitigation, and of course that's a discussion for another day, but invest more in resilience and adaptation. And these are some of the very things that are funded in the multilateral uh, organisations that we're discussing support for today. We have globally. Uh, as commentators have said, seen a deteriorating security environment uh, which is challenging for the world. 
We are also yet to see the full impact of COVID-19 on developing nations. It's a virus that will have been spread around the world in considerable part by holidaymakers, more wealthy people than the large demographics of the poor in the developing world, with health systems in the developing world that will be ill-equipped for this pandemic, who've had this disease brought to them. I want to pay special tribute to two organisations playing an important role in response to COVID. They are also multilateral agencies like those we are discussing today. The Global Fund, providing a billion dollars in operational flexibility to help countries fight COVID-19. It's shoring up health systems, mitigating impacts on life-saving HIV, TB, malaria programs. Its emergency funding is available through uh, its $500 million COVID response mechanism, and it's looked at how to make its funding more flexible uh, in order to adapt to the COVID crisis. I want to also give a special shout out to the Global Vaccine Initiative. Uh, and I have to say that WHO, the World Health Organisation, the Global Vaccine Initiative and the Global Fund have been predicting for some time uh, and highlighted indeed why these pandemics are now more likely, uh, highlighting for some time why we need to be more prepared. And I know uh, that uh, this government has attacked the World Health Organisation at a difficult time. But it's interesting because a lot of the international agencies have said uh, that uh, countries weren't as ready as we were told to be. You know, the triggers for a global pandemic are global travel, urbanisation, um, climate change also contributes to pandemics. It can affect the spread of disease in a number of ways. Uh, it can alter the natural range of disease-carrying insects like mosquitoes or bats. Uh, and so it's important to see that this, uh, multilateral, these multilateral bills that we are debating today uh, also include commitments for the Global Environment Facility Trust Fund and the Multilateral Fund. The Special Climate Change Fund, here it supports adaptation and technology transfer in developing countries, party to the U United Nations framework. Convention on Climate Change. And so this is about both the short and long term adaptation uh, goals and things that uh, very much support environmental management in developing nations. Uh, the Montreal Protocol, of course, is about substances that delete the ozone layer. International corpora cooperation has seen us take great steps in addressing depletion of the ozone layer, and it's really worth noting that uh, ozone layer depleting substances are also greenhouse gases that vastly accelerate climate change. Uh, as these world uh, multilateral organisations have also advised, uh, increased human-animal contact uh, is a driver for pandemics, health worker shortages, and they've highlighted in part that, that that is in part through migration where you see countries like Australia uh, pulling nurses and doctors out of developing nations uh, to offer them employment within their own country. Uh, and I would highlight this week that it is the International Day. Uh, we have had this week the International Day of the Nurse. And I want to pay tribute to nurses all around the world, but particularly those uh, working in challenging circumstances in, uh, around the world in developing nations. All of this shows how important global action is uh, to health. A COVID-19 vaccine, I've been very pleased to see again through multilateral type discussions where international communities come together, $352 million committed to the European-led uh, Coronavirus Vaccine Research Fund and how that money uh, will be spent uh, and coordinated internationally to accelerate uh, search, the search for a vaccine. 
you know, we can see those multilateral organisations through the World Health Organisation, through the Global Vaccine uh, Alliance, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, Innovations and pledges from many countries coming together to really make a strong commitment to finding a vaccine for COVID-19. All of this highlights very, very much why this kind of multilateral cooperation is so critical uh, for Australia's national interest, but for everyone around the world. $15 million from Australia is going on to uh, European research institutes, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, Order, the Doherty Senator Institute. Pratt, time for in date to be interrupted. Questions? Time. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. ABS Labor Force figures released today show that 2.7 million Australian workers either lost their job or had less work in April, one out of every five Australian workers. These are truly devastating figures and indicate just how difficult the past few weeks have been for millions of Australians and their families. Minister, 600,000 people have lost their job in the past month, the largest fall ever recorded. In light of these confronting numbers, is the government prepared to reconsider the eligibility criteria for JobKeeper so that more people can remain in employment? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Let me first, uh, of course, recognise these are devastating uh, figures. Um, they're not entirely unanticipated, but they are uh, devastating. Uh, and uh, the, that is, of course, why the government has put a very um, significant uh, support measures in place uh, to keep as many Australians connected uh, to their employer uh, as possible during this period. And about six million uh, Australians are now benefiting from the support provided uh, through JobKeeper. And indeed, 1.6 million uh, Australians are receiving uh, the enhanced uh, support through the enhanced job seeker. Uh, arrangements. Uh, uh, Mr uh, uh, President, as a result of the measures that we have taken, while these numbers are devastating, of course they are, uh, the Australian position and the position for uh, working families around Australia is much better than it is um, in many other parts of the world where the health effect has been more devastating and where the economic impact of the coronavirus has been more devastating. I know that that is called comfort to those who are facing uh, difficulties uh, through this period. We, we absolutely understand that. But we are doing the best we can, and I mean, the JobKeeper program uh, has been designed in a very, very generous way in order to support uh, six million Australians who are now taking advantage of the opportunities through that program. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. So I take it you won't reconsider. Today's figures show that underemployment rose to a record rate of 13.7 per cent, with over 1.8 million Australians being underemployed and almost half a million, oh, 500,000 left the labour force altogether. What would the un unemployment rate be if nearly half a million Australians hadn't simply given up looking for work entirely? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I, I think that in the circumstances it is not uh, surprising that uh, workforce participation, the workforce participation rate has decreased. I mean, it was at a record high or close to a record high at 66 per cent in March, and it has reduced to 63.5 per cent, which is still, which is still rather high in the circumstances. Now, um, as Treasury has indicated, the expectation is uh, for uh, unemployment to uh, continue to rise uh, through to the June quarter to about 10 per cent. If we had not provided the supports that we have provided through the JobKeeper package, you know, in particular, and other measures, uh, unemployment was expected to rise to 15 per cent, which is where it is at in many other jurisdictions. And in many other jurisdictions, it is 15 per cent and higher, uh, up to more than 20 per cent uh, in, in, in some cases. So uh, yes, I mean, nobody will be surprised that this is a difficult period. We all know that. We're, we're dealing with a major global health pandemic, uh, and we're doing the best we can to help the Australian community through it. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Isn't it the case that if the government had acted sooner and provided JobKeeper for more Australians, such as the 1.1 million casuals who have been with their employers for less than 12 months, these figures wouldn't be as devastating as they are today? Could the government have acted to protect more jobs? 
Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, 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 think, I think that that is an unreasonable uh, proposition. It's an unreasonable proposition. I mean, we, we, are, we are dealing with an unbelievably hard hitting global uh, health pandemic with devastating impacts Order. all around the world. Uh, in Australia, by any measure, by any objective measure, and look, I wouldn't expect the opposition to be objective, but, but you know, we can understand why the uh, opposition uh, is throwing rocks at those that are making the decisions. I, I understand that that is sort of the, the way that you go about these things. But the truth is, in dealing with this, we have been, we're winning the fight against the virus. We're putting ourselves in a position where we can start easing restrictions and start getting the economy growing again so that businesses around Australia can start hiring people uh, again and so that Australians can again be in a position to build uh, sustainable uh, livelihoods and lift their living standards. And, 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 here, and here you are continuing to uh, nitpick in a partisan fashion. It's rather disappointing. Order. Order. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. Order President. On my left. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Australian labour force figures for the month of April? Further, what steps is the Liberal National Coalition government taking to contain the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic on employment? Order. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz for the question. And, uh, Mr. President, as the Prime Minister said in his uh, address to the nation today, this is a very tough day for so many Australians and uh, some very difficult news for all of us. Uh, as the Minister for Finance has said, though, COVID 19 is a health and economic shock, uh, the likes of which not just Australia, but the world has never seen. And the government knew that the impact of COVID-19 on the economy would result in job losses. Today's jobs figures saw the number of jobs decrease by 594,300 in the month of April. We went from record employment in Australia of 13 million Australians in March to 12.4 million due to the impact of COVID-19. As a result, what we've seen today is the unemployment rate rise to 6.2 per cent. We also saw the participation rate, which was at near records high again in March, of 66 per cent, fall to 63.5 per cent. Again, as the Prime Minister said, those Australians who have lost their jobs, they're our fellow Australians, they're our family members, they're our friends and they're our neighbours. Mr President, though, given that significant parts of the Australian economy are still in lockdown, they're subject to those COVID-19 restrictions, today's figures are not surprising, but they clearly do show the difficult situation being faced by so many Australians. Today's unemployment figures would have been far higher, though, if the government hadn't introduced Senator Abetz its $130 billion JobKeeper program which the Prime Minister also announced today now covers six million workers. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr President. What action has the government taken to help secure the employment opportunities of our fellow Australians? Senator what? Sorry, Senator Cash. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Yeah, sorry. That's what I was look, what? My error, I was looking down the question time sheet. Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. My apologies. And as the parliament would be aware, the government has put in place $320 billion in economic support measures to get through and past the COVID-19 crisis. And this, of course, includes the JobKeeper payment, um, which now covers around 6 million Australians. The expansion of the job seeker payment, access to superannuation, and of course direct financial support to families. Mr. President, when we look at Australia's investment in terms of a percentage of GDP, our investment, our investment is at the top of the leaderboard globally, showing that we are as prepared as we can be 
in terms of other countries. Again, as I said, as the Prime Minister has confirmed today, the $130 billion JobKeeper payment now supports over 6 million employees staying connected to their employer. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you for that answer, Minister. Turning to the long term, what plans will the government implement to restore our economic fortunes, support small business, the engine room of jobs growth, and most importantly, get Australians back into employment? Senator Cash. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And the ability for the government to respond in the way that it has with the $320 billion uh, support measures really has reminded Australians of the importance of a strong and stable financial position. The path to recovery is by growing the economy. As the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance himself has said, through productivity enhancing reforms and, of course, supporting small and family businesses. Um, the focus of our recovery, Senator Abetz, will be on practical solutions, including reskilling and upskilling the workforce, maintaining uh, our $100 billion 10 year infrastructure pipeline, uh, infrastructure jobs. Um, you know, infrastructure does create jobs. But of course, that important cutting red tape um, to reduce the cost burden on businesses and on the economy. There is a long road ahead. Uh, and there'll be no doubt Thank there'll be you. further challenges, Order. but we are Senator prepared Cash. to Order. face them. My apologies again. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. This week, the Prime Minister described his government's bushfire recovery work as sensational and tremendous. <laughs> Troy Pauling of Yowri, who is still living with his family in a caravan and shed, near the uncleared ruins of their burnt-down home, says, and I quote, the kids cry. They don't want to be here. If we got this cleared, we'd have the ball rolling, but it's just way too slow. What does the Prime Minister have to say to Mr Pauling? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, uh, you know, clearly the bushfire crisis was devastating for the uh, impacted uh, communities and continues to be devastating. Uh, there's no question. But uh, the Australian government, working with relevant state governments, is doing everything we can to provide appropriate levels of support. And I mean, over $271 million were paid directly to families and individuals in direct support. Over $237 million paid to more than 195,000 eligible individuals in disaster recovery payment and disaster recovery uh, allowance as of uh, 3rd in May. Over $33 million in payments made for over 3,000 impacted children. Uh, and there are, there are many other things that were done, but like nothing, nothing that I can say. And I mean, you know, Senator Watt is not asking this question out of genuine and sincere concern. He's asking this question to my- Order. Senator, I've got Senator Wong. That is a clear imputation. I'd ask that it be withdrawn. For, I'll, for, the, for the operation of question time, I'll, I'll ask uh, for the operation of question time. I'll ask Senator Cormann I to withdraw. withdraw. I withdraw. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. No, Thank you, but, Senator but let, let me let me just make this point: uh, none, no, no, no amount of politicking in this chamber will help. The, no amount of politicking in this chamber will help uh, those uh, families that are continuing to be severely impacted by the uh, effects of the bushfires. No amount of politicking will help them. We are doing everything we can. We are working as hard as we can, bearing in mind that many of the lead responsibilities for uh, these matters are at the state <laughs> level. But we are doing everything we can, and we are providing financial support as fast as we can. Uh, and, you know, of course, we have set up the uh, Bushfire uh, Recovery Agency. We, are, uh, work, we have put in place the Bushfire Recovery Fund, and we are providing uh, support, uh, supports, working together with the uh, relevant state governments uh, as fast and as effectively as possible. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This week, the Prime Minister said the government's bushfire recovery work is being done methodically and steadily, and Australians are seeing that in action. What does the Prime Minister say to Mr Jim Neal of Cabago, who is still living in a donated caravan that leaks sewerage on the dirt patch that used to be his home? Senator Cormann. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I say the same as what I said in response to the primary answer. You know, of, of course, there are still continuing 
uh, devastating impacts from the bushfire crisis. I mean, that is uh, practically unavoidable. Uh, but, but we are working our way through these things in a way that is uh, methodical and, and, and we are going through it as fast as we can. Uh, and we have provided significant levels of support and, and more support will be uh, provided over the coming weeks and months. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Figures released by the government just this week showed that five months on from the height of the bushfires, less than $260 million of the Prime Minister's $2 billion bushfire recovery fund has actually been spent. To quote a hand-painted painted sign in Bega, $2 billion bushfire fund, where is it? Why is the Prime Minister more concerned with marketing and spin than with actually helping bushfire victims? Order. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Senator Watt is not going to help those uh, communities through, with, through his political spin. Uh, through his political spin, because we put in place a $2 billion fund which came on top of all of the uh, disaster recovery support that was provided into the community. We put in, a two billion, we put in place a $2 billion fund over two calendar years for, two, for the bushfire recovery. I mean, there was the immediate disaster uh, response, and, and I've gone through a number. And, you know, when I went through the numbers of expenditures on that, uh, all I was uh, told was, why are you just giving us numbers? Uh, well, I say it again, $271 million paid to families and individuals over $237 million paid to more than 193,000 eligible individuals in disaster recovery payment and disaster recovery allowance. And by the end of June, we will have spent about $1 billion out of the $2 billion fund. In the first six months, in the first six months of a two-year program, we will have spent about half. Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Minister, are you confident that the COVID Commission is free of conflicts of interest when it comes to proposals on energy investments? Isn't it true that donations from the fossil fuel industry to the major parties have more than doubled in the last four years, that the Commission is jam-packed full of fossil fuel boosters, that there are no binding rules to address conflicts of interest, and that advice from the Commission to government will be kept secret? Where is the transparency? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. I say, uh, what I say what I said yesterday, I say again today. Uh, the uh, COVID Coordination Commission is made up of uh, a number of distinguished Australians uh, and a number of distinguished Australians who know how to manage conflicts, and I have every confidence that they will uh, continue to manage conflicts as appropriate. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Given your government's spruiking of toxic methane gas and your COVID Commission's obvious bias, are we at risk of a gas rush that will fuel the climate crisis and put Australians at risk? Why are you willing to listen to the health experts on the COVID crisis, but not to the climate experts on the climate emergency? Senator Cormann. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I I'm sort of trying to find a way to translate that question. At least there was a question mark at the end, I think. But um, if, if you're asking me whether I hope that we will boost the exploration and production of gas so that our uh, businesses around Australia, in particular manufacturing businesses around Australia, can have reliable access to uh, more affordable and more competitively priced supplies of gas, then the answer is a resounding yes, of course. Uh, I, hope, I hope that will be the case. And if the uh, COVID Coordination Commission can help to bring that about, that would be good for the economy. It would be good for working families around Australia because it will help us to be uh, more successful in competing with uh, uh, exporting uh, businesses from other parts of the world. But, but I, hope, I hope that that is the way, uh, I hope that that is what you are asking and that I've answered uh, the right question. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. Last night the government was forced into an embarrassing clarification that the chair of the COVID committee is being paid not half a million dollars for six months, but a quarter of a million dollars. Is the government embarrassed that it is paying these obscenely high amounts to an unelected body stacked with fossil fuel mates, while it excludes half a million young people from JobKeeper and it is intending to drop, drop JobSeeker back below the poverty line in September? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Firstly, let me correct uh, Senator Waters. Uh, the chair of the COVID Commission is not uh, getting a salary not getting a salary. Following the announcement of the NCC, following the announcement of the National COVID Coordination Commission, the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet 
undertook work to establish an arrangement to cover the assessed likely expenses of the chair and a suitable per diem for the commissioners. Uh, neither the Prime Minister nor his office was involved in the establishment of these arrangements and, and of course, uh, as you have indicated, the Department has provided uh, a further statement following uh, the um, Senate committee hearing that you reference. Um, you know, Mr. Powers, flights, accommodation, other incidental travel costs are being covered uh, in his role as uh, NCC chair. However, he's not receiving a salary. And in developing and executing Mr. Powers' contract, the uh, uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet has estimated travel to and from Canberra. And, you know, he does come from Perth. And, you know, we are a, a, a big continent. And uh, people from Western Australia Order, should also Senator be allowed Coleman. to Time participate in these sorts of processes. Expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate uh, rep representing the Prime Minister. Is it not the case that during the course of January the Prime Minister received at least five purportedly secret briefings from his department on the coronavirus outbreak? Is it not the case that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet has refused to release any of those five briefings? Is it not the case that un uh, access under FOI has been totally refused? Not one word has been released. Given the government's de uh, declaration to be completely transparent with the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 and with the Australian public, will the Leader of the Government in the Senate consult with the Prime Minister and seek the prompt release of the briefings to better inform the investigation of the Select Committee? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr President. It won't surprise Senator Patrick to hear me say that uh, in relation to the specific uh, items he's raised, uh, I will have to take that part on notice, uh, as I uh, am not personally aware of all of the uh, you know, details that he uh, has uh, read out. Um, in terms of the general point, I would uh, put it to Senator Patrick that this government is being uh, uh, entirely open and transparent uh, to the uh, COVID uh, committee, the Senate Select Committee to the COVID response by the government, in, in a way that is consistent with the usual rules, conventions and processes and standards applied by previous governments. And certain matters, certain matters are uh, uh, exempt from disclosure, for example, you know, things relating to the deliberative processes of uh, cabinet, uh, and, but subject, subject to those uh, qualifications, uh, of course, um, I'll, I'll take on notice uh, what uh, Senator Patrick has asked about, and uh, I'll return to the chamber when I can. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has delayed FOI decisions on the release of DFAT cables sent from our embassy in Beijing in January reporting on the COVID-19 outbreak in China. It's also the case that the Health Department has moved to obstruct FOI releases of the initial coronavirus modelling and assessments received by the government on the 13th of February and the 3rd of March. Given the public interest in fully understanding these events, um, where, will you take on uh, representing to the relevant Order, ministers Senator the release Patrick, of that information. The question has expired. Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Again, I don't think it will surprise Senator Patrick to hear me say that in terms of the specifics, uh, I, um, I uh, will take that on notice. I'm not aware of uh, the specific uh, FOI requests he raises. Uh, the Senator Patrick would also be aware that there are uh, laws that uh, uh, guide uh, and uh, that, that uh, provide for how this um, matters are to be handled and there are appropriate review processes in place, of course, that I, I know uh, for a fact that he extensively takes advantage of these uh, processes and opportunities that are available to him, uh, but uh, I, I will take the uh, specifics of that question on notice. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, th thank you, Mr President. The government has rightly called on China to be more transparent about the origins of the COVID-19 outbreak. The government also wants uh, the World Health Organization's performance to be scrutinised. Wouldn't these calls to, on China and the World Health Organization be much stronger and, and much less exposed to the charge of hypocrisy if the government itself implemented full transparency about its own response to the pandemic? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, again, I mean, our government uh, is... Uh, uh, and highly open and transparent, uh, you know, as appropriate, uh, bearing in mind uh, national uh, interest and relevant national interest and legal considerations, uh, in the same way as uh, governments of both uh, political persuasions have done in the past. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the minister advise of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on women? 
the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I particularly thank Senator Stoker for her question. Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the lives of women and men differently, uh, and today's job figures do reinforce this. Of the jobs lost in the month to the 20th of April, 55 per cent of those had been held by women. And that reflects the fact that uh, many uh, less secure jobs are held by women, and women are overrepresented in occupations strongly affected by some of our very necessary physical distancing measures. I note that women's workforce participation has also fallen by 2.9 percentage points uh, to 58.4 per cent. Mr. President, the demand for unpaid care work, which we know disproportionately affects women's ability to undertake paid employment, has risen, with children needing homeschooling uh, and with the increased care needs of elderly Australians uh, as well. However, as a government, we are very aware that women will be vital to the economic recovery. Australia needs everyone's full capabilities, both men and women, to ensure that recovery. That's why, the government has, uh, that's why the government's introduction of the JobKeeper payment to help keep Australians employed is so important, as the Minister for Finance has reinforced uh, today, and particularly in ensuring women in seriously affected industries are supported uh, through the pandemic. It's also why we ensured that uh, free early childhood education and care for about a million families, no matter what type of service uh, they use, was available uh, in the pandemic. As the Treasurer said earlier this week, Mr. President, I would remind the Chamber, we know a strong economy is the foundation for everything else, and women will be particularly critical to ensuring that our economy remains strong as we emerge from this pandemic. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the risk of family and domestic violence and advise of what the government is doing to address that risk? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Senator Stoker asks a very serious question because we know that major crisis events have historically led to an increased incidence of violence against women. Uh, as senators would be aware, the government has announced, uh, Mr. Rustin and I, a $150 million uh, support for the COVID-19 domestic violence support package, funding that will help states and territories to meet immediate needs for crisis accommodation, frontline services, and perpetrator intervention programs. And we've seen a number of those uh, rolled out and announced by the states and territories in that context, uh, Mr. President. To ensure that Australians know where to turn for support, uh, we have also launched the Help Is Here campaign, which provides that clear information on how Australians are able to access services at any time of the day or night. Uh, there are indicators of a greater need for services, most certainly. 1800 Respect has seen an increase in, in calls, particularly after midnight. The No to Violence Men's Referral Service experienced a very significant increase in demand Order, after Payne. those community restrictions Time were announced. The answer has expired. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of what Australia is doing internationally to help women and girls through the coronavirus pandemic? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. It is fair to say that the particular impacts of COVID-19 on women are, of course, not confined to Australia. Uh, I've had a number of valuable discussions with women foreign and women's ministers uh, around the world, across many countries, about how uh, the importance about the importance of ensuring that gender inequalities aren't exacerbated or entrenched by COVID-19. And these conversations are ongoing. Australia has also. Uh, joined a number of strong international statements and resolutions that help to increase the focus uh, in international bodies and conversations on promoting gender responsiveness to the pandemic. In our region, the Australian Pacific Women's Partnership is supporting crisis centres that are providing remote counselling and frontline services for vulnerable women. And through our NABALAN program, we're working to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in women's shelters in Timor-Leste in particular. With international partners such as UN Women, we're adapting and boosting our efforts to address the impact of the pandemic on women in the Indo-Pacific region. Senator Payne. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. The only advice Minister Cormann could offer Darcy Moran, a hospitality worker suffering as a result of the Morrison government's refusal to include him and workers like him in JobKeeper, was, and I quote, what we think would be fair to Darcy is if the state government in Victoria started easing restrictions. Was Minister Cormann's advice 
which is contrary to the decision of the National Cabinet last Friday that states set out their own timetables, informed by health advice provided by the Minister for Health or his office. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr President, and I uh, thank Senator Kitching for the question, but Senator Kitching, I actually disagree with the premise of what you're putting. Uh, Senator Cormann was, of course, right to say that people who are currently unemployed uh, will have more success in obtaining a job as each individual state and territory eases its COVID restrictions. That is the point that Senator Cormann was actually making. And can I just say, if you actually look at, and this is just it, as Senator Cormann has so rightly said, um, we have a Labor Premier in Ma and Mark McGowan in Western Australia. We are moving, Senator Cormann, if I understand, to stage two, to stage two, to 20 people as of Monday. That has been widely welcomed in Western Order. Australia, but in particular by the hospitality industry, Order. who know they are a step ahead of those states and territories that have not yet moved to 20 people. You look at what's happening in the Northern Territory and how that has been welcomed uh, by people in the Northern Territory. So, Senator Cormann was right. Someone in that case, a person who does not have a job, has more of a chance of getting a job the quicker that individual states open up their economies. That is what Senator Order. Cormann was saying. Order. Order. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Was Minister Cormann relying on advice provided by the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee or other relevant public health agencies? Or does the minister support Minister Cormann undermining the decisions of the National Cabinet and the protections put in place by the Victorian government on advice from its, health, its public health authorities? Senator Cash. Well, again, I have to completely reject the premise of the question um, because that is not the advice that was given. If a person does not have a job at this particular point in time, and that is a very, very sobering state for any person, they will. It will be easier for them to get a job as we see the COVID-19 restrictions in individual states and territories eased. Senator Cormann also said, though, and this is absolutely based on the health advice, those restrictions need to be eased and businesses need to open in a COVID-safe way. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Order. Order. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. Does Minister Cormann's outburst against the Victorian government reflect the Morrison government's position, or will he also be forced to issue a statement to withdraw, like Minister Tian did only hours after his outburst on insiders? Senator Cash. Uh, well, can I say, Mr. President, based on outbursts that I have seen from people in this chamber, there was no outburst by Senator Cormann yesterday. Order. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister outline what the Morrison Coalition government is doing to support young Australians as they face the mental health challenges of the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Smith for his question. Mr. President, we know that a significant number of young Australians are experiencing the mental health impacts of coronavirus, and last week. Mental health organisation Reach Out revealed the, uh, the, that the um, unprecedented numbers of young people have sought mental health support during the COVID-19 pandemic so far, with services increasing by 50 per cent since this time last year. Mr. President, our government is determined to ensure that mental health support is available and accessible for every young Australian in Australia, and we know that mental health doesn't discriminate. The message I want all Australians to hear, particularly young Australians is that support and help is available. That's why on the 29th of March the Prime Minister announced a $1.1 billion package that included a boost to mental health services including uh, during COVID-19, $10 million towards a dedicated coronavirus wellbeing support line delivered by Beyond Blue, which commenced on the 6th of April, $6.8 million to help young Australians with their education and training and prepare them for the workforce by expanding the Headspace Digital Work and Study Service to provide employment study support. Uh, funding to enhance the Find a Psychologist website 
to help all Australians, fund, uh, including our youth, to better locate psychologists and telehealth services available to them. Mr. President, in addition, yesterday Minister Hunt announced a new Deputy Health Commissioner, solely dedicated to mental health. This exemplifies our government's strong support and commitment to tackle mental, the issue of mental health in this country. Earlier in the year, we also announced $76 million in mental health uh, to support packages to support Australians affected by the bushfires, and we continue to support young Australians as they go through these challenges. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm sure everyone in the Senate chamber will acknowledge the great work that Reach Out does do, as do other mental health service providers. Uh, Minister, what support is the government providing directly to young Australians during these challenging times? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as we've heard uh, during this question time today and earlier, as the unemployment figures have been released, the very sobering job figures that we um, are experiencing as we go move through the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and in the youth sense, it's up from 11.6 per cent to 13.8. That is why the government has moved to temporarily, uh, temporarily expand the eligibility to income support payments and has establish a new time-limited coronavirus supplement. This will be paid to both existing and new recipients of income support programs, including Job Seeker Payment, Youth Allowance Job Seeker, amongst others. Many of these payments will be primarily directed towards young Australians. JobKeeper, the JobKeeper payments currently supporting almost 5.5 million employees to stay connected to their employer. And as of last week, we are supporting almost 13,000 employers to retain 22,000 young apprentices through a wage subsidy. Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Thank you, very, Mr. President. Minister, what more can young Australians be doing to assist in flattening of the curve and combating this pandemic? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank Senator Smith. And can I firstly thank all young Australians for their efforts so far in working with health authorities, with state governments and the, the Australian government in their efforts to date to flatten the curve. Our actions have slowed the spread of co co coronavirus and made a huge impact on our capacity to start bringing the economy back. But can I encourage all young Australians to download the COVID Safe app? It's it's our capacity to track, our capacity to trace and our capacity to test that will all help to uh, assist state governments and the Australian government to open the economy back up, provide opportunities for jobs and assist all young Australians to return to the things that they love, whether that be sport, whether it be arts, whether it be music. Mr. President, so can I just urge all young Australians uh, to join the rest of us that have downloaded the COVID Safe, Safe app Order. to assist Senator with Colbeck. our jobs. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. I refer to reports in the Australian Financial Review that the superannuation accounts of close to 100,000 Australians have been emptied of their retirement savings as a result of the Morrison government's early access scheme emptied. The Australian Financial Review reports that these accounts are most likely those of younger Australians. Can the minister explain what the long-term impact of reduced retirement savings and foregone earnings as a result of the government program will be for the retirement income of those Australians? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Well, I mean, the first answer that I would provide is that these Australians are accessing their own money under a range that we put in place. Uh, the average withdrawal uh, is about uh, $8,000, and, and it is individual Australians, including young Australians, exercising their judgment, their own personal judgment, on how to deal in their circumstances with the implications on them of this one in a hundred year event. One in a hundred year event. And, and Senator, Senator, order, the Senator, order. Senator Cormann, Senator correctly. Ayres on a point of order. A po point of order, Mr. President. On relevance, the question was very straightforward. What is the impact on those 100,000 Australians' retirement incomes? Um, that was the conclusion of your question. The minister can be directly relevant while directly addressing the subject matter of any part of the question, including the preamble. 
I, I, I'm listening carefully, but I think, with respect, the minister is being directly relevant in direct being to the question and the preamble. Senator uh, Foreman. Senator, uh, Mr. President, I can't remember an occasion where I would have been more directly relevant to a question than this occasion, <laughs> uh, Mr. President. So that was a rather, that was a rather, that was a rather, I, I'm always directly relevant, of course, but I can't remember an occasion when I was more directly relevant than on this occasion. So that was a rather spurious point of order. But like, so just to come to the second part of the question, uh, and as uh, the uh, good senator, uh, of course, uh, did acknowledge, I mean, these are younger Australians, younger Australians, and younger Australians will be in the workforce longer, uh, and they will have the opportunity to catch up in terms of their retirement savings, which is a very important point. But right now, they are able to use their own money through a system that we put in place to deal with uh, an unprecedented challenge in their personal circumstances, and Australians overwhelmingly have embraced this opportunity. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that, months after the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic, the largest single financial support to Australians in need has been the $11 billion that struggling Australians have been forced to raid from their personal retirement savings? Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, no, um, no um, Mr President, I cannot confirm that. I mean, $130 billion, $130 billion in JobKeeper, for starters. $130 billion in JobKeeper. And, and of course, Order. And of course uh, he, uh, Senator Watt seems to suggest that we should put it all out in one go. That is what Senator Watt seems to suggest. Let's just put $130 billion out in one go. Bang. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, a, a lot of... A lot of support has gone out. A lot of support has gone out. We've put the details of that on the public record. I'm prepared on notice to provide a, 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 an updated, detailed account of all of the support that has gone into the community. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Order. Why has the government forced up to 100,000 Australians to raid their retirement savings instead of providing Australians with timely and adequate support during this crisis? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. We have not forced any Australian to do anything. We have empowered, we have empowered individual Australians to make their own decisions. To make their own decisions. Like uh, it is up to them. They are using their own money. They're exercising their own free judgment. And it is it is, a, it is an important measure to left. complement the very significant support that we have put in place through a doubling, effective doubling of job seeker support and of course a hundred and thirty billion dollar job keeper program providing support to six million Australians. Quite frankly, that question is completely out of touch. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister outline how Defence is using its defence cooperation programs to support international partners to respond to the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Scar, for that question. Uh, I am very proud that this government is committed to supporting all our friends and security partners with their responses to COVID-19. Our ADF and also our defence personnel have been working side by side with their Pacific uh, counterparts as we address this global pandemic together. I've pivoted and stepped up our defence cooperation programs across the region to meet the changing security needs of our partners. I remain in very close contact with my international counterparts to coordinate our own responses to COVID-19 and also to deal with the geostrategic challenges that this pandemic is only serving to intensify. Defence has rolled out very successful online training packages to prepare our own ADF personnel to conduct medical support tasks. We've already pivoted and provided this training package to 19 friends and neighbours and it's been translated already into Bahasa and to into Vietnamese, with some more to follow. In the Pacific, I've redirected $18 million worth of defence funding to help address immediate health, economic and security impacts of COVID-19 in the region. We're leveraging an existing contract for aerial surveillance under the Pacific Security Maritime Program to support the movements of supplies through the Pacific and also to Timor-Leste in the humanitarian corridor, so ably led by our foreign minister. In Papua New Guinea, we have 40 ADF members working alongside their PNG counterparts, providing technical advice, specialist equipment and also training. Our defence advisers, also across the region, are supporting a range of tasks, including strategic maritime and airlift, 
to support the PNG Defence Force operations and the refurbishment of critical infrastructure and capabilities. We all, again, should be very proud of our ADF and their support to our region. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can the minister inform the Senate what support defence has provided to Pacific Island countries, specifically in response to tropical cyclone Harold? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you. Uh, tropical cyclone Harold was indeed devastating to a number of nations in our immediate region. And Australia's defence forces, like they so often do, are playing an important role to assist our Pacific family respond to Tropical Cyclone Harold. Just as their own troops stood side by side with our ADF during our own Black Summer. It's this mateship and also our solidarity, both in the good times and the bad times, that makes our region so strong. The Morrison government remains resolutely support, committed to strengthening Australia's long-standing relationships in the Pacific through ADF assistance in support of our friends and our neighbours. To date, the Royal Australian Air Force has conducted three emergency flight relief support flights to Vanuatu and another four to Fiji. These flights have delivered tonnes of life-saving supplies and assistance including shelter kits and tents, Order. utensils, Senator Reynolds, blankets, time slabs and water has containers. Expired. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline why our defence partnerships in the South Pacific are of such high importance to Australia? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. There has never been a more important time for Australia to stand side by side with our near neighbours. Together, we are tackling the scourge of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we continue to address COVID-19 at home, uh, we are standing by our region in assisting them manage shared health, secur health security and the economic impacts of COVID-19. Being there for each other in challenging and uncertain times goes to the heart of our Pacific step up. Australia's COVID-19 response builds on the Morrison government's Pacific step up, which continues to grow regional economies which continues to build resilience and continues to enhance regional stability through our defence, policing and our border security cooperation. The Pacific is our home, and Australia's engagement in the Pacific remains one of our highest priorities in these challenging times. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When did the Chief Medical Officer first brief the Cabinet in relation to COVID-19? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong for that uh, question. I believe it's a matter of uh, public record that the uh, National Incident Room was activated on 20 January, and the first briefing would have happened some time before that. I don't, I'm, can't recall or can't recollect a specific date. I'm happy to take that part of the uh, question uh, on uh, notice, but uh, I think that we've been uh, entirely uh, open and transparent along the way, and the Prime Minister has taken the Australian people into his confidence uh, every step of the way, and it was a rapidly evolving situation. Uh, we were one of the first uh, countries in the world uh, to put in place border uh, restrictions, uh, effective from 1 February uh, in terms of any non-Australian return travel from mainland China. We were one of the first, uh, I believe, uh, to declare uh, this as a, uh, as a, as a pandemic. Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of the specific question that was asked, as I've indicated, it would have been some time before the uh, activation of the National Incident Room, which has been publicly announced as having happened on 20 January. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, when Labor moved to establish the COVID-19 Select Committee, the minister told the Senate, and I quote, we welcome the scrutiny. We do believe there is a need for scrutiny, and we understand and appreciate that. The Prime Minister's own department has now on two occasions refused to answer the question, when the, did the Chief Medical <laughs> Officer first brief the Cabinet in relation to COVID-19? Given that question includes neither content about deliberations nor anything else Cabinet in confidence, can the minister please provide the answer as to the date? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, let, let me just say up front that I absolutely stand by the uh, statement uh, that I made. I wasn't uh, you know, obviously at the uh, hearing that Senator Wong uh, references. I've already, uh, under, I've already taken uh, that part of the question uh, on notice, and I'll get back to the chamber when I can. Senator Wong. 
Thank you, Mr. President. This is a once-in-a-century pandemic. It has unprecedented health and economic impacts on the nation. Australians deserve to know how the government responded to the threat of this pandemic. Can the minister explain why the Prime Minister's own department has refused to answer this simple and factual question? What are they seeking to hide? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. President. I reject uh, the uh, premise of the question. We're not seeking uh, to hide anything. I've already, I mean, clearly, I think Senator Wong completely ignores the answers that I've given to the first uh, two questions, including uh, that I undertook to attack that part of the question on notice. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is investing in hydrogen as part of Australia's energy future? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Macdonald for her question. And, uh, I know that she prides uh, um, Australia's reputation uh, as a long-standing, reliable supplier of energy, uh, not just for our country but to the world, uh, and, like all on this side, is committed to ensure that Australia continues to be that successful supplier of energy to the world. That's why the Morrison government is committed to delivering affordable and reliable electricity to the Australian people uh, and, indeed, to the rest of the world. And hydrogen, we recognise, has the potential to be an important part of our future energy mix and a large new potential export industry for Australia. We have worked uh, under the leadership of the chief scientist and in cooperation with all states and territories on the landmark national hydrogen strategy. The strategy will see governments and industry realise Australia's potential, building on our ability and our comparative advantage in the potential production <laughs> of hydrogen. Our government has backed hydrogen production and to the tune of over half a billion dollars. This includes over $150 million committed to research, pilots, trials and demonstrations, $70 million in funding for electrolysis-related projects, and now adding some $300 million for the new Advancing Hydrogen Fund. This new fund will finance projects focused on growing a clean, innovative and competitive hydrogen industry in Australia. It is the government's first financing fund dedicated specifically to hydrogen projects. The fund will back projects that align with priorities under the National Hydrogen Strategy in areas such as advancing hydrogen production, developing export and domestic supply chains, establishing hydrogen hubs and backing projects that build domestic demand for hydrogen. The government has also set critically an economic goal for hydrogen to be produced at or less than $2 per kilogram. At this price, hydrogen starts to compete with alternatives in large-scale energy deployment across our energy system and becomes a commercial opportunity in its own right, which is absolutely Order. a catalyst Senator point Birmingham. the Australian government Senator is Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate of the export opportunities this offers Australia? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our country prides ourselves on being a long-term, reliable and affordable supplier of energy, not just within Australia but critically across the region and the world. And the hydrogen industry, like those that have come before it, such as LNG at this point in time, has the ability to make a tremendous positive impact both here at home and in its contribution overseas. From cheaper energy bills and job creation in regional Australia to playing a role in reducing global emissions both at home and in countries that would buy Australian-produced hydrogen. As part of the National Hydrogen Strategy, we are aiming to build Australia's hydrogen industry into a global export industry by 2030. Australia is uniquely placed to develop a thriving clean hydrogen market over the coming decades, similar to the scale of the LNG industry. Hydrogen technologies have the capacity to meet the needs of Japan and the Republic of Korea who have made ambitious hydrogen commitments and signalled that they will be important, significant importers Order, of Senator hydrogen Birmingham. from Time 2030. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate how the government is focused on the development of new technologies like hydrogen? Senator Birmingham. Well, our Australian hydrogen strategy indicates that the industry could generate more than 8,000 jobs, many in regional Australia, uh, and generate over $11 billion a year in GDP by 2050. That's why we're working with industry researchers and international partners who are willing to invest and work towards the delivery of the roadmap. We're also supporting innovative projects across the nation, including in Queensland, I'm pleased to say, Senator Macdonald. Just last week, we announced $1.1 million in funding to build a modular demonstration plant Senator at Wish Wilson, um, on a point of order. 
Water President, the minister so far hasn't mentioned whether it's hydrogen from renewable well, energy order. or Senator from Wish fossil Wilson, fuels. It's Thursday afternoon, but that's not even close. Senator Birmingham, to continue. Mr. President, as I was saying, uh, I'm pleased for Senator Macdonald and Queensland senators to highlight. Just last week, we announced $1.1 million in funding to build a modular demonstration plant at Wallumbilla. The plant will produce around 620 kilograms of hydrogen per year, which will be converted into 74 gigajoules of renewable methane. We've also invested $1.25 million in a feasibility study for a renewable hydrogen demonstration project at Stanwell Power Station in Rockhampton. This type of innovative work is exactly what we Order. need to see our Senator domestic Birmingham. hydrogen industry grow. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Cormann. It was revealed in corrected evidence to the COVID-19 Select Committee that the Prime Minister's hand-picked chair of the National COVID-19 Coordination Commission, former, Mort former Fortescue Medical Metals Chief Executive Nev Power, will receive a taxpayer-funded package of more than $267,000 over six months. Can the minister inform the Senate how much, in in how much income support a mother of three children who had been casually employed for 11 months and is excluded from the government's JobKeeper scheme, forced to rely on JobSeeker, will receive over six months? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, um, I, a single mother in that circumstance will receive the COVID supplement, which effectively doubles the job seeker support throughout this period. So we've effectively doubled uh, government support uh, through that period. Now, in, in, relation, to, in relation to Mr. Power and, and referencing back to the answer I provided to Senator Waters, uh, he's not receiving a salary. Uh, he does come from uh, Western Australia, and there are some uh, costs, obviously, in terms of travel, accommodation, and other. And, and, and other. And, and other. And, uh, and that is not something that has been uh, that is not something that has been uh, negotiated by the government. Uh, it's been it has been it has been it is it is an arrangement that has been put in place by the prime minister's department without the involvement of either the prime minister or his office. And uh, and of course the uh, department has provided appropriate information in relation to these matters. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. A Gold Coast scaffolder who's worked crew to crew company to company for almost 13 years, has been excluded by the government from JobKeeper because he'd only been with his current employer as a casual since September. What does the minister have to say to this worker, his wife and five children, who face living on just $125 a week on JobSeeker after their rent is paid? Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, uh, again, uh, anyone who is on JobSeeker will be receiving the COVID supplement, which effectively doubles the level of support, and, uh, and in those circumstances, it sounds to me that they are likely to also be eligible for other uh, welfare supports, like potentially rental assistance uh, or uh, family tax benefit payments. And in fact, the uh, person that you referenced in your first uh, answer uh, similarly, similarly would be uh, eligible on, on the face of it to a number of other welfare support payments. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a difficult period, but I mean, I, I can see that there is an attempt here to smear uh, a distinguished Australian who is providing great service to Australia, great service to Australia, and is doing an extremely important job for Australia as we ensure that we are in the best possible position uh, to uh, reco recover strongly on the other side, and who's been working with others, including uh, Mr. Combe, incidentally, uh, who's been working with others to solve a whole series of problems that have helped make uh, people's lives easier, uh, easier all around Australia. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Can the minister explain how the Morrison government justifies paying more than $267,000 of taxpayer money to a former mining executive for six months' work? While casuals employed less than a year, local government workers, university staff and teachers, temporary workers, disability workers and arts and entertainment workers have been deliberately and willfully excluded from the JobKeeper scheme. Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I mean, this is a, a disappointing uh, return to Labour, so let's turn people against each other uh, type attitude. I mean, like, and here she's laughing. Like, I mean, we could, we, could go, we could go through a whole series of jobs and a whole series of people who do great work for Australia and how much 
they are remunerated. Uh, including, uh, but we could we could go through all sorts of uh, public servants that uh, that are doing important job and how they are remunerated. And you know what? Um, the arrangements the arrangements are entirely appropriate, uh, Mr. Um, Power and uh, the commissioners on the National COVID Coordination Commission are doing very important work in our national order. interest. Order, Senator um, Wong, on a point of order. A point of order, direct relevance. The question is how the minister can justify to sixty-seven thousand dollars, apparently not a salary, but just cost reimbursement, being paid to somebody, given uh, the people who the government is excluding um, from job the, the, I've allowed you to restate the question. It was particularly broad in its nature, uh, and an answer can be commensurately broad. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm aware that uh, Ms. Stephanie Foster from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet went forensically in some detail uh, through all of these processes, which is appropriate given it is the Prime Minister's department that has entered into those uh, arrangements. Uh, not, it's not something that was, uh, it was not something that was uh, organised at the uh, uh, ministerial level of government. Order. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Liberal and the National Government is supporting regional communities and industries during the coronavirus pandemic through the COVID-19 Relief and Recovery Fund? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator McKenzie for her question and acknowledge her passion in particular for rural uh, and regional Australia. And Senator McKenzie, uh, as you well know, regional Australians are incredibly resilient. Whether it's the drought, whether it's the bushfires, the floods which actually then followed the bushfires, and obviously now with the impact of COVID-19, uh, regional Australians they do come through all of these challenges. Why? Because of their resilience and because of their fighting spirit. Uh, Mr. President, the Liberal National Government is proud to support rural and regional Australia. It's in our DNA, as Senator McKenzie well knows. Mr. President, we have recently established the $1 billion COVID-19 Relief and Recovery Fund to support regions, communities and industry sectors that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Through the fund, the Commonwealth is providing timely support when and where it is most critically needed. Over $600 million has already been committed, supporting industries including aviation, agriculture, fisheries, tourism, and the arts. Mr President, these measures include support for regional aviation under our $100 million regional airlines funding assistance and the $198 million regional airline network support programs, relief for federally managed fisheries through the waiving of nearly $10 million in levies, air freight support for agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries to help businesses during this time export produce into key overseas markets when return flights bring back vital, vital medical supplies, medicines and equipment, funding for vulnerable areas of the arts sector, including help for regional artists and organisations. Mr President, the Liberal National Government is proud to support regional and rural Australia. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Well, that gives us much uh, to be proud of, Senator um, Cash. Thank you. How will this package, along with the Liberal and National Government's $100 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline, support job creation and economic activity that will be essential to Australia's economic recovery from the coronavirus crisis? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, the Liberal National Government is, of course, committed to supporting jobs and the economy at this critical time, uh, including jobs of those in the construction and building supply chain. Mr. President, it is a well-known fact that infrastructure is a key enabler of the economy. It supports economic activity, it sustains employment, and of course, it drives long-term productivity. It will be essential to our economic recovery once the health crisis passes. Road and rail projects currently underway are expected Mr. President, to support up to 85,000 direct and indirect jobs over the lifetime of the projects. We're also working 
As you know, with state and territory and local governments to get additional projects underway, and works are commencing in some corridors. Mr. President, since coming to government, more than 300 major projects have been completed and those, job, and those projects Order. created Senator jobs. Order. Senator Cash. Senator Mackenzie, a final supplementary question. Mr President, is the minister aware of any projects that demonstrate the job creating potential of the Liberal and the Nationals government's infrastructure pipeline? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and uh, uh, yes I am. Uh, Mr President, our infrastructure investment is vital to Australia's immediate and long-term economic prosperity. There are around 160 projects currently underway across our great nation that are improving safety, improving productivity and, of course, creating jobs. These include high-profile examples like the Western Sydney International Airport, Senator Payne, and the 1,700-kilometre inland rail projects. Um, but, Mr President, there are of course more. The government has brought forward and invested new funding of more than half a billion dollars of road projects that will drive jobs, strengthen the economy and get people home sooner and safer, including in regional Victoria. $370 million of the new package was planned to be spent in just the next 18 months to get these projects done. And Senator McKenzie, we're working harder to ensure that even with the impacts Order, of COVID-19, this Time still— Time for the answers expired. Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I'm sure everyone is uh, very disappointed, but I asked that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Wait and— Are there any motions to take note of answers? I'm calling Senator Gallagher, am I? Thank yes. you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the question I asked. <laughs> well, I actually was waiting for you to move this. You took me by surprise. Um, and I'm, well, I will, I'm always nice, um, but I will raise uh, some points about the labour force figures, which, as I think everyone in this place uh, today uh, when those figures were released, uh, completely devastating and a real sobering um, message to all of us here about the devastating impact that COVID-19 is having on our economy and our society. Whilst these are, figures are released as numbers, every number behind them has a story, every person um, and their family and the pressure that comes with losing a job, losing a job so suddenly and also not being able to find another job. Um, in the times uh, that we are currently living. These are also figures I don't think any of us ever expected we would see—600,000 people losing their jobs in a month, one out of every five Australian workers either losing their job or having less work, uh, the effect on young people, youth unemployment jumping 2.2 percentage points, the largest monthly increase on record. These are um, staggering numbers and I think really highlights for me the importance of getting the economic recovery right and for the government to consider these uh, numbers and the people that sit behind them. And that's why my question today went to giving the government the opportunity to reconsider some of the decisions they've taken. We accept that JobKeeper and JobSeeker were put together uh, in an urgent way to address and, uh, in a sense, align with the restrictions that were urgently being put in place to uh, flatten the curve, the health curve, and that that uh, was done in a matter of days. But we have also consistently, over the past couple of months, raised uh, issues around eligibility, particularly where we think that the government could have um, allowed more into the scheme, into the JobKeeper scheme in particular where some of the eligibility criteria has been unfair, where uh, you know, a young person who um, has a part-time job but has had that part-time job for a couple of years um, might have gone from earning $200 a week to all of a sudden earning $750 a week, whereas someone who by uh, merely length of service, you know, 11 months, 10 months, 8 months, but with significant dependence um, and other costs um, is denied access to JobKeeper on those grounds alone. And we think there are some inconsistencies that uh, the government could have used this time to, uh, to get right, and we still think that's the case. I mean, we believe the shorter the unemployment queue, uh, 
is, even at the peak of this economic crisis, the better it will be in the long run to keep people off the unemployment queue. And it would be interesting to know whether the government had advice from Treasury about whether, if they'd gone bigger, if they'd gone earlier, if they'd allowed the eligibility um, for casuals, uh, for uni students, uh, for uni staff, for casual teachers, whether they would have, um, whether that would have meant less people would be reflected in these figures today. Uh, 500,000 uh, people left the labour market in entirely, not looking for work anymore, not in a job, and they aren't reflected in the official headline results. Gone, and we know where they've gone. They've gone on to Job Seeker. They've gone to Job Seeker because they weren't able to keep their employment relationship going, and that's what we have concerns about. We know that the recovery out of this will be longer and harder. It'll be different across particular industries, disproportionately affected by uh, the restrictions that have been put in place. And this is the issue that we have been urging the government uh, to rethink. And today's numbers, I think, gave them the opportunity to have to look at this and think, yeah, actually we could look at this and we could look at how many more people we could get out of unemployment and back in to some connection with their job. This is something we will continue to press because the big decisions that were taken urgently, the time that we have now to reflect and to understand some of the statistics will actually determine the recovery out of this. And for young people, I think when you look at the underemployment rate and the youth unemployment rate, we can see already the disproportionate impact that young people are going to have. They'll be out of the labour market. The ones that have just entered will be forced back. The ones that want to get into it probably won't be able to. And they will carry these years, for however long it takes to recover, with them for the rest of their career. So we would urge the government to keep their mind open and consider changes where they're sensible to be made. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. If there's one thing Senator Gallagher and I agree on, it's that the economic recovery from this health crisis is very important. And there's no doubt that the Australian economy and the many Australians um, who make up as a group that economy have taken a big hit as a consequence of the coronavirus pandemic. But it's important to note that we approach this crisis from a position of strength. While those on the other side had been demanding that um, this government abandon financial responsibility and start handing out wads of cash late last year, we held fire knowing that it's important to have some money in the tin for a rainy day, something up your sleeve for when times get tough. And 2020 has provided a number of those tough times. And no doubt there are many Australians feeling acutely that pinch. So that's why the government has taken decisive action to address the consequences of the coronavirus pandemic. The JobKeeper payment, a $1,500 a fortnight payment worth $130 billion to the Australian taxpayer, has been brought in to tackle this significant economic impact, and it works by keeping Australians tied to their workplaces through this difficult time. It's had enormous take-up. That tells us something about the nature of the economic impact of coronavirus, but it also tells us something about the nature of Australian businesses and their desire to do the right thing by their staff, their desire to keep them on, ready to take up the mantle once more once we get through this difficult time. There has been record take-up. But since then, we have seen just so many examples of how this payment is working to help in my home state of Queensland. Sam O'Connor, the member for Bonnie, knows just how well the JobKeeper payment can save a business. Recently, he met with Tula from the Frig Cafe, which has two cafes in Brisbane and in Labrador on the Gold Coast. Tula says there is no way her business would have survived without JobKeeper assistance because business has, during the period of restrictions, been down 80 per cent. Sam visited on the Saturday before Mother's Day to put some hampers together and saw firsthand the benefits of what JobKeeper does because her six staff, vital staff members employed, 
who make tasty burgers, pancakes and schnitzels for every breakfast and lunchtime, still have a job. In the electorate of Ford, where we have the wonderful example of Packer Leather, an Australian fifth-generation family-run manufacturing business, they're delighted to be able to report to their outstanding local member, Bert Van Manen, that the JobKeeper payment has allowed them to keep their 100 local staff members on the books. They were established in 1891. They've survived the Spanish flu, two world wars, the Great Depression, the rise of plastics and foreign competition, offshore manufacturing in a number of recessions, and now, with the help of the Morrison government, they are surviving this crisis as an international leader in the production of high-performance leathers. They are a great example of the Australian fighting spirit and the sort of businesses that JobKeeper, through the help of the Morrison government and the Australian taxpayer, is helping people keep working, keep that business going for the recovery. Ross Faster, the member for Bonner, has spent time with the owner of the Manly Deck Bar and Restaurant named Sadir. He explained that without the JobKeeper payment, he wouldn't have been able to continue his daily operations. Laura Gerber, the fantastic new member for Currumbin, has noticed that the business of Rainbow Meats in Currumbin Waters, owned by Peter, has lost an enormous amount of trade—80 per cent of total revenue. Peter said that the JobKeeper program is the only thing keeping their doors open right now. It just simply wouldn't be possible without that program helping to subsidise staff wages through this hard time. Ray Stevens, the member for Mermaid Beach, met Lincoln Tester, the owner of Madison's Cafe in the Broad Beach Oasis, a cafe I'm very fond of. And Lincoln said very flatly the business would not have survived without the JobKeeper payment. That means he wouldn't have been able to keep his many staff on during this time. I could keep going with example after example of the businesses that are surviving this hard time because of the measures put in place by this government. And I could tell you story after story of workers who are hanging on because of the assistance they're getting through the JobKeeper payment or even in thank a worst-case scenario. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Your time has expired. Thank Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, that's all well and good, but when you consider the, uh, the lines, the Centrelink lines, the queues of, uh, of uh, hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of Australians who were standing uh, around the Centrelink lines and who still continue to do so, uh, we do know that today these a ABS labour force figures are incredibly devastating figures. Uh, to show that 2.7 million Australian workers have either lost their job or had less work in April, <coughs> that's one in every five Australian workers. So more than half a million Australians have lost their jobs between March and April, and yes, pushing the unemployment rate to 6.2%. Uh, that equates to around 19,810 jobs lost each day during that period. These are workers, their families, and they need to put food on the table for their family, their children, and their people who are our friends, our relatives, our neighbours, and people in our community. And underemployment rose to a record rate of 13.7 per cent, with over 1.8 million Australians underemployed. And the number of underemployed Australians was already at a record high well before the pandemic. Labor has been calling on the government to respond to record underemployment even prior to COVID-19. And that is really important to note. And Labor's call to broaden out the JobKeeper package to cover the sectors most affected just has not been listened to. It was Labor who called for these wage subsidies in the first place. And then we called on the Morrison government to broaden the JobKeeper package to include the 1.1 million casuals who had been with their employer for less than one month. If that had been done, if the Morrison government had listened, these figures could be and should be better. The unemployment queues are longer than they need to be because many Australian workers have been excluded from the government's JobKeeper program. When we look at the JobKeeper program, the government is still leaving people behind, particularly the most vulnerable, casual employees, people in whole sectors like the arts and entertainment sector. They aren't even getting the support that they need, and the government does need to respond to this. Again, these people are the people behind the statistics. 
They are our families. They are our friends. They are our relatives. They are our neighbours. They are our community members. This week was meant to be the budget week, and we thought in the new climate we would at least see a response from uh, Minister Josh Frydenberg of substance. But that did not happen. No substance, just a few old figures put together. In contrast, Labor is looking towards a recovery and we're looking to how it needs to happen. We are putting forward practical suggestions about job keeper and job seeker. Unemployment and underemployment have been turbocharged by this crisis, but they are not new challenges. The labour market has been weak for some time. What we actually need in this country is a government that has vision beyond day-to-day -day politics. Now is not the time to play politics, and we've been showing bipartisanship, but that doesn't mean remaining silent. We have a responsibility as a party of working people to stand up for all of the wage earners of Australia, and we have been a responsible opposition, making constructive suggestions about the faults in the design of the job seeker scheme, just as we made constructive suggestions about unemployment benefits the partner income test, mutual obligation, supporting students, relief from evictions, childcare, telehealth, charities, access to broadband and the aviation sector. It was our First Nations caucus of the Federal Labor Party that pushed for the CDP program to remove the mutual obligation, so First Nations people uh, did not have to be penalised again and again in an environment where this pandemic was going to so critically impact uh, those uh, CDP participants. 33,000 of them uh, in, in Australia, uh, predominantly First Nations people. These were constructive uh, uh, suggestions by the Australian Labor Party to encourage the government to move far more quickly and precisely to enable uh, all Australians to have an opportunity to get through this pandemic and to continue to get through in life in general post this pandemic. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Scar. Uh, Madam, Acting, uh, sorry, Madam Deputy President, uh, I must say uh, I find it somewhat perplexing that after the federal government has announced a $130 billion JobKeeper payment uh, scheme, that those on the other side of the chamber uh, simply say, well, it didn't go far enough. It should have gone further. It should have gone further. First, and let me make a few points on that. First, you can't look at the JobKeeper payment scheme in isolation. You have to look at it together with the government's overall response, and that includes the job seeker payment attribute of the government's response, and that includes the $550 COVID supplement which is paid each fortnight to people who are on JobSeeker. So it is simply not the case. It is simply not the case to assert that this government has left anyone behind. This government has sought on every occasion to provide generous assistance to everyone in our society who is impacted by this awful pandemic. And can I say, in my electorate of Queensland, across Queensland, Queenslanders by and large have been absolutely applauding the federal government's efforts to keep Queensland businesses operating and to provide generous support to all Queenslanders. I take the point that those casual workers who have been working for a specific employer for less than 12 months are not included in the JobKeeper scheme. I take that point. And in response to that, I would just say this. First, they have access to the JobSeeker relief payment. Secondly, the basis of the JobKeeper payment was to keep specific employment relationships between employers and their longer-term or permanent employees, and the line has to be drawn somewhere in that respect. And the line was drawn in this case with respect to people who are casuals of a casual employees of an employer for less than 12 months. Why? because they haven't got that long-term employment relationship that a full-time employee has, a part-time employee has, or a casual employee who's been providing work for the same employer for over 12 months. But they're not left behind. They're given access to the JobSeeker payment. 
So it is simply not the case to say that they're left behind. And Senator McCarthy, you say that we need to look towards recovery. We need to look towards recovery. Can I say to you, if those opposite, if the opposition wants to look forward towards recovery, I don't think, I don't think it's the right thing to do to throw bricks at some of those great Australians who become commissioners of the COVID-19 Commission of Coordination. I don't think it's the right thing, Senator McCarthy, for bricks to be thrown at people like Ned Power. He doesn't need to do this job. He's been a chief executive of Fortescue Metals Group. He doesn't need to do this job. And I thought it was absolutely tawdry and disgraceful that in this place, when you, through the, through the deputy president, rightly talk about moving forward, looking towards the recovery, and I absolutely agree with your comments in that regard. But at the same time, but at the same time, your colleagues are there throwing bricks at a great Australian, in fact, a great Queenslander. I'll claim him as a Queenslander. He's now living in Perth, but he was a Queenslander. A great Queenslander about the fact he's getting his travel expenses and a per diem, and a per diem to perform that role. He's doing that because he's a great Australian. He's a great Australian, and he does not deserve to be attacked in this chamber by the Australian Labor Party. He does not deserve to be attacked by the Australian Labor Party. He should be congratulated, as all the members of that commission should be congratulated, for putting their hand up at a time of great need in his, in his country, like all the other commissioners have. They put their name, names forward. They put up their hand. When they were asked, they came forward to help their country at this time of need. They did not deserve that tawdry performance, which we saw in question time. They didn't deserve it, Senator. They really did not deserve it. So the Australian government is providing generous support, generous assistance across the breadth and width of this country. We're providing generous support, generous assistance, and we are looking. We are looking towards the future. We are looking towards the future. Thank you, Senator Scar. Um, Senator Sheldon at the lectern. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Well, first of all, you know, of course, noting this uh, horrific and devastating figures of 600,000 jobs in April uh, being lost, the effect on Australian families and the communities right across this country, um, the effects on restrictions and, from, and business shutdowns. And of course, when we look at one in five people, um, when you look at the issue of underemployment, a significant plague on this country prior to COVID-19. And of course, you look at those hard hit people, those hard hit workers that are not receiving support, you know, casuals with less than 12 months, the arts and entertainment industry, local government workers, and of course, many workers right across the, our, our markets. You know, the JobKeeper wage subsidy, of course, was a very good idea, but it's been incredibly badly implemented. Throughout this discussion on JobKeeper, we've been constructive, supportive and responsible. But too many Australians have been left out and left behind, some accidentally, but clearly many deliberately. From day one, we've seen the scheme should have been better targeted so that people who really need it can get it, and we don't waste taxpayers' money. You know, it's laughable as we're talking about what we should be doing about JobKeeper and dealing with this crisis of these unemployment figures, that we have one minister, Dutton, making a laughable comment, as he said, a laughable comment, he said, from the Queensland government, the fact that they were going to invest $200 million into revitalising Virgin and saving 16,000 jobs. Well, the only thing that's laughable is obviously Minister Dutton. You know, quite clearly, he might be better off concentrating on his day job because he's not able to stop plague boats from leaving this country and causing undue harm right across this economy to people that have been killed and lost their lives. His failure has cost this country and those individuals that have been directly affected. It's quite clear that we need to be having a policy that turns around and includes those people that have been left out. You know, just earlier today, we had a motion 
regarding Donata workers, which the government and One Nation decided to abandon 5,500 workers at Donata. We've seen the Prime Minister make the announcement with uh, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. The Australians know we've got their back. But very quickly it became clear that JobKeeper would not have the backs of hundreds of thousands of Australians and their families. Which is why we tried to legislate to make sure that we, through amendments, that we could make sure that those people were given the protections they needed, including those I've already mentioned, migrant workers and international students who pay tax and who come here in good faith. These amendments, of course, were defeated by the government, uninterested in helping those Australian tax-paying workers. We saw them on numerous occasions. From the 1st of July, the government moved to exclude Australian workers in universities. And as I mentioned, Australian workers who companies are ultimately owned by a foreign sovereign entity. It was outrageous and a cruel stroke of the pen that left thousands and thousands of families out in the cold. The government has shortchanged this country and shortchanged all those hundreds of thousands of workers across this country. Workers in Donata have been striving to make sure that their operations, when the aviation industry comes back, is vital, operating, it's ready to boom the tourism industry to get us snapped back. Well, this government's adamant about having snap off not defending Australian workers, not appropriately supporting and having the back of every Australian, and applying double standards to hard-working Australians that have been paying their taxes. It's incredibly important, with the struggles ahead, that JobSeeker is properly allocated to support all Australians, all tax-paying Australians that we've mentioned on numerous occasions in this place. I applaud the government to give reconsideration because they can make a difference. Thank you, by the Senator of the Sheldon. Pen. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Gallagher to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given to my question to the Minister for Finance representing the Prime Minister. Now, I asked about the little fossil fuel cosy group that the government has appointed and is paying with taxpayer funds, the COVID Commission. And I asked initially how they can be confident that conflicts of interest with this fossil fuel buddy group aren't going to dominate the recommendations of this body. There are no guidelines that pertain to how conflicts of interests are to be disclosed or managed. We learnt yesterday that, in fact, special advisers to that commission, who can be co-opted or appended, they don't even have any obligations about disclosing or managing conflicts of interest. And on top of that, we know that the commission's advice to government will be treated as cabinet in confidence. So we don't know what rules they're operating under. We don't know how they're managing conflicts of interest, uh, and we don't even know what they're advising the government to do. And so I asked the minister, well, how can you be confident that they're putting the public interest ahead of their own private interests or the interests of the industries from whence they hail? Well, the minister is, uh, is confident that they can manage those conflicts. Well, isn't any wonder that we still don't have a federal anti-corruption watchdog despite it being nigh on a year and a half since this government reluctantly promised to deliver one, when this government thinks that flagrant potential for conflict of interest can just be somehow managed, it's the Commission's own responsibility, they don't even want to put any guidelines in place. Well, it is no wonder that the public think that this government is completely opposed to transparency and accountability and that we desperately need an anti-corruption watchdog. Now, the reason for this, of course, is that um, the fossil fuel industry has been very busy under the cover of COVID. They've, uh, it's been collated by a group called Fossil Fuel Watch. There's been 14 requests to cut environmental laws or corporate regulations. There's been 11 requests for tax cuts and concessions, and might I say more tax cuts and more tax concessions. There's been 12 requests to fast track projects. But the minister says these conflicts can be managed. 
the appointees on the commission they don't have any guidelines they don't apparently have any criteria on which to base their recommendations to government or if they do we won't be told that either and we won't be told what their advice to government is well you know I think it's going to be pretty obvious what their advice to government is going to be. A bunch of people up to their necks in the fossil fuel industry, now getting paid by the taxpayer, will no doubt recommend to the government that the economic recovery out of the COVID crisis is in fact yet more fossil fuels. We're about to start the fire season again, and we just saw the worst bushfires in history. But this government has forgotten all about its inept handling of that crisis. And it's forgotten all about the real underlying crisis that will still be on foot when the COVID crisis is dealt with, and that's the climate crisis. And yet it puts in charge of an advisory body a bunch of people that want to make the climate crisis worse, to make more money for themselves and their industries and their shareholders. But we don't need conflict of interest guidelines. Everything's going to be fine. Go back to sleep, folks. We've already seen that a gas-led recovery is being proposed by the so-called Minister for Emissions Reduction, biggest misnomer in history, and it's no wonder when you look at the makeup of that COVID commission. Now, we are concerned that whilst this government has been laudably paying attention to the health experts in dealing with the COVID crisis, they are ignoring the climate experts in dealing with the climate crisis. Why is it that scientists are sometimes good and sometimes to be ignored? Well, unfortunately, I put that question to the minister and he chose to answer a different aspect and conveniently ignore that question altogether. But we do not need a so-called gas-led recovery. Gas is a dirty fossil fuel. It wrecks farmland. It destroys underground water. It frequently dispossesses uh, First Nations and traditional owners. That's why I've had a bill in this place for nigh on 10 years to give people the right to say no to it. And then finally, I asked about the obscene amounts of payment that these folk are receiving. Um, but it's meant to be OK because it's not a quarter of a million dollars in salary that this guy's receiving, the chair of the commission, for six months. It's only in expenses. The minister somehow thinks that makes it better, that the chair is receiving a quarter of a million dollars in expenses only to do a job, when this government is proposing dumping people back down to $41 a day below the poverty line in September, and it won't even support a million casual workers on JobKeeper. The priorities of this government are abundantly clear. It's government by the rich for the rich. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against. I declare that carried. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion uh, to provide for the dies of um, meeting and estimates hearings for the remainder of 2020. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, thank I thank the Minister. Senator. I move the motions are circulated. So the question is, are you seeking to speak on that motion? Uh, yes, Deputy President. I seek guidance. I would like to make a, a brief contribution on that, but I'm not sure how long I would okay, well, let's... be indulged for. Okay, I yes. don't intend to take that long. Uh, Thank I, you, Senator Waters. Thanks very much. Uh, look, we've just received a revised sitting calendar um, uh, half an hour or so ago from the government, and based on the sitting weeks that were in the original pre-COVID calendar, it looks like we'll still be short one estimates week, um, which is of great concern because we had moved amendments to the COVID Senate Select Committee to enable it to scrutinise the Prime Minister and other ministers from the other place. And those amendments were not successful. So we are not able to have that scrutiny ability except through the forum of this chamber or through estimates. So our suggestion and our hope would be that one of those sitting weeks, uh, in our suggestion, one of the June weeks, should in fact become an estimates week so that we can use those uh, scrutiny powers and those accountability mechanisms um, to best effect, given the limitations of that committee, because sadly nobody backed our amendments to make it stronger. Um, I might also note that we've had a, a very good and positive tradition in this place of not scheduling sitting weeks in school holidays. Now, I'm sure there are many folk in this place that have people that stay at home and look after their kids for them, but some of us actually do that ourselves, and it is very difficult to manage parliamentary sittings when school holidays are on. So that would be my other note of caution. It's just one of the weeks that's been scheduled, and it's only half the country that will be on school holidays, but it's that week of uh, October the 6th to the 8th, um, which I would 
seriously ask the government to reflect on uh, rescheduling that week to a different week in this sitting year so that people and young parents in particular are not discouraged from uh, careers in politics going forward. Now, I might also add um, we are assuming and hoping that the social distancing requirements will continue to apply, um, and we think it's important as democracy continues to work that we continue to be guided by the health advice. Um, and so it needs to be the same rules for us as it is for the rest of the nation. I think we've been doing well in that regard, and credit to the chamber attendants and to the folks in this building who've been assisting us in doing that. Um, but it's important that those protocols remain, um, given that we will now have a sitting calendar that effectively is quite the same in terms of the sitting load as it was before the pandemic, which we support. Um, we are concerned, though, at the government's rhetoric that um, the economy needs to get back on track in a way that may be concerned, that may be um, flying in the face of the health evidence. The pressure that's been coming from this government onto the states to hurry up and open everything so people can go out there and spend their money again and get this unsustainable economy going, uh, that needs to be tempered by the health advice. There's been undue pressure, in our view, placed by the Prime Minister just in order to do favours to his big business mates. Now, of course, we want to see the economy um, get back on track in a sustainable way, in an equitable way, um, but this undue pressure uh, is inconsistent with the health advice, and we ask the, the Prime Minister and the folks in this place to take that on board. Um, overall, we're pleased to see a lot more sitting weeks scheduled. Uh, democracy has never been more important than in times such as this, when we are facing um, unprecedented challenges on so many fronts, an inequality crisis, a climate crisis a jobs crisis and now a health crisis on top of that. So it's appropriate that we get back to work as long as those social distancing protocols um, are observed. And I might just add, um, we do hope that um, arrangements for uh, travel be factored in, considering that uh, many states have had uh, flights severely restricted, in no small part due to the government's failure to provide any assistance to the larger airline company. And of course, the Queensland government is now um, attempting to step in to do that. Uh, but that will be another uh, consideration, particularly for those who are coming from over west. Thanks very much. Um, Minister, you have already spoken, and we're not in committee, but I'll just check with the clerk. I'd seek leave. I'll just, I'll just Is leave, leave granted? Because I'm a si yes. I seek Thank leave you. to make some comments in response. Um, in, in relation to the uh, issue that Senator Waters raises about school holidays, uh, it's a fair point she raises. Obviously, uh, this uh, program has gone through the House of Representatives as well, so I propose that we deal with it as, um, as put forward today, but I'll, I'll take that on notice and, and explore that, and we'll have some time to uh, have another look at that particular week uh, in relation to school holidays. Uh, in relation to travel, uh, for as long as is appropriate, and you know, I come from Western Australia, I understand what uh, Senator Waters is talking about in terms of logistical challenges. We do need to ensure that we facilitate uh, members and senators uh, coming to Canberra uh, you know, in, in a way that is um, that is workable, so we will continue to make these arrangements as we have uh, for as long as is, as is appropriate. I, I support the comments in relation, and I think all parties and all senators would support the comments in relation to ensuring that the meetings will be conducted in a way that is uh, COVID safe and that is consistent with relevant health guidance. Uh, I certainly agree with that. Uh, in relation to uh, Senate estimates, we haven't had a budget. Um, and normally in uh, May, June, we have two weeks of budget estimates. Uh, and at different times of the year, we've got additional or supplementary estimates that are always linked to a specific event, whether that's annual reports or half yearly budget update or indeed the budget. Um, so the program that we're proposing has two estimates weeks uh, in uh, uh, in October, after the budget has been delivered. By then, we are confident that, from in terms of the health context and the COVID um, uh, sort of, I guess, environment, it will be uh, safe. It should be safe by then to bring uh, the amount of people together that are involved in uh, in the estimates process over over that sort of period. So, uh, we're not proposing to uh, amend the uh, program in, in the way that Senator Waters has suggested uh, in relation to uh, the June sitting weeks. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to make a few short uh, Are you comments seeking, on. You seeking leave? Yes. yes leave thank, you. thank you. Um, the Labor will be supporting this motion. Um, we're pleased that the government has listened to um, representations from Labor and others in this chamber around the importance of locking in and uh, sitting weeks and 
getting back to work as the rest of the country does. Um, it's people I would urge you to bring your thermal gear with you for almost of August by the look of it. Um, in relation to budget estimates, uh, I think there are some challenges around um, convening estimates in the way that we would normally do so for uh, a, a budget period in terms of the duration, the amount of people in rooms and things like that. I think we've experienced some of those challenges ourselves with the Select Committee on COVID-19. Um, so at this point in time, we are uh, happy with the way the um, government has put forward this plan to have the full two weeks of estimates following the handing down um, of the budget and also uh, thank and acknowledge the government's assistance with uh, travel for senators and members coming from other places around Australia. I think it really does help people get here and return home in the most COVID safe way possible. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, uh, the matter is carried. Thank you. We will now move to tabling and consideration of committee reports. I'm just being told. So we'll now move to um, the consideration of documents which are listed on page 22 to 26 of today's notice paper. And we'll start with the documents on page 22. Does anyone wish to? Is Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Dep oh, sorry, Deputy President. Um, I take note of documents 1, 2, 3, 6, 7 and 10 on page 22 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So we're done with uh, 22. So we'll now move to the documents listed on page 23. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of documents 11 and 15 on page 23 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I'm now moving to page 24. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I take note of documents 26 and 27 on page 24 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I'm now moving to the documents listed on page 25. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of document 35 on page 25 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, we'll now move to the rest of the documents uh, listed on page 26, which is halfway down. Senator um, Seawick. Sarah, okay. I know it's that time in really? the day, in that time in the week. Oh dear, I've said Urquhart so many times. My apologies. Senator Seawick. Um, I seek leave to take note of documents 39 and 41 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Granted. When, uh, did you wish to take note of some of those documents, Senator Urquhart? Um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, We're up to 26. Yes. So can I? Um, we just still cool. on and the And we docks. took note of 39 and 41. Okay. Can I um, take note of 42 and 43 and seek leave to continue my remarks? Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Back to um, sorry, page 22 and. Um, Take note of document five and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection. And leave is on granted. page 23, um, document 20, I seek leave and continue, um, seek continue. leave to continue my remarks. Uh, leave Thank is granted. You. So that takes us to committee reports and government responses. On the bottom half of page 26, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of documents one and three on page 26 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So we'll now do the committee reports uh, and documents listed on page 27. 
Senator Seward. I um, wish to take note of item 15 on page 27 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I take note of documents 4 and 7 on page 27, and I also did 15, but I note Senator Seward did that, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So we now move to. <coughs> Oh, my fingers won't work. Turn the page. Uh, the document, the report's listed on page 28. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of document 27 on page 28 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. I take note of items uh, 16 and 17 on page uh, 28 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. We will now do the documents listed on page 29. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of documents 32 and 35 on page 29 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seward. And I uh, take note of uh, documents 30, uh, reports 33 and 36 on page 29 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So that takes us now to the Auditor General's report. Which reports, beg your pardon, which are listed on page 30. Let's start there. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I take note of documents 1 and 2 on page 30 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. Uh, I take note of item 6 on page 30 and uh, seek, leave or, uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And that takes us to the last two on page... Yes, Senator Seward. Deputy That's um, okay. President, um, could I also take note of item 7 or report 7 on yep. page 30 and sure. seek leave to continue my remarks? Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And then we are le left with the other top two on page 31. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I take note of documents 9 and 10 on page 31 and, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So that finishes uh, reports and Auditor Generals, and any report or response to which no Senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, I table documents relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Building Land Care Community and Capacity Grants Program. Thank you. And Deputy President, on behalf of the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Mr Littleproud, I table a ministerial statement on update on bushfire recovery and drought response. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Senator, Senator what? About that. Are you? Yep. Okay. So I didn't see who, but you've. I, I don't know. You go. <laughs> Senator Mc. All right, Senator Watt. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Madam Deputy I President. Uh, I rise to take note of the minister's uh, statement, uh, particularly in relation to uh, bushfires and his portfolio of disaster management. Thank um, you. Uh, as has been noted before, and as is noted in the minister's statement. The recent summer bushfires was obviously a devastating experience for so many Australians. Tragically, we saw 33 lives lost, over 3,000 homes destroyed, uh, millions of hectares of land uh, and, uh, and forest destroyed, along uh, with millions of animals and other species. Not to mention the incredible trauma, psychological trauma inflicted on so many Australians. As I have done before in this chamber, I again place the opposition's incredible gratitude on record towards uh, the firefighters, both professional and volunteers, all of the community groups, all of the government representatives who worked so hard over the summer uh, and before and after to assist bushfire victims. Uh, but it is important that now that we are several months on from the bushfires themselves, uh, that work continue to ensure that communities recover. And from the opposition's point of view, 
uh, it's, we think that it's vital uh, that we continue to hold the government to account uh, for what it's doing right and what it's doing wrong in terms of bushfire recovery. Uh, we wouldn't be doing our job as the opposition if we're not holding the government to account and to speak up for the bushfire victims who are still waiting for the support that has been promised to them. Right now, there's a hand-painted sign screwed onto the back of a ute in Bega, a town devastated by summer's bushfires. The signs read, and I quote, $2 billion bushfire fund. Where is it? Homes, farms, businesses are rubble and ruins. Communities and charities are helping out. The ADF has come and gone. Was that it? Bushfire survivors, forgotten people. And I'm afraid to say uh, that the sentiment expressed in those signs is a sentiment that is shared by many bushfire victims across much of the country. Uh, obviously, a lot of attention did focus on the bushfires that were particularly experienced in the southeast of New South Wales and the Gippsland region in Victoria, East Gippsland region. Uh, but we need to remember that these fires actually occurred in many, many, many parts of this country uh, over a very long period of time. And I have to say, from the conversations that I've been having with bushfire victims themselves and their representatives, that many people do feel forgotten months after the fires have passed. Right now, in many parts of the country, we are seeing bushfire victims, families living in caravans and sheds next to the, to the blackened remains of their homes. To give a couple of examples, Troy, uh, Troy, Troy Pawley from Yowri is living in a caravan metres from his ruined home with his family. The wreckage has still not been cleared. The kids cry. They don't want to be here, he says. If we got this cleared, we'd have the ball rolling, but it's just way too slow. And again, that sentiment is one that is widely felt, that the recovery process is way too slow. Now, if you listen to the government and if you listen to the Prime Minister, you'd think that everything was running smoothly. On Monday, just this week, Prime Minister Scott Morrison praised the bushfire recovery effort of his own government as sensational and tremendous. I'm sorry, but that is just not the experience of so many bushfire victims. Bushfire victims are telling us that this recovery is moving too slowly. <clears throat> Many don't even trust that the money is actually there. And I have to say that bushfire victims are right to be suspicious of the government's $2 billion National Bushfire Recovery Fund. Uh, this was the fund that the Prime Minister announced at the height of the bushfires when he was under extreme political pressure in January. Uh, and he said at the time that the funds would be ready immediately. He said that the funds would be ready to hit the ground in communities where the fire front has passed to help them rebuild. Well, as time has gone on, unfortunately, we've been able to see that the Prime Minister's promise has not been real. At Senate Estimates not that long ago, we were able to expose that, in fact, this $2 billion fund is simply a notional fund. It may or may not be paid. It may or may not exist. Uh, that's not what bushfire victims heard in January when the Prime Minister made his promise. Uh, and just this week, we finally received the answers to questions on notice that we had lodged, which revealed uh, that less than $260 million from the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund has actually been paid out months after the bushfires. That's only one in eight dollars that was promised uh, from this bushfire fund has actually been delivered. So with such an underwhelming recovery effort, it's not no wonder the bushfire victims feel forgotten by the Prime Minister and his government. But recently, something has changed. Just this week in Parliament, we've seen a fl sudden flurry of activity in the bushfire recovery space. On Monday, the Prime Minister and the Minister for Emergency Management spruiked new amounts announcements from the National Bushfire Recovery Fund. Uh, and today, Minister Littleproud has re-announced additional funding for the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, which the Prime Minister confirmed over four months ago. It's almost as if some political event is emerging, something in a bushfire-affected region that has prompted the government to finally recognise that they need to get moving with the bushfire recovery. It's prompted the government to recognise that they haven't done enough. They haven't lived up to the promises that they made people. Is it remotely possible that a by-election in the, in the electorate of Eden Monero is what's prompted the government all of a sudden to recognise uh, that bushfire victims do need help? 
Is it a by-election in Eden Monero that has prompted the government to finally listen to the complaints of bushfire victims, the complaints that we have aired and been accused of politicking for airing? If there's any politicking going on, it's the sudden interest that this government is showing in bushfire recovery now that we're facing a by-election in Eden Monero. We can't see uh, the, the failure to prepare uh, of this, we can't see this government's failure to prepare for the bushfires repeated when it comes to bushfire recovery. We know, uh, again, from Senate estimates that the Prime Minister and his government were warned on multiple occasions about how severe the bushfires would be prior to them hitting, and they continued to, take, to fail to take action. We can't see that repeated with the recovery. It is vital that we give bushfire victims the support that they need. It is simply unacceptable that months after the bushfires hit, as winter approaches in some of the coldest parts of our country, that bushfire victims remain living in caravans uh, and sheds waiting for rubble to be removed so that they can just begin the process of rebuilding. Uh, whether it be a by-election or any, any other reason, the government has got to make a decision that it's going to take this bushfire recovery seriously, that it's going to dedicate serious resources to it and, at last, to get over this temptation that they always have uh, to be full of marketing, full of promises, full of spin, enough of the spin, enough of the marketing. It's time to actually get on with real action for bushfire victims to help them with their recovery. Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. As Leader of the Nationals in the Senate, I rise to support the Minister for Agriculture and uh, National Party Deputy Leader David Littleproud's uh, statement to the House earlier today, um, which reiterates and reinforces our government's absolute solid commitment to rural and regional Australians who have been doing it tough as a result of the drought in places like Queensland for upwards of seven or eight years, floods which devastated uh, areas of Queensland and caused significant uh, stock losses, the bushfires that ravaged the east coast of our country over summer. Uh, that did start prior to Christmas, but we saw the worst of it uh, in January. 33 people lost their lives. And I and the National Party team uh, wants to thank our CFA, our RFS, uh, our volunteer firefighters uh, and indeed our volunteer emergency service workers who really were the ballast in so many of those communities. We saw over some of the generosity of Australians who uh, sought to assist both our drought affected communities and our bushfire uh, affected communities by seeking to uh, support small businesses by purchasing products online, by booking holidays uh, locally in these regional areas to help stimulate local economies. And unfortunately, because of COVID-19, uh, that local economic stimulus has been put on hold. But I know once uh, the pandemic is finished, the regions will look forward to welcoming Australians. Uh, into our communities to stimulate our local communities and help um, rebuild. But the Nationals, being part of a government that cares for families and businesses right across rural and regional uh, Australia, because we understand what it's like we live in these communities. The spirit of regional Australia has been on display through these challenges. The resilience, um, the robustness, the determination to focus on recovery and rebuild and to support each other. And it is tough, day after day, getting up and having to deal with stock losses, day after day, uh, getting up and looking at the burnt, charred remains uh, of your family's home or your local business. And that is why we've also been supporting our rural and regional communities, not just with practical help in partnership with our state uh, government colleagues and local governments, uh, but we're providing that very essential mental uh, health support to ensure that when the rains come in those drought-affected communities, uh, there will be a spirit of positivity there on the ground to really grasp that opportunity to plant the crop, uh, to purchase and restock, uh, to do what needs to be done to get back to full production. And indeed, uh, the bushfire communities, we've seen the mental health uh, assistance that our government and state governments have been rolling out in those communities be of 
much, much benefit. Uh, we, as the Nationals, are committed to keeping regional communities open for business. We have provided economic stimulus through the $301 million drought communities program extension and additional $138.9 million for drought-affected communities under the Roads for Recovery program, $20 million to keep kids from drought-affected regions at school. We are also looking long-term. From July, the Future Drought Fund will make $100 million available each year to build drought resilience and preparedness, because this will keep happening. Droughts are a part of farming in Australia. Uh, we uh, cyclically uh, go through drought periods, and building that uh, resilience for future droughts will really underpin local economies and agriculture more broadly. We have welcomed some great autumn rainfalls in many, many parts uh, of New South Wales and Victoria, but so much of regional Australia still uh, is gripped by the drought, and we uh, stand with these communities until that passes. Um, the government, in terms of our bushfire recovery, um, has allocated $2 billion to that through the efforts of the new Bushfire Recovery Fund. Uh, whether it was in Victoria, Talangata, Kudjiwar, Gippsland, Mallacoota, South Australia, we saw the devastating stock and wildlife losses on Kangaroo Island. Um, the vineyards destroyed, uh, destroyed uh, their smoke taint uh, affected. Uh, harvests this year uh, as a result in the Adelaide Hills. In New South Wales, we Batlow, uh, Port Macquarie, right throughout the south coast, uh, really, really struggled uh, with the bushfire. And it has been partnership with our state governments that we've been rolling out the bushfire recovery. Andrew Colvin, who heads up uh, the unit, has been on the ground actively engaging with communities, affected small businesses, uh, to see what practical assistance we can provide as the federal government. And even in a COVID-19 environment where we can't get out to town hall meetings and meet the locals personally, I know in my own communities of northeast Victoria, where I live, are heavily affected by the bushfires um, over summer, he's been holding Zoom meetings, uh, you know, online engagement so that he can keep up to date with how the recovery is being rolled out right across these communities. So we don't stop just because of COVID-19, making sure that bushfire and drought is something that is front and centre for our government. In terms of the more than $1 billion from the fund, it's already working on the ground, and that includes more than $175 million for small businesses support grants, $40 million for recovery grants, and $108 million for primary producer grants. $17 million for concessional loans. These uh, grants and uh, monies have been used by primary producers to re-fence, for instance, uh, to restock, to purchase hay, to rebuild hay sheds and, and the like. And that's also provided a lot of uh, local employment for many in our communities. More than $228 million has been paid to more than 186,000 eligible individuals in disaster recovery payment and disaster recovery allowance. And over $32 million worth of payments were made for over 80,000 impacted children, and that's as of the 26th of April. We're proud to back our volunteer firefighters, uh, and over $10.4 million has been paid out uh, to them, and we thank them for their service. We've provided an additional $13.5 million in funding over two years to assist our primary health networks, provide critical, localised emotional and mental health support for bushfire-affected individuals. Other changes we've made as a part of our drought response have meant uh, getting telehealth services into regional communities, as it is more and more difficult uh, for them to leave properties, uh, either for cost of reasons or for work, to actually attend critical um, health services to assist them, with, particularly with their mental health. On May the 11th, the Prime Minister announced a further $650 million to support towns and regions hit by bushfires to get back on their feet. This will back local projects and recovery plans and initiatives that benefit all bushfire-affected communities. We want the solutions to be local. Rather than a top-down, Canberra knows best approach, the National Party and government, the Liberal and National Party uh, federal government knows that it is local communities who are living with the impacts and the results of these devastating bushfires that will have the best ideas of how they can rebuild and the vision that they have collectively 
what their community will look like uh, well past recovery and the resilience pieces that they need to build into their local community uh, for if this was to occur again. Something as um, the daughter of a log truck driver in his youth, I'm very, very proud to be the side of politics that actually supports a sustainable forestry industry in this country. Now, you know, whatever happened to the F in the CFMEU? Honestly, the forestry division needs to rethink who they're, who they're playing with because there is only one side of politics that backs a sustainable uh, forestry industry, and it is the Liberal and the National parties. $15 million to assist that forestry industry transport burn salvage logs to surviving timber mills or storage sites in bushfire-affected areas in Victoria and New South Wales. And wasn't that a battle to actually be able to salvage the already burnt uh, logs, the already burnt timber, uh, to get it to the sawmill. It degrades quite quickly over time, so to get it to sawmills to keep people employed uh, while they can. There's another $149.7 million to support communities and organisations taking on-ground action to protect native species and build no knowledge for better land management. Uh, we've also got the National Drought and North Queensland Flood Response and Recovery Agency, uh, which we then expanded to also encompass the bushfires. So to the communities of rural and regional Australia still struggling with the drought or who are, have got some decent rains and are in the process of getting excited about um, seeding if you're in WA and planting if you're in the east coast, uh, to those affected by bushfires, our government is committed to standing with you and walking the path to recovery uh, lockstep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Senator uh, McKenzie. Uh, I put the question that the Sen uh, are there any other speakers? No. Uh, I put the question that the Senate take note. All those in favour, say aye. All those against, the ayes have it. Thank you, Clark. General business notice of motion 591, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, relating to COVID-19 and the economy. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I stand in support of the notice of motion number 591 brought on by my colleague, uh, Senator Gallagher. A mind-boggling budget deficit of $143 billion has been predicted for the 2019-20 financial year. This week, Deloitte Access Economics economist Chris Richardson forecast the federal deficit to blow out to $143 billion this financial year, dwarfing the $5 billion surplus the government had forecast in December. Mr Richardson predicted in his report the economy would be suffering a COVID-19 hangover for many years to come. National income is predicted to fall $35 billion below official projections and have a shortfall of just under $200 billion in 2020-21. The report also forecasts the unemployment rate will not get back down to 5 per cent until late 2024. Mr Richardson says recovery will be slow. And he puts the key reasons for this as families and businesses having suffered blows to their confidence, their income and their wealth. So they'll be more cautious about taking any risks. As for the Reserve Bank, it has already, in Mr Richardson's words, got the pedal to the metal, meaning this is the first recession and recovery where the RBA is essentially already out of ammo. And while many Australians may well, and while Australia may well perform, uh, outperform many other global economies, that global weakness may undercut the prices we receive for our resource exports. <coughs> it's also worth noting that Mr. Richardson says Australia's recovery will be strikingly dependent on the extent to which our governments, federal and state, switch their policies away from the virus sprint and towards the recovery marathon. He identifies our key problem as unemployment, and that's the curve we now have to flatten. We will have to drive unemployment down without any help from the RBA, as the reserve is already tapped out. Our fight against the virus must now be a battle against unemployment. Mr Richardson warns against rapid budget repair and a reliance on spending cuts 
And he says, with interest rates so low, the government's extra spending on coronavirus support measures, such as JobKeeper, will only cost the average taxpayer around $3 a week. That's it, $3 a week. Yet this government wants to walk away from JobKeeper and JobSeeker. Today's April labour force figures released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics shows young Australians are bearing the brunt of the unemployment crisis. 13.8 per cent of our young people are now without work, which is more than double the national average of 6.2 per cent. There are now 283,500 unemployed young Australians. Many previously employed in casual, insecure and gig work and in hard-hit industries such as hospitality. One third of accommodation and food services jobs have been lost during this crisis, and those worked by people aged 20 to 29 decrease the most. Young Australians are carrying an incredibly heavy load through this crisis, and Labor is deeply concerned about the potentially devastating impact on our young population. Overwhelming unemployment, social isolation and missing significant life events are all taking a financial and certainly a mental health toll on our young Australians. The government must have our young people at the forefront of their thinking and take all necessary steps to support them during and after this crisis. One thing the Treasurer could do right now is better target the JobKeeper program to ensure those young people who were employed casually on a short-term basis are able to access financial support and maintain a connection to their workplace. Labor will continue to work constructively with the government to ensure young Australians are supported. The Northern Territory had the lowest number able to work from home with only 32 per cent, and that was followed by Tasmania on 35 per cent. Labor is calling on the government to release modelling on the anticipated economic impact of snapping back the coronavirus supplement overnight. Last week, the Department of Social Services said it estimated some 1.7 million Australians will require unemployment support by September. Yet the Prime Minister has been insistent that he will snap back the job seeker payment back to $40 per day for millions of Australians on the 24th of September. This is the equivalent of ripping almost $1 billion a fortnight from household budgets. This sudden stop will have a significant impact on the Australian economy. It was revealed last week at the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 that the government had not coordinated its job seeker increase with its wage subsidy rollout, which it introduced following pressure from Labor, business and, in particular, the unions. The Reserve Bank, the Commonwealth Treasury and the International Monetary Fund have all confirmed in recent weeks that an economic snapback is nothing but a myth from the Prime Minister, a snapback of job seeker risks leaving millions of Australians behind. The government needs to be clear. It needs to be straight with all Australians about whether the nation is now edging closer to another economic cliff in the form of the Prime Minister's promised job seeker snapback. If the Prime Minister wants to snap back job seeker, he should be upfront with Australian workers and Australian businesses as to its consequences. This is a fairly reasonable ask. Seek advice from the Department of Social Services and the Treasury. The government's job seeker snapback isn't a plan for the economy, it is a recipe for disaster. The Department of Social Services has admitted it believes another 400,000 Australians will require the job seeker payment by September, bringing the total number of job seeker recipients to 1.7 million. With almost 2 million Australians requiring income support in six months' time, it's difficult to comprehend why the Prime Minister is insisting on a snapback to $40 per day. There's certainly been mixed messaging from within the ranks of the government. This week, the Minister for Families and Social Services, Anne Rustin, said she wouldn't rule out an increase to the job seeker payment rate. Yesterday, her department said all options were on the table. 
Yet the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance have locked in a return to $40 per day for Australians on JobSeeker. <clears throat> this is despite the government's own projections that unemployment will still be as high as 1.7 million. Hundreds of thousands of Australians who have found themselves out of work or had their hours slashed are understandably anxious and confused by the mixed messages from this government on JobSeeker. They need to know how the government will help them get back into work, and they need to know that they won't be snapped back to $40 a day by the Morrison government. It wasn't enough before the crisis, and it certainly won't be enough after the crisis. The old New Start rate of $40 per day was so low that it presented a barrier to finding work. Australians will need to meet costs such as phone and internet bills to be able to find jobs and participate in interviews. Australians need assurance that this government will not let them fall through the cracks. Australians need to be uplifted, treated with dignity and respect to take their place in our society without feeling that we're looking down on them because they are on the needs of social services. Australians need that kind of security going forward. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Zazelja. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, and it is, um, it is uh, an honour to get up to speak uh, about uh, what is a very, very important issue. Uh, a very, very important issue. Uh, and I want to start uh, by acknowledging um, that uh, from uh, the very beginning uh, of this crisis, uh, this government, our government, has responded swiftly and strongly and in the national interest uh, at every point in dealing uh, with what the Prime Minister has rightly referred to as the dual crises, uh, the health crisis first and foremost uh, and the economic crisis. So when it came to our health uh, response, uh, we acted uh, early and we acted strongly. Uh, we imposed a travel ban ahead of most other nations. Uh, we declared a pandemic uh, well ahead of the World Health Organization. Uh, the, the Prime Minister stood up the National Cabinet, uh, an unprecedented response to an unprecedented crisis. Uh, and I think that as we reflect on the very sobering figures today in the labour market, uh, which for individuals and families, of course, are individually devastating uh, and are a, 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 a significant challenge. And as the Prime Minister has said, uh, though not necessarily unexpected, are devastating for many, many in our community. Uh, but as we reflect on those numbers, uh, I think we can also reflect on the fact uh, that if we hadn't have responded, as, and if we look around the world, in fact, at some of the unemployment numbers uh, in some of our uh, major trading partners, places like the United States and Canada and other places, uh, I think we can point to the fact that that strong response uh, has helped to avoid uh, much worse, uh, much worse figures. Uh, so we don't downplay uh, those job losses. They are a serious hit for those individuals and those families and for our economy. Uh, and, and this unprecedented crisis has caused that we can be very proud as a nation in the way we are responding. Uh, so we responded to the health crisis. We invested billions of dollars extra to respond to that health crisis. Uh, and Minister Hunt, I think, has done an extremely good job uh, on that front. Uh, but then, as we go to the other part of this crisis, the economic crisis, uh, we have committed and are delivering unprecedented economic support to the community. It started with cash payments uh, to individuals, uh, particularly uh, pensioners and other people in the welfare system, getting extra cash uh, in their bank accounts uh, so they can have some support through this difficult time. Uh, cash flow support to businesses uh, so they can keep the doors open. We supercharged our safety net, uh, doubling our JobKeeper payment to support uh, 
those Australians who, through no fault of their own, are doing it particularly tough as a result of these dual crises. Uh, we enabled Australians to have access to their superannuation, uh, those Australians who are doing it tough. And we heard a bit, we heard a bit of criticism uh, from the Labor Party uh, on that today, uh, which we reject absolutely, to give Australians at this very difficult time access to their own money. Uh, is an important part of our economic response. Uh, and the fact that uh, young people uh, and people who are not so young have taken advantage of that so they can look after themselves and look after their families while getting unprecedented support is something we should all be proud of. And of course, the $130 billion JobKeeper program. Uh, all up the response, the economic response from the Australian government uh, has been uh, and is projected to be $320 billion or 16 per cent of GDP compared to virtually every other nation. That is an extraordinary response in extraordinary times, and we should be very proud that we have been able to do that and we are able to deliver that, and we will continue to do that to protect Australians and protect Australia's sovereignty uh, during this time. Now, Labor has said at various times that they will give bipartisan support, but we are seeing uh, that language rapidly shift. We are seeing it rapidly shift, and we saw it uh, in particular. You know, the, the tone was set by the leader, by Anthony Albanese, uh, when, you know, in criticising the national cabinet, his criticism of the national cabinet uh, was that he wasn't part of it. That was his main criticism of the national cabinet. Uh, this unprecedented response, this great show of leadership from the Prime Minister, where he brought uh, premiers and chief ministers of both political persuasions uh, in, into the cabinet uh, room, uh, into now the virtual cabinet room, so they could get together uh, and make decisions in the national interest. And what we have seen uh, from the Labor Party over time, uh, led by Mr Albanese, uh, is in fact uh, more and more politicking uh, rather than dealing with the serious challenges that we as a nation face and indeed is being faced by governments and nations right around the world uh, right around the world and as we compare our response as we compare our response to those other nations uh, we can be proud of how far we've come but indeed we have a long way to go uh, we have a long way to go uh, and before I briefly touch on that, that coming back of the economy and that supporting the economy as we come out of this crisis, as we open up the economy again, as we open up our society, uh, I would just address one of the big lies that is put there uh, by the Labor Party, which is somehow, and there was at it again today, uh, Mr Albanese, Mr Chalmers were at it again today, suggesting that in fact uh, the economy uh, was in trouble before the COVID crisis. Well, that's not what the RBA governor had to say. Uh, that's not what the IMF was saying when they were projecting uh, what our growth was going to be, uh, that it was going to be stronger than most G7 nations when unemployment had come down to 5.1 per cent at a time when we delivered tax cuts for the Australian people, which we said we would do at the last election. So this criticism uh, this claim, this big lie from the Labor Party uh, that somehow uh, the economy was doing it tough is wrong. And, and as we go uh, to that coming out of this crisis, uh, we will build on the principles and the values that have kept our economy strong going in, uh, that had our economy going strong, that uh, enabled us to utilise our balance sheet to deliver this unprecedented support. Let's imagine for a moment that if we'd gone into this crisis with the $48 billion deficit that the Labor Party left us. Imagine if our deficit was at $48 billion instead of having the budget in balance. Imagine if unemployment was rapidly rising as it was when the Labor Party left office. If we hadn't have had the strong economy, if we hadn't have had the strong uh, balance sheet and budget, uh, debt as a, as a proportion of GDP around a quarter of that in the UK uh, and in the US and about a seventh of that in Japan. That has enabled us to do this unprecedented response. It would have been far more difficult uh, if we didn't have uh, that starting point. And as we, as we look to build on that, uh, Acting Deputy President, as we look to build on that, uh, 
we're going to reject some of the policies that are being put forward. And, uh, you know, there was criticism from the shadow finance minister this week, criticism of the Liberal Party because we would talk about things like lower taxes as we come out. Uh, well, I actually think that lower taxes, uh, and we've, we, we took lower taxes to the election, we're delivering lower taxes right now. Uh, we're not going to recover from this crisis by increasing taxes for Australians. Now, I don't think that that is going to be the way to create jobs and to bring some of those people who newly find themselves unemployed uh, back into the workforce. We're going to do it by keeping taxes low. We're going to be do, it, do it by supporting business. We're going to do it by investing in infrastructure. We're going to do it by being innovative. But all the while, we're going to do it in a fair and an Australian way. And Australians can trust, as we come out of this crisis, uh, that the government that I think has responded very well, has responded very well going into this crisis, is going to be best placed, best placed to help Australians get back into work, to help our, get our economy moving, to help keep Australians safe, to help keep Australians together. Uh, that's what we are going to continue to be committed to. Uh, that will be a task that will be with us for some time. Uh, but we are up to it, and the Australian people are up to it. And we're going to go on that journey together, supporting them all of the way through. Yeah, yeah. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy President, I'm certainly glad to hear Senator Seseldia say how proud he is of the government's job keeper package that they've put in place. Um, I say that because uh, the Greens called for a living wage very early on in the piece. Indeed, even as early as mid March, we were calling for a living wage, a uh, European style wage, which essentially is uh, looking very similar to uh, JobKeeper. And I know uh, my colleague in the chamber with me today, uh, Senator Seawitt, has been one of the uh, most outspoken uh, MPs in this parliament, in this building, about raising the rate for Newstart, uh, which of course is the uh, job seeker payment. Uh, so we're very, I know she'll be talking very shortly about uh, making that permanent. I just want to say a few uh, brief uh, points for my contribution. Um, the importance of the JobKeeper package was simply to provide confidence and trust in our economy. It wasn't necessarily to exactly replicate the wages of, of workers around the country. It was to set a stimulus payment, a stimulus payment at a level for all workers who have been impacted in businesses. Now, I have literally lived and breathed job keeper at home for the last six weeks because my wife and her business partners have been labouring to try and understand the, the labyrinth of uh, eligibility requirements for job keeper. Uh, I've spoken to accountants. My office has been working around the clock, as I know Senator Seawitt's office has, and many of my colleagues trying to help constituents to navigate both job seeker and job keeper. In fact, I believe, and it wouldn't surprise me if many of us in this chamber have uh, had all our staff working around the clock to try and help Australians sign up to these schemes. Uh, and I'm also proud of job keeper. It's certainly not perfect. It has a number of issues, and I continue to ask questions on some of these issues, uh, at, along with my colleague Senator Seawitt at the COVID, the COVID committee. But it is, a, it is a big outlay, but it's absolutely critical. Uh, what we know about pandemics and what we know about uh, panics uh, throughout history is that the one thing they all have in common is that people lose trust. They lose trust in their institutions. They lose trust in their financial systems. If they do that, then the glue that holds our economy together comes unstuck. And then the next the next stage further down the track is smashing windows, setting fire to buildings, rioting, looting, so on and so forth. So the, the pace at which the government adopted this, there's certainly reasons to be critical. It took nearly two weeks for the government to adopt a JobKeeper scheme, a living wage scheme, after coming under significant criticism from the Greens and others. And I'd like to recognise the role that the, the unions and the ACTU played in this, as well as the business community as well as COSBOA, a small business group, a number of Chamber of Commerces around this country. But I often say to friends of mine in the union movement, I'm not necessarily sure it was 
uh, the Greens and Labor in the unions that put pressure on the government to adopt this scheme. I actually believe it was probably the business community themselves who put pressure on the government to adopt a job uh, keeper style scheme. But either way, it's a win for Team Australia for everyone working together. But the idea that somehow the economy is going to snap back in a few months' time, that somehow people are going to be able to remove themselves from the fear and anxiety that they've been feeling as they've been in isolation for the last five weeks around this country, the idea that somehow this is going to snap back like an elastic band is completely unrealistic. Completely unrealistic. What governments do really well in times of crisis is step in and do the heavy lifting. Whether it's bailing out businesses, whether it's providing money to workers, um, over five million workers in this case around the country, unprecedented. Governments have an ability to do that because governments can take on risk. And this is a period, Senator Cormann said it the other day, a one in a hundred year event of extreme risk. Our capital system, our capitalist system, businesses, markets aren't built for risk. Any, uh, any capitalist will tell you if you want them to take on risk, they need a high expected return. And of course, in times of crisis and pandemic, there are no returns. In fact, there are falling returns. We've heard about real estate markets potentially losing a third of their value today. We've seen what's happened on the share market. We've seen what's happened to superannuation balances around the country. Governments are in a unique position to do the heavy lifting, and so they should. And my point is they must continue to do this. They must continue to do this in coming months if we are going to keep the good work we have done from unravelling. Because that trust and that confidence must be there, and it's the government's role to maintain that. And government needs to go a step further. It's not just about providing a stimulus payment. Governments need to step up and invest in their communities, invest in infrastructure, invest in a renewable energy future, transitioning our economy to clean energy. There's a whole range of things we could do. Now, Senator Cecilia talked about JobKeeper being around 16 per cent of uh, 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 the debt that's been put into JobKeeper, around 16 per cent of GDP. Now, I'm not sure if that's net GDP, but just to give you a very brief overview of Australia versus uh, other advanced industrial nations, our debt is expected at state and federal government level to exceed 30 per cent of net debt to GDP. Now, advanced industrial nations are currently sitting around 90 per cent, three times what Australia's net debt position is. After the war, when Australia, in a very, very now famous case study that any student of politics can tell you about, when Australia rebuilt itself and reshaped itself following the Second World War, our net debt to GDP was around 120 per cent. But it was paid off by growth. It was paid off by growth. We should take on a lot more debt in this country at record low interest rates, establish, for example, a government-owned infrastructure bank, and we should be using this as an opportunity, turning a crisis into an opportunity and investing in our communities, investing in our young people, making sure everybody has a job. I know Senator Seward is going to talk more about uh, the people we have been left behind in this crisis, that have missed out on this JobKeeper payment, aren't eligible for JobSeeker, and there's way too many of them. My last point is I'm glad that Labor's brought this motion forward to debate today. I was quite surprised when I read in the paper this morning that the Labor Party are considering or have proposed tinkering with the JobKeeper system so that workers who uh, casual workers, young people who weren't necessarily earning $750 a week will have a lower payment in the future so that excess money can be used or allocated towards those who have missed out. We have enough money in this country to pay everyone and make sure no one gets left behind without taking money off workers. Remember, this was not designed to match your wage. This was designed to be a stimulus payment, to give people money. That's 
what you do. Some people call it helicopter money. And once again, we shouldn't be taking money off young Australians who, and we've heard in contributions at Question Time today and from Senator McCarthy, young Australians are doing it tough. No one is feeling the consequences of COVID more than young Australians. And could, I promise I'll finish on this point. I read an article about three or four weeks ago by Bernard Keane in Crikey saying that young Australians are doing it tough, but older Australians should form a pact with young Australians because of the sacrifice that they have made during this crisis, because they're doing it tough. The older Australians, who are much more susceptible to COVID from a health risk point of view, repay young Australians by forming a pact and helping them fight the crisis of their time, which is climate change. Understanding the threats and challenges that they face. And I think that's a really important point. And I hope a lot of older Australians do appreciate the sacrifices that, and rightly so, that young Australians are taking by staying at home, by following the rules. So many of them have lost their job. The mental health crisis they're suffering has been well outlined in this place. It's time for an intergenerational pact between old Australians and young Australians. Once again, this could be an opportunity. We can turn a crisis into an opportunity. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the government has been talking about getting Australia to snap back to a time before coronavirus. They foreshadowed a return to their old agenda of cutting funding to public services and sitting back as Australians barely survive on the low rate of New Start and undervaluing the work done by teachers, nurses and other frontline workers in our communities. Well, this pandemic has exposed the government's faults. It's exposed their ideological preoccupations and it's exposed their shortcomings. And it's forced them to address sectors and services that they have been ignoring for years, like social security, early childhood education and manufacturing. And we cannot go back to how it was before. As Anthony Albanese, Mr Albanese in the other place said this week, we must move forward to having not just survived the pandemic, but having learned from it. And with one million Australians unemployed, there is no time to waste. Before the government introduced JobKeeper, it asked Australians to reach into their retirement savings to cope with the loss of income during this crisis. And it's the same advice that's being provided day after day during question time by the finance minister. People should not have to choose between a decent retirement and paying their rent. Superannuation works by putting away small amounts now, small amounts when you're young that grow to large amounts when you retire. And the consequence for a young person taking money out of their super now could be very significant at retirement. I'm particularly concerned about the impact on women. Women already receive significantly less than men in their retirement. They retire with significantly smaller balances than men. And the government is now inviting them to take as much as $20,000 out of their superannuation to get by. Well, taking money out of, your retirement, out of your retirement, if your balance right now is only $40,000, could have a very, very significant impact on mega earnings that have been put away. Australians working in the hospitality and arts sectors have accessed their super more than any other workers during the COVID-19 crisis. And it's no surprise because these are the sectors who are most likely to be excluded from JobKeeper because of the narrow terms on which JobKeeper has been reconstructed. And Labor has been calling for more support for these sectors so that young people, women, vulnerable workers are not required to rely on their super but instead receive proper government support. The government's policy decision means that thousands of people have relied on their savings to get through difficult times. 
and the sad truth is that these savings will need to be rebuilt. This is not a young Liberal debating contest. This is a $3 trillion system that Australians depend on. In establishing the scheme, the minister should not have embarked on a rapid rollout of a major reform whilst willfully ignoring warnings from the industry about the risk of fraud. Because exactly what the minister was warned about has come to pass. She's on the record as having rebuffed those warnings, telling the industry that there was nothing to worry about, that perfectly adequate protections were in place. But that wasn't right. It wasn't right at all. Those protections were not adequate. And the minister was forced to suspend the scheme that she put in place because of the fraud risks that eventuated exactly as she was warned. And I say this. This was a time when the government ought to have cooperated with industry. It ought to have put aside its ideological attacks on super, its endless Senator determination Turner. to undermine this system. Interjections are not and actually and listened. Shall I pause? Sorry, Senator McAllister, if you could just take your seat. Senator Hume, interjections are not warranted. Thank you, Senator McAllister. This was a time to work with the industry, to put aside ideological preoccupations, to cooperate with business. And it's a very great shame that this does not appear to have been the approach so far. I want to make some remarks about the impact of the crisis on women and the need to pay particular attention to women's economic circumstances. Time and time again, the impact of significant changes uh, to women's economic circumstances are underreported and underrecognised. This week, the ABS released figures that showed overall employment decreased by 7.5 per cent between the 14th of March and the 18th of April this year. Now, that is a substantial change in the labour market. However, while male unemployment fell by 6.2 per cent, female unemployment fell by 8.1 per cent. It's a difference of nearly two percentage points. Associate Professor Alicia Blackham, who researches workplace discrimination and inequality at the University of Melbourne, said that the pandemic was magnifying already existing inequalities in the labour market. She noted that women are already overrepresented in insecure work and they are also more likely to be on casual contracts with no paid leave entitlements. It leaves them vulnerable to being cut off from their jobs as there is no obligation to employ them on an ongoing basis or to ensure certain hours. This is a government that rarely thinks very specifically about the impact of their decisions on women. But I say to the government on this occasion, because of the industries they work in, because of the terms and nature of their employment, women are being hit hard by this crisis. And in building policies for reconstructing Australia, we need to think in specific ways about how those policies might support women or might undermine women's interests. Men and women have very different economic lives. This pandemic has highlighted this, and the policy response needs to explicitly consider whether or not the policies that are advanced will help Australian women. The coronavirus pandemic has affected us all, but it has also provided the community with an opportunity to reflect on what is important in our lives, our families, our health, our economic security. It's illustrated that we're all vulnerable to forces beyond our control and also that we rely on one another for compassion and cooperation in difficult times. It's provided us an opportunity to reflect on what we want the future to be, to think about what we want to take forward and what we want to leave behind. We do not have to simply snap back to insecure work, to job seekers living in poverty and to science being ignored. We can have an economy that works for people, not the other way around, and a society that reflects the very best of who we can be. Senator Hughes. Thank you, 
from Acting Deputy President. In the face of a global pandemic with its devastating financial effects and the health of our very nation being of crucial importance, Labor wants us to repeat our plans for the future of our economy. The plan to get Australians back to work and to fight the inevitable effects of the global pandemic on unemployment rates. Well, my response to them is this. Haven't you been listening at all? Today, there was hard evidence to demonstrate that the Morrison government's plan has put a solid foundation under our economy, evidenced by the fact that unemployment figures rose just 1 per cent to 6.2 per cent in April. As our Prime Minister said, though, it's still a tough day for Australians. That result, though, in an environment where predictions were that unemployment would run as high as 8 to 10 per cent, demonstrates that the strategy to get Australians back to work and combat massive unemployment is already working. We're supporting Australians through this difficult time. We're facing hard times, but we have a solid plan and we will recover. In this unprecedented environment where we face a global pandemic of devastating proportions, we are getting it right. The unemployment rate is proof of the fact that the JobKeeper program is doing its work. We've worked to retain the connections between businesses and employees and ensure a pathway for millions of workers to return to their jobs. The Prime Minister and our Treasurer have been talking about the plans to reignite the economy in deliberate stages. And as the states ease the restrictions, we will see more people return to work. It might be timely to note Labor's record on economic management is far from glowing. Even today, a party that's proved itself incapable of managing a tuck shop, a party that's been bankrupting Queensland, is now suggesting the solution to unemployment for, is for their leaders to become international airline moguls. That plan will inevitably result in failure and long-term unemployment for airline workers. We welcome other bids for Virgin Airlines so that it can enjoy a long and profitable future with secure jobs for its Australian workers. In stark contrast, the Morrison-led government has, with care and the same steady, responsible economic management, developed solid solutions to a range of tough economic problems. At the centre of our economic strategy, We've been sure to care for all Australians while they've been off work. The Job Seeker and Job Keeper programs have provided the pillars of support for our economy. Six million Australians are benefiting from the Job Seeker, Youth Allowance and Job Keeper programs. The Job Seeker and Youth Allowance payments provide a safety net for people while they search for a job. And when we talk about the unemployed in Australia, we should note that we have one of the most targeted and effective social welfare systems in the world. Almost every Australian who receives Job Seeker or Youth Allowance also receives supplementary payments on top of the base payment, so there are extra supports in place. The Job Seeker payment is a temporary, transitional support, with close to two-thirds of recipients expected to exit the payment system within a year. What else do we do to combat unemployment and support Australians who are out of work? The JobKeeper provisions, announced on March 30 to the value of $130 billion, provides employers with, uh, employers with $1,500 per fortnight to pay eligible employees. That's around 70 per cent of the median wage. For workers in the hospitality, accommodation and retail sectors, it will equate to a full median replacement wage. Payments will be made for 13 fortnights from March 30, ending on the 27th of September 2020. With this stimulation for the economy, we've ensured many of those businesses that have been forced to close during the shutdown will be able to reopen. There will be jobs for Australian workers to return to. We're also seeing success on the health front by putting in place appropriate social distancing measures. We've slowed the spread of coronavirus. And our economic strategy is as carefully thought out as the health response to the coronavirus. 
That response has seen other affected countries look to Australia with envy. Australia is confronting the health and economic challenges from a position of strength. We don't shy from the fact that the effects of the coronavirus across the economy have been severe. Businesses and households are facing uncertainty, and as expected, economic activity has slowed. But our measured plan has put a floor under that economic uncertainty. The government's focus right now is not only on the health and well-being of Australians, it's on maintaining our strong economy so people can resume work. As the coronavirus is controlled, the Morrison-led government is focusing on businesses reopening. That plan has been designed to ensure that consumers gradually regain their confidence and also return to normal. The government's economic support package has provided timely support to affected workers, businesses and the broader community and has kept Australians in work and businesses in business. In fact, without the JobKeeper program, Treasury forecasts that unemployment figures could rise as high as 15 per cent for the June quarter, instead of the current forecast of 10 per cent. Our economy is resilient and well-placed to navigate challenges, but we know that the outbreak, social distance measures, economic confidence and travel restrictions are having a significant economic impact. GDP is expected to fall by 10 per cent in the June quarter, the equivalent of $50 billion. Every week that the restrictions remain in place, there is a further $4 billion reduction in economic activity to the combination of reduced workforce participation, productivity and consumption. Going into this outbreak, however, economic, in economic activity in Australia was strengthening at the end of 2019, with the economy growing by a healthy 2.2 per cent. Our strength today lies in the fact that the economy was resilient and well-placed to navigate the unprecedented challenges of this new coronavirus environment. Bringing National Cabinet together to ensure that we can reopen our economies has also been integral to the response plan. Our economic response to the coronavirus, totalling $320 billion, which is 16.4 per cent of annual GDP over forward estimates, will help stop the economy stagnating and provide jobs. That fiscal package, which includes the JobKeeper payment, is front-loaded in order to instil confidence in businesses and households. The accommodative monetary policy, with its flexible exchange rate, will also help to mitigate the effect of negative economic shocks. It should also be remembered that Australia has a sound and well-capitalised banking sector to withstand financial market turmoil. To reiterate, on May the 8th, the National Cabinet met to finalise the three-step plan to gradually remove baseline restrictions and make Australia COVID safe. Implementing all three stages may see as many as 850,000 people back at work, increasing GDP by around $9.4 billion a month and controlling the unemployment rate. Our plan to keep businesses open and Australians in job is well underway. Our economic response totals over $320 billion over the next four years to 2023-24. It will protect the economy by maintaining confidence and keeping people in jobs. And our approach will remain that we invest in our economy in ways that provide more jobs. We intend to support Australians during the most difficult of times. And I'll quote our Prime Minister who said today, Australians can take hope right now because we will see better days. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to have a chat with Australians through a series of basic questions. Do Australians know that 120 years ago, our country led the world in per capita income? We were the richest. Yet from 1923 onwards, we, d we deviated from our constitution and the basics that made our country successful. We deviated more so after 1944. That accelerated under Labor Liberal Nationals governments in 1975 and 76, and especially 1996 onwards. Even before the virus, our country was in an economic mess. The fundamentals showed that. Yet despite the virus's extra debt, we can get out of this mess and rebuild our success, providing members of parliament understand the key issues that Canberra caused and that we need to reverse 
I stand by my initial call to go hard and quick on managing the virus. Much was unknown about it, and developed nations were reeling from it with high death rates and collapses of medical systems. At the same time, I pointed to other nations whose response has been far more effective than ours in terms of far lower death rates and far, far lower economic impact. Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong. As I said in the Senate in March and April, there's no manual on how to respond to this, yet basic questions must be asked. We trusted the government with an open cheque and we promised accountability. I promise to hold the government accountable and am doing so, although sometimes without answer. I will continue to do so. It's my job. We all need to be realistic. Ecuador invoked no restraints and its citizens are burning bodies in the streets. Bodies are stored in plastic bags in the streets. People are collapsing and dying in the streets. In New York City, morgues are spilling over and refrigerated trucks standing by. Hospitals overwhelmed. Yet in the same nation, Florida is doing much better. Why? As for the COVID app, our initial investigation showed the app was secure, yet storage of data was a risk. I would not download the app because I don't trust government. The privacy bill today fixes the storage issues, yet now we learn that the app is an invasion of privacy after hackers showed it's not secure and can be used to spy on people. I don't trust government. In this speech, I will show why I do not trust Liberal Labor governments, especially the 1996 to 2007 federal government, for which I confess I voted. After seven years' research following that government, I concluded it was one of the greatest wreckers of our nation and bypassers of our constitution. As citizens, as taxpayers, let's have a discussion. I'll ask basic questions and people can answer for themselves. To people who say that a small percentage of the population dying doesn't matter and who want to stop all isolation, are you willing to name one or two close friends or family members you're offering up to die to save our economy? If so, can you speak their names aloud? Isn't preserving and protecting life every government's number one job? Can we put a dollar figure, a dollar value on the sanctity of life? No. Now let's ask what constituents are wondering or indeed shouting. Isn't it true that the government relies on Neil Ferguson's pandemic models and predictions at the Imperial College in London for the basis of its management of COVID-19? Isn't it true that Neil Ferguson leads a 50-strong team at the Imperial College in London with ties to the UN's corrupt World Health Organization? Isn't it true that American officials admit Ferguson's modeling influenced the USA's response? Did the government know that in 2005, Ferguson said that up to 200 million people could die from bird flu, yet between 2003 and 2009, only 282 people died worldwide from bird flu? Did the government know that based on Ferguson's advice, the British government estimated swine flu would lead to 65,000 deaths, yet in the UK only 457 people died, with a death rate around 1 20th Ferguson's prediction. Did the government know that Ferguson's 2001 modelling on foot and mouth disease was severely wrong, and that his advice to cull animals on neighbouring properties without symptoms cost the British economy £10 billion? What about Ferguson's 2002 prediction that between 50 and 50,000 people would die from mad cow, cow disease and possibly up to 150,000 deaths? Yet there have been only 177 deaths in Britain. This guy keeps getting it wrong badly. Experts internationally have discredited the Imperial College's modelling assumptions. Have, model, have models from Ferguson's College been subjected to inter external scrutiny? Why was widespread testing such as Taiwan's or South Korea's not modelled? Ferguson's Imperial College model saw Sweden having 15 times more deaths at 1st of May than actually occurred. Why did Ferguson break his own recommendation for maintaining a significant level of social distancing indefinitely until a vaccine is developed? Why, as warned in my letter of 16th of April to the Prime Minister, was no second advisory team funded to critique the primary team? Why not a blue team and a red team to check the blue team's work? Did the government put blind faith in a foreigner without understanding despite his record of huge catastrophic errors and failures? Who's accountable for the Ruby Princess cruise boat debacle causing a high proportion of Australia's infections and deaths? Isn't it true that the senior border force officer on duty at the boat ordered the captain under section 64 of the Customs Act to not disembark passengers? Is the government aware that he then told a more senior officer of the direction he gave to the Ruby Princess captain?
and that the more senior officer overruled the previous order and passengers disembarked. We've been given the name of the more senior officer who reportedly reversed the order. Would the government like to know his name? Would the government like to know further information about the breaking of customs laws at the scene? It has previously been reported that before disembarkation, a person from the Department of Home Affairs contacted Border Force officers. What was the nature of instructions or information in that contact? Why did the more senior officer authorise the bulk disembarkation of the passengers despite evidence of coronavirus outbreak on the ship? Now let's turn to Victoria. The Cedar Meats abattoir is associated with one third of Australia's cases. Why did the Victorian government enable this? Outbreaks at aged care facilities represent 60 per cent of deaths. Why did we not change strategy to that of Taiwan with a similar population to Australia's, earlier and greater exposure to China, more densely populated than Australia, yet only seven deaths compared with our 100? Why can't we, as I mentioned on 23rd of March and, and 8th of April in the Senate, and in my letters to the PM, keep the sick and vulnerable isolated and allow the healthy to, to, to return to work as normal under a regime of testing as successfully done in Taiwan, South Korea and Hong Kong, with their low death rates and a healthy economy? How many people died from the coronavirus and how many people died with the coronavirus? Let's turn to discuss leadership. Are the following the traits of effective leadership? Not sharing the data? No. Not trusting the people with the plan of where we are going? No. Repeatedly simply stating early on the phrase, six months hibernation? No. Are all states going in separate directions now evidence of a lack of data, lack of unity, lack of uh, plenty of political interference, or a national cabinet not working? Why do state and federal governments seek to control people arbitrarily? Why are footballers like Bryce Cartwright risking their careers, their family livelihoods, because the Queensland government state state government forces them to be infected with a compulsory flu shot that no one can link to the coronavirus, yet the state government makes it a condition of restarting our rugby league competition? Why are triggers in state and federal roadmaps to exit isolation not based on objective data and simply a matter of political opinion? Does the government expect Australians will be sent home again in three to six weeks' time to curb the second wave of COVID outbreaks, or the third or the fourth? How will that be enforced? What does the government's model that shares basic assumptions with Neil Ferguson's Imperial College models say about the number of times isolation will be ordered and released? Doesn't it say there will be outbreak spikes needing future isolation? Quoting from the UK government's official declaration, Health Department, quote, as of 19 March 2020, COVID-19 is no longer considered to be a high consequence infectious disease in the UK. Yet it remains a threat, I know that, doesn't it? Albeit much lower than originally thought. In my first corona speech on Monday, 23rd March, I named the virus the Chinese Communist Party UN virus because of the UN's culpability in giving wrong and contradictory advice and making dishonest statements. I later called for an inquiry into the Communist China, Chinese Communist Party's role in the pandemic. Why did the Prime Minister recently call for the UN's failed and corrupt World Health Organization to be given the power of weapons inspectors, especially after the World Health Organization lied about the corona? Yet October, just recently, last October, Scott Morrison called for a review of the quote, what he said is unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy. Yet now, around the 1st of May, this Prime Minister said, quote, Australia will do what is in our interest in the global interest. End of quote. Why does he now contradict himself a second time? Which of his statements is the truth? Why did Lib Lab governments at federal and state level sell assets to the Chinese Communist Party, sell electricity assets, essential assets, subsidise the Chinese to install solar panels and wind turbines in Australia that are destroying our electricity grid and sending jobs to China? Why did the government sell the port of Darwin to the Chinese, sell the Murray-Darling Basin water to the Chinese companies under the 2007 Howard Turnbull Water Act? Senator Patrick called five times for an inquiry into the relationship between Australia and China. Each time I spoke in favour and each time the Labor and Liberal and National parties voted against the inquiry. Why? Why is New South Wales Labor now praising China, demanding welfare payments for foreign students, wanting more taxpayer subsidies for arts programs for the wealthy? Does the government know that the Chinese Communist Party is close to the UN and pushes its policies? 
Why does the UN's World Health Organization, with its close relationship to the Chinese Communist Party, never mention Taiwan, the standout successful performer for managing COVID? When will state and federal Lib Lab governments give us our lives back, our basic freedoms? Anything that is needed with the permission of government is not a freedom. Corporate bonds. Let's consider them. A Liberal senator recently mentioned his deep concern about our Reserve Bank of Australia now buying corporate bonds. That's a transfer of wealth from taxpayers to foreign companies and a transfer of wealth of risk from those companies to we taxpayers. Why? The former Deputy Commissioner of Taxation, Jim Kalali, said in 1996 and in 2010 that 90 per cent of Australia's large companies are foreign owned and since 1953 have paid little or no company tax. The 14 largest companies in our country are foreign owned. Why do Lib Lab governments encourage these companies to use our assets, exploit our resources, yet pay no company tax? This is not the first time that Liberal, Labor, Nationals policies have cost the people billions of dollars based on no real data. Consider these areas of policy failure now hurting Australians. Energy, stealing farmers' rights to use their land that they own that they can't use. Water policy and the 2007 Turnbull Howard Water Act that push farmers aside and put compliance with international agreements to the fore. Put compliance with international agreements to the fore. Priority. Next, overregulation with red tape, green tape, UN blue tape, and UN control of world heritage areas, fishing, immigration, even Sydney's Warragamba water dam supply is under UN control effectively. Immigration policy under the UN Human Rights Council, UN Hu High Commissioner for Refugees. The Gulf War based on the furphy of weapons of mass destruction that did not exist. Public money blown with no empirical data as justification, again and again and again. Former WA, Western Australia Premier Richard Court's book, Rebuilding the Federation, documenting in detail the dismantling of our nation. COVID has exposed our, our weaknesses because we have adopted the globalist policies of interdependence that make us dependent on others. We have lost our independence and now depend on foreigners. COVID has exposed that we have lost our manufacturing security. UN treaties, protocols, agreements, declarations in Lima 75, 76, Rio 1992, Kyoto 1996, Paris 2015, and many others have stolen our national sovereignty and destroyed our governance, our productive capacity, our economic resilience, our independence and our security. When will Labor Liberal Nationals stop blowing billions of dollars without data? In this case, on COVID, uh, COVID, 320 billion. This is why I do not trust Liberal, Labor, Nationals governments. We need to celebrate Australia's people, resources, opportunities, potential. Recognise that what Liberal, Labor governments have done since 1944 is selling us out, literally selling our future. We need to get back to basics, return to reality, to bring back our country. It's common sense. All people need, all we want is to be heard and to be given a fair go. We need people, we need leaders who use our assets, the people's assets, for our people, our country. We need people to stop believing in big government, believe instead in ourselves, our country, and take back our rights at the ballot box. The people are the rulers, our constitution says so. The first step in bringing back our country is to admit the causes of its economic destruction, then end the treason to bring back our country, personal freedoms and rights under our laws, values and culture. Liberal Labor governments over the last 76 years have handed over our sovereignty. To regain our high standards of living, we need to bring back Australia. Voters need to take responsibility at the ballot box and elect trustworthy representatives who truthfully use solid data to serve our country. The people will then trust elected MPs to serve our nation. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Seward. Oh. I've got Senator Seward on my list. But my apologies, Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I appreciate this opportunity to reflect on the impact of the coronavirus on Australians and Queenslanders so far. It's been hard. It's been hard for people facing work shutdowns. It's been hard for businesses who aren't sure whether they're going to make it through. It's been hard for families as they were thrown into the deep end of homeschooling, often trying to work from home at the same time. It's been hard for the elderly and sick 
who faced the knowledge that this virus is most dangerous to them, and they faced additional isolation as a result. But through all of that hardship, every step of the way, the Morrison government has been with you. With an unprecedented subsidy of $130 billion in the JobKeeper payment, keeping Australians in work and keeping them connected to their workplaces so that they can have that continuity and those businesses can bounce back as quickly as possible. With expanded assistance for those who've lost their jobs with the job seeker payment, as well as um, the eligibility for allowances relating to rent and phones and other expenses to help get them through. With the expansion of the instant asset write-off, the business cash flow boost and the jobs hub to help businesses navigate these difficult times. With the COVID supplement to help welfare recipients to stimulate the economy. I could keep going, but I think those in the chamber get the idea. It's a lot of spending. And I'm not ashamed to say that that level of spending pushes my boundaries, but it should because it's not my money or the government's money, it's your money. It's the Australian public's money, the taxpayers' money, and it's our children's money. And so I'm reassured by the knowledge that these are temporary measures to get us through this difficult time, and I'm reassured by the knowledge that these measures are working. And I hear it from individuals and businesses all over Queensland. Ryan Shaw, the LNP's candidate for Nudgee, recently met with the owner of Vend Marketplace in Virginia, who said that the JobKeeper payment has helped maintain his tenants because the businesses who lease shops in that centre are able to keep opening with the benefit of the JobKeeper boost. My office has heard from Ryan Dickens from Dickens Training and Assessing Services. He provides vocational training in the construction and earth-moving industries. There are wonderful Queensland businesses that provide training right across Queensland and even into New South Wales. Not only have they benefited from the JobKeeper payments to keep their staff on, but they've particularly benefited from the cash flow boost, which has been implemented by the Morrison government, and this has allowed them to adjust their workplace so that they can continue to deliver training in a COVID-safe economy. I was really pleased to hear from my friend and colleague Angie Bell, the member for Moncrief, that the JobKeeper program has made it possible for the Southport Yacht Club to stay in business, a community club which has been operational since 1949. Surfers Paradise MP John Paul Langbrook told me that his electorate in the small business capital of Queensland which statistically it is, was hurting given the downturn in tourism that has come by the closing of borders and um, the requirement for Australians to stay home. Thousands of restaurants, cafes and shops normally thrive in that bustling little community. But many have been brought to their knees by COVID-19. Thanks to the JobKeeper program, Many of them have been able to keep their doors open. And here's just a couple of examples. The Edgewater restaurant, run by John and Tracy Cianci, is open again for business on Saturday, with staff being supported by the Morrison government's JobKeeper program. The Moana restaurant on the Isle of Capri has been able to retain long-term staff by pivoting so that they can provide takeaways and they'll shortly open for dinners from this weekend. Lincoln Tester from Madison's Cafe in Broadbeach has said, Thank God for the JobKeeper. We wouldn't be here without it. Based in Townsville, Ashley Evans, who owns AAA Finance and AAA Consulting, says that his business has survived because of the JobKeeper payment. Importantly, though, he says that he's been receiving really positive feedback from clients who are across northern and western Queensland to say that JobKeeper has been absolutely vital for them. Ashley's been helping his clients to navigate all the changes that have been taking place 
in the assistance that's available from government and the changes in our economy that have come as we adapt to the COVID environment. He's also been working closely with banks to help organise complementary finance to ensure that businesses are able to keep being able to make payroll while they have waited for early JobKeeper payments to arrive. Ashley says passionately that JobKeeper is exactly the lifeline that small businesses across regional Queensland have desperately needed. I've also heard from a bar owner named Nick Brabin. Due to the JobKeeper and cash flow boost payments, he's been able to pivot his businesses, given that they weren't able to be open in the usual way, so that he has been able to keep the doors open at his Isles Lane and Burn Lane venues in Fortitude Valley. I could keep listing great examples like those, but I'm also struck by the ingenuity of Australian businesses who have been able to dramatically adapt their operations to these times. And nowhere is that clearer than in the way that Queensland manufacturers have pivoted to producing personal protective equipment, or PPE, and medical equipment to sustain the needs of our population and our health system during this time. Gold Coast company Triple Eight Race Engineering is now manufacturing an emergency invasive ventilator that's suitable for a range of situations, including where there are suboptimal conditions, such as not being in a hospital. The ventilator has been designed by Triple Eight to meet the technical specifications that the regulators require, and it's a self-contained unit that doesn't require a medical grade air supply unit to function. It's really very clever and a great way that they've adapted to the challenges of this time. It means we'll be able to deliver great health services even outside the hospitals of our capitals. Brisbane company Osvader began with its project founder, to founder, Tony Sprague, messaging a mate out of frustration at the climbing COVID-19 statistics around the globe and going, you know, what if we could have done something here? So, since then, Tony and a team of engineers and medics have designed and built a production-ready, safe and functional medical ventilator. It's a life-saving response to a global ventilator shortage that's been caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Ausvader V1 is now undergoing functional testing at the Medical Engineering Research Facility at Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane. What an accomplishment in such a short period of time. Brisbane company 3Done is supplying world-first 3D printed patient customised medical devices for protecting healthy tissue during cancer treatment. And they're doing that with distribution throughout Australia and New Zealand at a rate of more than 60 per week currently. They've got a fleet of 20 really quite serious 3D printers, but due to strong local and now international demand, they've needed to greatly increase their manufacturing capacity. Who'd have thought there'd be stories of great growth amidst all of this hardship? But by their pivot, they've now been able to develop their own large format 3D printers, custom designed for printing these world first radiation treatments. And now, after a series of prototypes and rigorous testing, they've entered large scale production. They switched their 3D printers during this time so that not only are they producing um, assistance for those who are going through radiation and other cancer treatments, but they're now printing PPE. They've crowdsourced more 3D printed parts from all over Australia. And that's how they are, rather ingeniously, keeping up with PPE demand from Australian hospitals. I have great faith in Australian businesses, in their tenacity to get through this difficulty. I have great faith in the resilience of Australia's working people, in the fighting spirit of Queenslanders as they get through this difficult time. And I have enormous belief in the way that they have gathered together as a community and acknowledged the need to support each other as we get through this difficult time together. 
I'll conclude by saying to each and every one of those Queenslanders, the Morrison government is here with you every step of the way through this challenging time. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Seward. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise tonight to make a contribution to today's general business notice of motion on uh, the JobKeeper and JobSeeker payments. Today, the Australian Bureau of Statistics released labour force statistics for April. The figures are dire, as I think everybody in this chamber would have seen. The number of unemployed people increased by 104,500 people. The unemployed, un unemployment rate increased from 5.2 per cent to 6.2 per cent. The underemployment rate increased to a record high of 13.7 per cent. The underutilisation rate, which combines the unemployment and underemployment rates, also rose to a record high of 19 these are scary figures. What does it mean for our future? But unfortunately, these figures mask the real damage being done. Jim Stanford, director of, of the Australia Institute Centre for Future Work, pointed out the following gaps in the latest statistics. Last month, half a million people, 500,000 Australians, left the labour market. This means that they haven't been counted in the figures. So, hence his concern that, in fact, we don't have the true picture. Further, there are another 550 people, sorry, 7, 750,000 people who were counted as employed but didn't work a single hour. This is partly because of the way JobKeeper keeps people working and it keeps people attached to the labour market even if there's no work. And, and I'm not passing judgment on the fact that at least you know, people are getting paid, um, but it does also need to be taken into consideration when we're looking at the overall number of people uh, or over, uh, overall number of jobs that are there and available. Finally, there has been a big drop in the number of hours people are working um, in April. Average monthly hours for those still employed fell by seven hours per worker. That's equivalent to around 600,000 positions. Hence uh, Jim Stanford's concern that these figures are not telling the full picture. I'd argue this is even further, further warning that we need to make sure that we keep the job seeker payment and that we made sure that the job keeper payment is available um, for workers. Because of these gaps, Jim Stanford estimates that a more meaningful figure um, for unemployment is around 20 per cent. I'm deeply concerned that the number of unemployed Australians will keep growing, given these figures. There are so, but there are also so many that are missing out on the supports. And Senator Stoker went through those supports, as have other uh, contributions to this debate. But the fact is, is that while those supports, Job Seeker, I've already outlined to this place how much uh, I was pleased to see the Job Seeker doubled. And the Greens were strongly lobbying for some form of wage subsidy scheme. So, of course, we're pleased to see JobKeeper. But the fact is that people are missing out. People are being left behind. The job seeker payment is not available to those on visas. People on disability support pension and carers uh, payment are missing out on the supplement. And I'm, in my adjournment contribution, I'm going to go into that in much further detail. International students are missing out. Temporary visa holders are missing out on JobKeeper. Casuals who aren't employed for more than, uh, who haven't had their job for more than, uh, for less than, uh, for more than 12 months, miss out on JobKeeper. Meaning a million workers are missing out on JobKeeper. We cannot forget those that are in fact being left behind. Younger workers and women are feeling the effects of unemployment the most. Older workers, 
I'm deeply concerned about older workers. We knew before the pandemic hit that older workers were being, um, were being stuck on job, the old new start, now job seeker, for much longer. I'm deeply concerned about the future for older workers, and I know there are, there are many older workers that are also worried because I'm hearing from them. I'm hearing from them concerned about their futures. And in fact, some are saying, will I ever work again? We need to make sure that they do work again. We do not want to see older workers going into retirement in poverty. These are the hardest hit, some of the hardest hit cohorts. And I'm deeply concerned that this situation is going to get far worse come September when the government magically thinks they're going to wave a wand and everything is going to be OK again. Well, unfortunately, it isn't going to snap back. And we need to be planning for that now. We need to be planning for the fact that there is still, unfortunately, going to be people who either uh, can't find work or are being underemployed. That's why we need to make JobSeeker, the new payment of JobSeeker, uh, retained. Today's figures show how critical it is that we do everything we can to support Australians through this crisis and its ongoing effects. There's simply no guarantee that people are going to miraculously be able to get their jobs back at the end of September because, quite frankly, some of those jobs won't exist at the end of September. If the government makes policy decisions about the rate of job seeker because of the arbitrary deadlines and, let's quite frankly, from some coalition members who are already lobbying for job seeker and job keeper to end, that's based on ideological measures, not reality. It just simply is not based on reality. The government knew that you couldn't survive on $40 a day. They, they quite clearly know that, demonstrating that's clearly demonstrated by the fact that they doubled the job seeker payment. They doubled it, knowing that people need forty dollars a day and uh, need more than forty dollars a day. That same truth is going to still be in place in September. We already have experts saying that a sudden withdrawal of support could spark a double dip recession. Yes, we need to work together, and we have been, by and large, working together to get us through this crisis. And the supports that have been put in place are really, really genuinely helping people. But withdrawing them come September will mean that people are dropped into poverty. They won't be able to pay their rent. They won't be able to pay their mortgage or their daily ex living expenses. They simply won't be able to survive on $40 a day. We cannot go back to $40 a day for our income support system. This country is better than that, far better than that. We can't wind back supports to $40 a day come September the 25th. We need to be making sure that we are showing that we are a fair and decent community and continue to support people through the ongoing effects of this pandemic. Thank you, Senator Sewitt. Did you wish to be in continuation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go to adjournment, we've got some messages to deal with, which should only take a few minutes. So the President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of committees. I call the Minister. Sorry. Um, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Uh, I move that Senator O'Neill replace Senator Kitching on the Economics References Committee on 15 May 2020 for the committee's inquiry into foreign investment proposals. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Health Insurance Amendment, General Practitioners and Quality Assurance Bill of 2020 for concurrence. I call the minister. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Oh, I beg your pardon, I'll call the clerk. 
a bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for other purposes. Our Minister. Thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives returning the telecommunicational Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill 2017 and informing the Senate that the House has made the amendment to the bill that the Senate requested. I call the Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The President has received. Oh, beg your pardon, call the clerk. A bill for an act to impose a charge to support the funding of fixed wireless broadband and satellite broadband and for related purposes. Thank you. So the President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment Con Competition and Consumer Bill. So we are now at adjournment and I call Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Deputy President. In recent months, we've spoken a lot about being in this together. The coronavirus pandemic has tested us as a nation like never before, perhaps not since World War II. Australians have welcomed the National Cabinet and the new spirit of bipartisanship and cooperation across the political divide as we work together with the Australian people to save lives and livelihoods. That's what Australians rightly want and expect. I'm all for a contest of ideas, a robust debate about policy and which party has more to offer, underpinned by the rule of law and the Western Liberal Democratic values of our great nation. But this crisis has reinforced to me that the politics of hate and personal vilification has no place in Australian society. Over four federal election campaigns, contesting and then defending the seat of Kerangamite, one of the country's most marginal seats, I experience firsthand a marked deterioration in political standards. While I will address these issues in more detail at another time, I stand here today as a proud Senator for Victoria to call out the actions of my political opponents behind two vile, anonymous Twitter accounts. The handles are S. Henderson MP Not, established in June 2016, with the name Sarah Henderson Senator No Way, formerly called Sarah Henderson MP No Way and Geelong Elite, established in May 2019 with the name Geelong Aristocrats Uncensored. The owners of these Geelong-based accounts have published anonymously hundreds of degrading, vile and defamatory comments about me, which includes labelling me a criminal facing jail. For instance, on the 22nd of May 2019, after I lost the seat of Kerangamite, Geelong Elite posted sycophant S Henderson MP out of office and now into jail embezzlement, voter intimidation, human rights, Ozpol. The people of Kerangamite are celebrating tonight. This post included a photo of my face superimposed over what appears to be a doctored mugshot photo of another woman, also called Sarah Henderson, from Texas, who had been arrested and charged with shooting dead her two children. This photo is also the profile photo for the account. How utterly abhorrent. In the case of S Henderson MP Not, I am deeply concerned to report that there may be a connection with the current Labor member for Kerangamite. In the lead-up to the 2016 election, as the member for Kerangamite, I participated in a debate organised by Geelong Business Network on the 22nd of June with the then Labor candidate Libby Coker. During the debate, a denigrating post was published on this account stating that I looked like a 1960s air hostess. Someone in the room had created that post. To her absolute credit, a female community leader attending the event told me she had seen the post, was appalled and said to Ms Coker, if this has anything to do with you, it needs to stop. The post was removed within minutes. This was either an extraordinary coincidence or, at that time at least, Ms Coker had some direct or indirect connection with this Twitter account. She needs to provide a full, honest explanation. Twitter management has refused to provide any information as to the identity of the account's owners 
and my attempts to have the S. Henderson MP not account removed through Twitter's complaints process failed. While Twitter will provide identifying information as a result of a police complaint or legal action, social media platforms need to take greater responsibility for what they publish. Social media behaviour is a serious community issue which has led to tragic outcomes. It's one our government takes very seriously. Under the Criminal Code, it is an offence to use a carriage service to menace, harass or cause offence. Deputy President, I tried for a long time to ignore this, thinking that this was the best approach. But not anymore. Our political system is better than this. I will now be referring this matter to police to investigate. Thank you. Uh, Senator M. Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be back here in the Senate this week, having originally told that I wouldn't get the opportunity until August. I think if there's one thing this week has shown us, it is that how important it is that we continue our scrutiny of the government and we continue our legislative work in this place. I'm pleased that the government has come on board with Labor's plan to return the parliament to a more regular sitting, and I'm very, very pleased that we're able to support Support that today and announce that today. These have been absolutely extraordinary times. We are living in the midst of a heartbreaking and life-changing crisis. We are told that COVID-19 represents a one in 100 year pandemic. For many South Australians, it represents the stuff of nightmares. Almost overnight, we've seen our health system under strain, our economy devastated, small businesses closed, workers stood down, too many left behind. South Australian lives lost, fear, dismay and despair. These have been dark times and lonely times for many in my community. But they are not the end of times. They are not the end of opportunity, the end of hope, the end of growth or the end of the things that we hold dear. And if in this place we respond in the right manner, they could represent a new beginning, a chance to reset, to rebuild, and work towards a fairer and more just Australia. That is my hope, but it is a fair way into our future. On the health front, SA has fared better than our neighbours, but we have not been immune to the health impacts of this crisis, nor should we be under any illusions that the health crisis is over. Whilst we haven't seen the complete run on our health system that we feared, it has, that's not to say it's been without challenge or anxiety. Early on in this crisis, I heard directly from doctors on the front line of SA's response that were frightened to go to work, frightened of the risks that going to work presented to them and frightened of what they could bring home to their families, frightened of what they might see at work, frightened because they didn't have enough access to PPE or to swabs, and terrified of the godlike choices they may have to make at work that they were seeing their colleagues in places like Italy and the UK having to make. For their dedication, for the burden of anxiety and fear that they shouldered on our behalf, for the sacrifices they made and were prepared to make for us, we can never thank them enough. Nor too can we offer enough thanks to our frontline workers. For too long, those in frontline roles have been underpaid and undervalued, and we should let this continue no longer. Because in this crisis, it's our supermarket workers, our truck drivers, our police officers, our fast food workers, our cleaners, our bus, train and tram drivers, our warehousing staff, our teachers, early childhood workers, aged care workers, among so many other essential workers who have turned up to work every day to keep us safe, at risk to themselves and their families. To these workers, I see you, I value you, and I will keep fighting in this place with my Labor colleagues so that your value is recognised in how you are paid and how you are treated in your workplace. To our teachers and early childhood educators, if your work wasn't valued by parents before, I can assure you there's not a single parent in Australia who does not value you now. Our teachers and early childhood workers do the most important job in our community. They hold our productivity and our prosperity, our future, in their hands. These have been tough and anxious times, and the government's childcare changes have made it very uncertain for a lot of you. Thank you for your service. Of course, not everyone who has wanted to go to work these past months have been able to, so we give our thanks for those who stayed home, 
working away from their workplace to keep our communities safe. But more importantly, to those stood down who can't go to work because the workplace is closed or has ceased to exist, we haven't forgotten you. These are deeply stressful and troubling times, but I assure you we will fight for your workplace too. We want you back at work. We want our community back. Many of you have benefited from the wage subsidy JobKeeper, one we fought for and proposed, and we welcome the government when they adopted it. But we know that far too many people have been left behind. Our arts workers, casuals, almost a million casuals, left behind. The Treasurer could fix it with a stroke of a pen, and he hasn't. And workers at firms like Donata, who were told they're entitled to JobKeeper, only to have a change of mind change their lives. Deputy President, there is a long road ahead. The unemployment figures today, especially in my state, don't even tell nearly the whole story. Whether we're speaking about our health or our economy, there are likely to be many more dark and difficult days ahead of us. More than ever, we need to care for those close to us, value those supporting us, and fight for those Thank who cannot you, afford Senator to be Smith, left behind. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise tonight on the government to speak on the government's failure to properly support disabled people and carers during the pandemic 19. Uh, corona 19 pandemic. I need to let the government know how abandoned disabled people and carers feel by this government for not including them in the corona 19 supplement. These are just a few of the hundreds of experiences that have been shared with me over the last few weeks. Being on, D, uh, on DSP is hard enough under normal circumstances. So many of our everyday expenses have at least doubled in the past few weeks, e.g. grocery prices and added delivery charges because we need to self-isolate and not leave the house. I still have two kids to care for on my DSP payment. It's not just about me getting more money. I'm raising a family just like those, those on parenting payment. Why are, are our children's needs different? I've seen big increases in food and pharmacy items. Panamax on special at Chemist Warehouse is usually 79 cents, with the normal price, with the normal price at $2.79. Now it's around $5. I also can't get Ventolin at the moment, and I have scripts. I'm paying $15 per delivery and can only purchase one or two of each item. This means no more bulk buying to save on delivery fees. I am unable to access any PPE and struggling to find the essentials, meaning more energy sapping running around online. It seems all groceries are full price, barely any specials, which is great for supermarket shareholders, but not for us. Having to try and stock up one month in advance for medication with, with no disposable income is near impossible. It's demoralising not being included in the conversations around COVID-19. I'm virtually housebound at the moment because I can't, I can't risk my weak immune system being compromised. I also have a respiratory condition. I rely on the deliveries and my medication costs over $100 a month because the chemist does my packs for me as I'm legally blind. Caring Friendly, a group that advocates and campaigns for carers recently conducted a survey to see how carers are coping with the crisis to hear firsthand from carers about the impacts of COVID-19 on their health and wellbeing, work income and expenses. One carer noted, due to co uh, coronavirus, my, res my respite carers cannot care for the children as they had to isolate. I have had to resign my job as I have had no, as I have had no care for the children who are both disabled. It's very isolating. I am unable to sleep as I worry about how I'm going to provide for the children. Due to being on carer's payment, I'm not eligible for the 550 supplement payment. This leaves my single parent family $400 worse off per week compared to other single parent families with children without disabilities. I have had to delay assessments recommended for my son as I can't afford them. It is very stressful and isolating. A number of respondents um, who are receiving carer payment? Um, the care, sorry, the, the um, survey that was under, undertaken by care, the Caring Fairly group found a number of the carer pay, number of the carer payment recipients work part time or are self employed to supplement their income from the carer payment, and this is what they found about um, the impact of 
of the coronavirus. 42 per cent had lost some or all of their regular income since the outbreak. 40 per cent of people say they, they've had to work fewer hours because they've needed to provide extra support to the person they care for. 12 per cent reported losing their job since the, during the pandemic. People on the carer payment also reported significant increase in costs associated with, corona, uh, 19, oh, with the coronavirus. 86 per cent of carers are now spending more money on living costs. The most common increases in living costs are groceries, cleaning and medication. 81 per cent report on having to spend more money on the person they care for. Many stated they needed to pay for essentials to get delivered for a large, was a large contributor to these increased costs. The, the government simply cannot deny that there are increased costs with living through this pandemic for those on the disability support pension and for the carer payment. They are bearing increased costs as well and they deserve the supplement just like other people who are struggling to make ends meet during Thank this you, pandemic. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. For many Australians, the biggest battle Holden had been involved with over the last 60 years was with Ford for championship points at Bathurst. But now, sadly, it appears a bigger battle is brewing between General Motors and the Holden dealers it has been in business with for 89 years, since 1931. And there's a lot more on the line than just mere bragging rights. It was bad on the part of General Motors to blindside these businesses earlier this year by announcing the decision to retire the Holden brand by a press release. At the time, I said that General Motors had acted with the ethics of a granny-smacking purse snatcher. And nothing I've heard from Holden dealers throughout Australia since then has changed my view or that of my colleagues in this parliament. Mary Barra, the worldwide chair and CEO of General Motors, who has a pay package in the tens of millions of dollars is sending Australian families to the wall. Ms Barra is now using coronavirus as an alibi for the worst corporate behaviour. Talk about Dodge City. Talk about Gordon Gecko on steroids. It now appears General Motors are privately attempting to put the screws to these Holden franchisees forcing timelines and attempting to make dealers sign up to further oppressive agreements as part of settlements and stretch out payments. Shame on you, General Motors. Shame on you, Ms Barra, and your American legal chicanery. To put it bluntly, General Motors are trying to sneak under the cover of COVID-19 to disappear in the night and leave Australian businesses stranded after an 89-year one-night stand. This is an unforgivable stance for General Motors to be taking, particularly at a time when the Australian economy and businesses is managing the economic shock, the economic shock of the current pandemic. Our motor industry in Australia means our retailers, mainly family businesses who invested heavily in facilities and people over the past 100 years at the behest of the manufacturers. I'm very concerned at the apparent stonewalling by General Motors in regards to what should be good faith commercial negotiations with its dealers in relation to their exit from the Australian market. In hindsight, it seems General Motors has planned to subvert the franchise code, and it's been years in the making. General Motors have promised the earth and have given a bucket of sand. The decision by General Motors to discontinue holding operations in Australia is their prerogative. But they must do so responsibly and in a manner that is fair to the very people that has enabled the company to operate in the Australian marketplace. General Motors need to understand that what they're offering dealers in compensation for killing the brand is just not good enough. General Motors may think the rich history of the Holden brand in Australia is worthless, but I think it's priceless. And if General Motors think the brand is worth nothing, then hand the brand back to Australia. Give it back to the Holden dealers. Indeed, I'm happy to purchase the Holden brand off General Motors for a dollar. I'll send you, Ms Barra, a dollar in the post, and you can give us the Holden brand back and we'll give it to the Holden dealers. This is about the livelihood of people right across the country, particularly in regional areas. It's not just about 
dealers and franchisees that are impacted by the decision. It's about the mechanics, the allied trades, the owners of thousands of vehicles. I've said it before and I'll say it again, and I'll keep saying it louder and louder. General Motors, be better. Australia and Holden dealers want a fair deal. They don't want a special deal. They just want a fair deal. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Billick. Thank you, Deputy President. Tonight I want to talk about the thousands of jobs at risk in the aviation industry and the Morrison government's lack of action to save them. When the JobKeeper wage subsidy was announced, the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, said Australians know that their government has their back. Well, if only that were true. On May 1, with the stroke of a pen, the Morrison government denied JobKeeper payment to companies operating in Australia but wholly owned by a foreign government. This cruel decision has led to 5,500 Australian workers from the airline services company Donata losing access to JobKeeper coverage overnight. The 4,000 Donata workers stood down to date had little warning that they would soon be joining the unemployment queue. Donata management had to deliver to those workers the awful news that the government had changed the rules after they had previously been assured that they were covered by, job, by JobKeeper. One Donata employee, Natasha, whose story was highlighted by the Transport Workers' Union, said her family had to eat the tinned and packet foods left over in the house because otherwise they couldn't afford her son's medical supplies. So I remind those opposite that these people are Australian workers. They have no control over who the company they work for is owned by. They've paid taxes in Australia, most of them throughout their whole working lives, and they deserve to be supported by their government. Another company that the Morrison government has abandoned is the airline, Virgin Australia. Virgin's 16,000 workers face an uncertain future after the airline was placed into voluntary administration and the government ruled out any further support. It's hypocritical of the government not to save Virgin when they've signed off on $100 million in cash grants exclusively for regional airlines, including the majority foreign-owned Regional Express. And despite not being a regional airline, Virgin Australia services a large number of regional destinations. It's not just the jobs of Virgin employees at risk. The company also supports many contractors and regional economies. But the potential damage, if Virgin is allowed to collapse, goes even further. It threatens to end competition in the air travel industry. If Virgin Australian collapses, Qantas will have a virtual monopoly which will drive up the price of airfares. It will take years of approvals, procuring aircraft, recruiting staff and establishing services for another entrant to start up in Virgin's place and return genuine competition to the air travel market. This will have a devastating impact on regional economies, particularly in my home state of Tasmania. As an island state, higher airfares will present a huge barrier to visiting Tasmania once the COVID-19 crisis passes. At stake is our entire $3 billion tourism, $3 billion tourism industry, an industry which contributes 10 per cent of our gross state product. Our tourism industry has already taken a massive blow from the pandemic, but if Virgin Australia collapses, it may take decades to recover. We are talking here about an industry which supports around 42,000 people, direct and indirect, Tasmanians. That's one in six Tasmanian workers. The efforts of both state and federal governments to support Tasmanian tourism operators and their workers throughout the crisis will be wasted if we can't ensure continued airline competition. Another consequence of the loss of airline competition will be the additional cost to Tasmanians travelling interstate and overseas. Many of these Tasmanians will already be suffering financially from the impact of COVID-19, and it will be a cruel blow if they are prevented from going on holiday or visiting friends and family they have spent months apart from if they cannot afford the airfares. The government could save Virgin by extending or guaranteeing a line of credit or take an equity stake in the airline. Any equity the government injects into the airline could be sold once the crisis has passed. So I'd like to thank all those who have campaigned for the air travel industry, those who have signed petitions and sent messages to the Morrison government calling on them to stand up for Virgin and Donata workers. In particular, I thank the Transport Workers Union and the Australian Services Union both for their tireless efforts in lobbying the government to develop a national plan for aviation. 
They have been on the front line of the campaign and continue to stand up for thousands of workers and their families. I hope this advocacy will not fall on deaf ears. The Morrison government cannot stand by idly while thousands of aviation industry workers join the unemployment queues and airline competition collapses. They must act immediately and save the jobs of Virgin and Donata workers. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I rise tonight to speak on the COVID-19 app legislation which passed this chamber earlier today. Looking at the responses people have had to the app, it's fair to say that we have a problem with trust. We have a problem with trust when the public is reluctant to download an app that the government has developed. We have a problem with trust when we need legislation to reassure people that the government will not misuse their data. We have a problem with trust when we need to criminalise the misuse of people's data. And that problem of trust is making the management of the coronavirus much more difficult than it otherwise would be. It's worth thinking about how we've ended up in this position. The public has not lost their trust in the representatives because of any single action. It's not the fault of one person, a party or government. Instead, it is an accumulation of many separate actions over many, many years, which have undermined people's confidence. It's not difficult to find examples. Sports rorts is one particular example. How can the public maintain its confidence in a government that puts its own interests before those of the community? Another recent example is the attempted cover-up of the Prime Minister's Hawaiian holiday during the bushfires. But the problem is not limited to the Liberal National Parties. When Labor was in government, the promise not to introduce a carbon tax, the slipper affair and the defence of Craig Thompson all diminished the public's trust in its representatives. Every time a politician is exposed in a scandal, it makes the public suspicious that politicians' work is all about benefiting themselves rather than serving their constituents. Every time a politician refuses to be accountable for wrongdoing, it confirms those suspicions. Every time a politician says there is no need for a corruption watchdog, it transforms suspicions into hardened truths. But it isn't just the big scandals that corrode trust. It's all the small things too. The exaggerations and lies, the demonisations and the dog whistles. Each of these delivers some momentary political advantage, but it comes at the cost of trust in all of us. Now all our chickens have come home to roost. After years of allowing the public trust in us to waste away, we find that we actually need the public's trust, and there is precious little of it left. I hope one lesson we learn from the pandemic is the importance of public trust, and that part of the recovery is a rebuilding of that trust. There is no silver bullet that will rapidly undo the damage that has been done. We cannot just pass a law, agree to a motion or promise that things will be different in the future. The only choice that's available to us is to be better and to do better. To consistently act in a way that builds the community's confidence and demonstrates they can trust us to act in their interest and not our own. For some of us, that will require real change and it will take time. But the response to the COVID-19 app demonstrates why it is so important for the public to have trust in us. This is something we should all reflect on in the coming months. Thank you, Senator Griff. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Wednesday, the 10th of June.